request. The commission provided the parties with procedures for troubleshooting any technical issues that may arise during the hearing, which were reviewed with the parties at the pre-hearing conference. We appreciate everyone's cooperation and understanding as we continue to adjust the virtual nature of this forum. I'll briefly review the procedures for troubleshooting issues uh, with the WebEx again when I address the housekeeping matters in a few minutes. Commission's recording this hearing will provide uh, will provide the parties access to the recording later via letter notice filed in the docket following the conclusion of the hearing. As noted in the pre-hearing conference order issued on September 11, 2020, the filing of this notice regarding the hearing recording will, will begin to toll the deadline for filing post-hearing briefings. It is critical that those listening via the live stream and also when listening to the recording will be able to uh, critical that they can able they can hear clearly what every party is saying. So please avoid any disruptions which interfere with the clear recording. In addition, we are live streaming this hearing via YouTube. The link for the live stream was provided in a notice that was posted in this docket and on the commission's website. As noted in the commission's pre-hearing conference order filed on September 11th, the provisions set forth in the pre-hearing conference order shall govern the hearing and the post-hearing schedule. As far regarding the hearing schedule, commission intends to follow to follow the schedule set forth in option C as provided to the parties in the commission's September 2nd letter, but may make adjustments to the schedule as circumstances warrant during the hearing. Hearing organization. Hearing will be held in a panel format organized into performance mechanisms panel and revenue mechanisms panel. The parties have designated their witnesses for each panel in advance and filed their witness lists with the commission on September 15, 2020. Parties were asked to submit any proposed questions or lines of questioning um, to the commission for consideration of potential use by the commission at the hearing by September uh, by Tuesday, September 15th. Uh, the commission provided its list of issues and questions for each panel to the parties on September 16th. Party presentations. The hearing will begin with the performance mechanisms panel followed by the revenue mechanisms panel. At the beginning of each panel, each party will have up to 30 minutes to make a presentation for that panel. I, each party will have the opportunity to make a presentation on its uh, proposed mechanisms oper and uh, secondary on the, the next panel on the, the revenue mechanisms panel. As set forth in the pre-hearing conference order, parties may use PowerPoint for their presentations. Presentation materials must have been shared via email with the commission and or other parties no later than 24 hours ahead of the relevant panel. As previously discussed, party presentation materials may summarize materials and positions in the record but should not be used to admit any new evidence. Further, the presentation materials may be used as demonstrative aids but will not be admitted to the record or considered as evidence. Questions for panel witnesses. As discussed in the pre-hearing conference order, following the party presentations, the panel witnesses will answer questions from commission staff, followed by individual commissioners. Commissioners and commission staff may ask questions of any witness on the panel in any order on any issue within the scope of the panel. If a party has one, more than one witness on a panel, the commission and commission staff will direct their questions initially to the lead witness. The lead witness may request leave from the presiding officer to redirect the question to another witness from the same panel from the same party on the same panel. A witness may serve on more than one panel. Following the conclusion of questions for a panel, those panel witnesses may be excused and exit, exit WebEx. However, a witness may be subject to recall at the discretion of the presiding officer. Closing remarks. After the conclusion of the commissioner questions for the revenue mechanisms panel, each party will have the opportunity to provide closing remarks to the commission. Each party shall have 10 minutes to provide closing remarks with the exception of Hawaiian Electric, the Consumer Advocate, Blue Planet, and Ulo Pono, who have requested an additional 10 minutes for the closing remarks for a total of 20 minutes. Addressing any request to close the hearing. The commission does not intend to close any portion of this hearing unless pursuant to Oahu pu uh, Publications versus On, the closure serves a compelling public in compelling interest there's a substantial probability that in the absence of closure, this compelling interest would be harmed, and there are no alternatives that would adequately protect the compelling interest. Just a few housekeeping matters before we get started. We conducted the WebEx trial on September 9th, 2020, to ensure that council witnesses are familiar with WebEx. In addition, all of you should have copies of the procedures for addressing technical difficulties at the hearing, which provide instructions for addressing any technical issues that may arise 
We shared that document with the parties and reviewed it at the pre-hearing conference. Mr. Anand Samtani will be hosting the WebEx hearing and will, will be the point person for any technical issues that may arise. Uh, just again, uh, also uh, Grace Ralph will be the staff member advancing your presentations. So just notify her when you wanna move ahead with your slides. In the event you encounter technical difficulties during the hearing, please follow the procedures for addressing technical difficulties. As noted in the document, I may contact Mr. Santani by calling the dedicated phone line the commission has set up to address any issues that arise without interrupting the hearing. Mr. Santani will be assisted by Mr. David Takashima, commission IT staff, who may ask to work with you offline to resolve any problems. To facilitate a timely start to the hearing, commission opened the WebEx meeting at eight this morning. Uh, we'll do so again for each day of the hearing to allow participants to log in and address any issues prior to the start. We'll be taking breaks in the proceeding at the discretion of the presiding officer, as well as for now, we plan a one hour break for lunch between approximately noon and 1 p.m., depending on where we stand. Hearing is scheduled to adjourn for the day at 5 p.m. Again, lunch breaks and end times are subject to change at the discretion of the presiding officer. A reminder to witnesses, please, sleep, please speak slowly and clearly. Please respond to questions verbally so that the recording can capture your response. Please also avoid talking over or interrupting each other so that each person's questions and statements can be clearly heard by the commissioners, commission staff, and the recording. And so with that, we're gonna start with our first panel, the performance mechanisms panel. We'll begin with the party presentations in the order listed on the option C document provided in the letter to the parties on September 2nd. You have 30 minutes for each of your presentations. The commission's chief clerk will be keeping time and she'll give warnings when you have five minutes and one minute. And I think I will also type into the chat box uh, for the group here to know when we have five minute and one minute remain, uh, remaining. Uh, the order will be Juan Electric, the Consumer Advocate, Blue Planet, City and County of Honolulu, County of Hawaii, the DER parties, Life of the Land in Ulupono. And as we said, you have up to 30 minutes. And with that, I will turn it over to I think as we confirm, Mr. Aoki, you're going to do the presentation for Hawaiian Electric. Oh, you're on mute. I will mute myself in a second. Yes, thank you, <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks. I'll turn it over to you now. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Griffin, Commissioner Potter, and Commissioner Asuncion. Um, Mr. Chairman, we're happy to have Mr. Scott Su, President and CEO of Hawaiian Electric, on the WebEx this morning and wanted to request Commission leave for Mr. Su to make just a few brief comments uh, and opening remarks uh, within our 30 minute time allotment. Yes, we'll allow it. Please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Yeah. Mr. Su, please feel free to go ahead when you're ready. Thank you, Rod. Good morning, Chair Griffin, Commissioners Potter and Asuncion, Commission staff, and all the parties to this docket. My name is Scott Siu, President and CEO of Hawaiian Electric. And uh, just mahalo for allowing me to say just a few words prior to the very important discussions and presentations that will happen today and over the course of the next few days. It goes without saying that this is one of the most important regulatory proceedings ever done here in Hawaii. We are literally writing the new regulatory framework that will carry all of us forward to a modern Hawaii energy system that's decarbonized, resilient, and above all, customer-centered. We at Hawaiian Electric are strongly committed to achieving the goals of performance-based regulation that have been established by the Commission. We've been serving our community for almost 129 years, and as we look forward to serving for another 100 and plus years, it's clear that we need to be the highest performing company that we can be. While we're very proud of the progress we've made over the past decade, so much more is expected of us, and we need, a, we need a modernized regulatory framework that supports our work across important but increasingly diverse objectives, while helping us become the financially strong, forward-thinking, and progressive company that our customers deserve. I especially appreciate the chance to be rewarded for exemplary performance in serving the needs of our community and customers. I'd like to express my sincere thanks to the commission for leading one of the most thoughtful and collaborative proceedings ever done for a purpose that's so complex and significant. I also want to thank all the parties in this proceeding. For over two years, we've gathered in numerous workshops and meetings 
to share information and to learn from each other. The collaborative spirit and willingness to listen and commitment to do what's best for our entire community is what's gotten us to this point and it'll carry us forward over the finish line. This is the Hawaii way of getting things done. We gather in strength, but also in aloha, and we lead the way forward. So mahalo again for letting me address our Public Utilities Commission and you, the parties. So Rod, let me turn it back over to you. Thanks very much, Scott. Mr. Chairman, we're ready to proceed with our presentation. Please go ahead, thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Rolfe, if I could please ask you to advance the slide deck. Thank you. Um, our presentation will respond to the Commission's September 16th questions uh, that we received for the Performance Mechanisms Panel. At a high level, uh, with subject matter experts available, as you've seen on the screen, uh, during the Q&A session to provide additional details and clarification on this presentation. We'll begin, and we'd like to begin with how the com companies came to develop their positions in this proceeding. We started with decision in order number 36326, which was the foundation of the guidance to all of the parties on the outcomes and uh, guiding principles that the commission wanted to follow for this proceeding and creation of uh, the PBR mechanism. Our positions were then refined over the course of the pre proceeding through the working groups, through the subgroup processes, and responding to guidance received from the commission. Next slide, please. With regard to PIM's development, decision in order number 36326 directed the parties to develop performance mechanisms, incentive mechanisms for the priority outcomes of interconnection experience, DER asset effectiveness, and customer engagement. Consistent with that direction, the companies uh, proposed an interconnection experience PIM to ensure a reliable and timely interconnection process. They proposed a DER asset effectiveness shared savings mechanism to incent greater and more meaningful utilization of DERs and other customer cited assets. <clears throat> and for the customer engagement uh, outcome, they adopted Ulupono's electrification of transportation PIM for the purpose of facilitating a move toward an inclusive and customer-oriented electric grid. I won't elaborate here further on Ulupono's proposal, as the which the companies have adopted, as Ulupono's presentation will be coming up later on this afternoon. Next slide, please. For shared savings, decision in order number 36326 also directed the parties to develop <clears throat> shared savings mechanisms to address priority outcomes, including grid investment efficiency and cost control, mitigate CapEx bias, and reward pursuit of cost-effective solutions to meet customer needs. The companies have modified the proposals over time and consistent with the Commission's direction and guidance, have adopted Ulupono's shared savings mechanism and proposed a cost control shared savings mechanism for the Commission's consideration. Next slide, please. In the area of scorecard development, the Commission directed that published scorecards with targeted performance levels to track progress against the priority outcomes of interconnection experience, customer engagement, cost control, and GHG reduction should be proposed. In response to that, the Commission uh, companies proposed two. Uh, scorecards for interconnection experience for DER surveys and IPP surveys, two scorecards for customer engagement for customer portal usage and TOU participation, one for cost control for defined O&M, and two in the area of GHG reduction for both carbon emissions as well as carbon intensity. For each of these proposed scorecards, the company provided detailed descriptions, targets, rationale, and design. Next slide, please. For reported metrics, the Commission directed that parties should utilize reported metrics to highlight performance on the priority outcomes of affordability, customer equity, electrification of transportation, capital formation, and resilience. And in response, the companies proposed a total of 10 reported metrics aligned with these outcomes, two for affordability to track both residential bill and percentage of annual LIHEAP income, two for customer equity to track CBRE and subsidy tracking, two for electrification of transportation for public charging stations and for energy delivered from those charging stations. 
to an area of capital formation for both building permit value, as well as to track megawatts of third-party generation on the company's system. And finally, two for resilience, both in areas of certification as well as training. And again, for each of these proposed reported metrics, the company's provided detailed descriptions, rationale, and design. Next slide, please. In designing the comprehensive development and review process that the commission put together, the commission was clear that this iterative process is intended to ensure that the parties explore, test, and improve their respective proposals prior to their final submission to the commission. As a part of that process, through the workshops and subgroup meetings that we all attended, the companies modified or changed their proposals for the interconnection experience PIM, DER asset effectiveness proposals, customer engagement proposal, and grid investment efficiency PIM. This included adopting Ulupono's RPSA PIM proposal in response to the Commission's February guidance to propose outcome based candidate PIMs. Next slide, please. And in response to guidance received from the Commission during the March and May workshops, guidance which noted electrification of transportation and other initiatives should be considered, and parties are encouraged to propose PIMs or SSMs to address additional outcomes, GHG reduction, previously identified for use in a scorecard, and cost control. In response to that, the companies have, as we mentioned before, adopted Ulupono's electrification of transportation PIM and proposed a cost control shared savings mechanism. Although the Commission also encouraged the parties to propose a PIM or SSM for GHG reduction, because the companies continue to have questions regarding the implementation of such a PIM at this time, the companies proposed scorecards for carbon emissions and intensity instead. Next slide, please. Now we'd like to turn to the company's responses to the Commission's questions issued for this panel. Next slide, please. In answer to the Commission's question, what PIM should be implemented to specifically address distributed energy resources or DER asset effectiveness? The companies proposed that their DER asset effectiveness shared savings mechanism mentioned earlier, or uh, Ulupono's RPSA PIM be adopted for this particular outcome. Next slide, please. In the answer to the question for customer engagement, you know, what PIM should be implemented to specifically address this outcome. As discussed above, given the Commission's guidance to consider electrification of transportation beyond just a reported metric, the companies adopt Lupono's electrification of transportation proposal. Continuing the iterative process, however, that I noted above from the Commission, the companies propose to utilize Lupono's proposed incentive of three cents for metered and one cent for unmetered charging stations rather than the three cents across the board discussed in the company's RSOP. The companies also note their response to PUC parties IR12, where in response to a commission PIM proposal for customer engagement, the companies have suggested a PIM that would reward the companies for increasing enrollment in LMI programs across both Hawaii Energy and the companies. And this is something that could be collaboratively developed with Hawaii Energy and would be focused on driving customer engagement. Next slide, please. In answer to the Commission's question, what PIM should be implemented to specifically address the interconnection experience? The companies propose their interconnection experience PIM to promote the timely interconnection of DER resources or Ulupono's RPSA PIM. The companies also note here their response to the Commission's PUC Parties IR9 which proposed a potential alternative PIM structure to incent the total reduction in interconnection time for sister systems under 100 kW in size. Next slide, please. And in answer to the Commission's question, what PIMs or shared savings mechanism should be implemented to address cost control, fuel and purchase power cost, renewable generation and any other identified outcomes, the companies propose a combination of their cost control shared savings proposal mentioned earlier, as well as Ulupono's RPSA PIM and Ulupono's shared savings mechanism, which all serve to achieve those goals. Next slide, please. With regard to PIM incentives, the commission asked, 
what amount of payment incentives in the form of revenue adjustments, rewards, and or penalties should be provided by the total portfolio of PIMs in the final PBR framework? And in this regard, in answering this question from the Commission, the companies really were guided by early statements from both the Commission as well as Commission staff. And these included that the amount of financial incentives and or penalties should be reasonable and not expose the utility to inappropriate financial gain or risk. The portfolio of three to six PIMs should provide the companies with the potential to increase earnings by approximately 150 to 200 basis points. And that this level of cap on the PIM financial incentives, quote, could serve to help manage concerns about potential rate impacts to customers and excessive earnings impacts for utilities. The range of potential addition at the range of potential additive earnings for PIMs would be approximately approximately equivalent to a range of 35 to $45 million in potential incremental PIM and SSM revenues, as noted and described in the company's RSOP. Next slide, please. For scorecards and reported metrics, the Commission asked two questions. What scorecards and or reported metrics should be required? And what is a reasonable number of scorecards and or reported metrics that should be administered at this time? And the companies provided a fairly extensive response to these uh, questions in their response to PUC HECO IR30, noting as background that the companies already submit some 400 separate reports, at least in 2019, and report on approximately 30 different metrics on their website already. Based upon their effort to analyze the feasibility, worth, and costs associated with 121 separate of party proposals for scorecards and, remor and reported metrics, the companies proposed that at least for this initial selection of scorecards and metrics, that the commission adopt the company's proposals or a subset thereof. The company's proposals as described earlier are consistent with the commission's direction in this proceeding and set forth in decision order number 36326, provide detailed descriptions, rationale, targets where appropriate and design information and are consistent with the Commission's administrative efficiency guiding principle. Next slide, please. For scorecard targets and benchmarks, the Commission asked, how should targets and benchmarks be established for each published scorecard? And in this area, the companies would propose just some practical guidelines, and those include things like developing an appropriate baseline as necessary, utilizing transparent, accessible data sets, considering all of them in the context of the company's other reporting obligations as noted before, creating additional targets and benchmarks through scorecards that aren't overly burdensome or expensive to administer, and to ensure, as, as always here, that they're consistent with the Commission's guiding principles articulated for this proceeding. Next slide, please. And lastly, as to further steps, the Commission asked what further steps are necessary to refine proposed PIMs for implementation. The companies note that tariff development for performance mechanisms adopted by the Commission will be required. And this appears consistent with the Commission's August 27th procedural schedule that indicates steps to review and approve PBR tariff after a Phase 2 decision and order. Mr. Chairman, that concludes our presentation. Thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Aoki. Uh, next up is the consumer advocate. And based on the lead witness will be Ms. Roberto presenting or Mr. Nishina. I'll be presenting, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me all right? Yes, just fine. Thank you. Uh, please go ahead. And I, it, you have no presentation, PowerPoint presentation, I believe, correct? No, sir, just an opening statement. Great, thank you. Please proceed. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, the Consumer Advocate thanks the Commission for its leadership in convening this important investigation. The Consumer Advocate also wishes to express his appreciation to the other stakeholders for the time dedicated over the past two years and openly sharing ideas to move Hawaii closer to achieving shared goals. My name is Cheryl Roberto 
and together with the consumer advocate, Dean Nishina, and my colleague, Ben Havamaki, from Synapse Energy Economics, we will serve as the consumer advocates witnesses for this panel. The time the parties have spent together has yielded much agreement around performance incentive concepts. The parties have embraced the goals and regulatory outcomes identified by the Commission. Parties are aligned in a preference for rewarding outcomes over inputs. Parties appear to agree that performance incentives should be additive and that they're intended to provide the companies with an opportunity to earn revenue above that which is required to operate the utilities. Parties also appear to agree that the company should have the opportunity to earn performance incentives in the range of between 150 to 200 basis points. This is consistent with the Commission's Phase 2 order. Finally, the consumer advocate and the companies have expressed that the performance should be exemplary to be eligible to receive performance incentives. It's at this point, however, that the parties' views begin to, ver to diverge in meaningful ways. The consumer advocate's approach to the design of performance incentives begins with impact to consumers in mind which is meant to be consistent with the consumer-centric principle that the Commission identified. As we all know, among the states in the United States, Hawaii consumers pay the highest electric rates. When the Commission initiated this investigation, it noted the mandate upon it to consider maximizing the efficiency of all electric utility assets to lower and stabilize the cost of electricity. The multi-year rate plan itself is a powerful cost control tool and that the companies retain achieve cost savings. The companies do not have the opportunity to retain the savings they have achieved because of the operation of a tracker or because the savings are enjoyed directly by consumers. The consumer advocate supports adding performance incentives in the form of shared savings mechanisms. To the greatest extent possible, positive performance incentives should be designed using shared savings mechanisms, which reward performance while putting downward pressure on the revenue requirement, because the companies only earn the incentives when they deliver measurable savings to consumers. In making shared savings mechanisms the core of its proposed performance incentive structure, the consumer advocate is building on the principles and precedents established by this commission in previous dockets, approving shared savings approaches for energy cost recovery, as well as renewable energy, storage, and grid services procurement. The shared saving mechanisms provide, proposed by the consumer advocate emphasize the transformational or emergent outcomes of DER asset effectiveness and grid investment efficiency. The companies have noted that they do not object to any of the five new SSMs the consumer advocate has advanced, but they do caution that the proposals need to be further developed and evaluated for overlap and duplication with other proposals. The consumer advocate agrees that before adoption of the final portfolio of incentives, each individual proposed incentive must be quantified and the portfolio of incentives calibrated to provide the companies the opportunity to earn up to 200 basis points for exemplary performance. The portfolio must also be balanced to avoid rewarding the same activity for the same value more than once, and to ensure that the companies must provide exemplary performance across a number of outcomes to earn the entirety of the potential 200 basis points. The consumer advocate also diverges from many of the other parties to this docket because of concerns with the proposed RPSA PIM. Both the RPSA PIM and incentives related to greenhouse gas reduction rely upon the monetization of carbon and is the equivalent to treating utility rates as a form of taxation. Absent a transparent quantification such as a carbon tax, the consumer advocate is reluctant to ask consumers to bear the identified 
and measurable impact on their bills that would occur with the adoption of RPSA or greenhouse gas reduction PIMS. The consumer advocate finds it particularly difficult to support this additional impact on cons consumers when the shared savings mechanisms proposed by the consumer advocate advance the outcomes of GHG reduction without burdening consumers further. The consumer advocate also encourages the commission to carefully consider the need to establish metrics to highlight the company's performance in commission identified outcomes. The companies have expressed concern with too many metrics and the possible cost that may be associated with keeping track of the metrics. However, the consumer advocate has raised the issue before and continues to support the need to establish sufficient metrics as part of any performance based framework. Besides the out identified outcomes that may have PIMS, the companies should be looking to measure and improve their performance in all areas, not just the ones where rewards may be possible. The Commission has presented several topics for this panel discussion, specifically related to DER asset effectiveness, customer engagement, interconnection experience, and cost control. As just a brief preview to the Consumer Advocate's response, I offer that the Consumer Advocate has proposed two shared savings mechanisms to address DER asset effectiveness. The Consumer Advocate suggests that customer engagement without purpose is an input, not an outcome. Therefore, the Consumer Advocate supports the PIM for call center performance with proposed modifications to support the outcome of customer satisfaction. And the consumer advocate supports the two shared savings mechanisms for distributed energy resource asset effectiveness because they support customer engagement for the purpose of enhancing the operation of the grid. Regarding the interconnection experience, the consumer advocate supports the imposition of penalties for delays beyond the Rule 14H tariffed deadlines. The consumer advocate does not support the proposed positive incentives for interconnection experience. To the extent the Commission authorizes a positive performance incentive for interconnection experience, the consumer advocate recommends that it be specified in terms of mean rather than median performance and that the target for the incentive should be aspirational. If the proposed incentive were adopted, the companies would have earned the full incentive for each of the prior three calendar years. While the company's recent interconnection performance reflects improvement, the DE par DER parties have been seeking even greater improvement. Establishing a PIM that would reward provide rewards for the current level of performance would be inconsistent with the expectation of exemplary performance. The consumer advocate also notes that no party has offered a cost benefit analysis to support that proposed in incentive. As I mentioned previously, the consumer advocate contends that the MRP itself is the most powerful cost control tool. When the companies do not have the opportunity to retain savings that they've achieved because of the operation of a tracker or savings are enjoyed directly by customers, shared savings mechanisms are the best incentive for both cost control and to ensure benefits are delivered to customers since by their very nature, shared savings require the quantification of delivered savings or benefits in order to justify incentives to be paid for superior performance toward the desired outcomes. The consumer advocate recommends that for proposed shared savings mechanisms to be implemented for the purpose of both cost control and achieving the targeted transformational outcomes that he's identified. As a final matter, the Commission has posed a question to the Revenue Mechanism Panel regarding a review process. A review process is critical for implementation of the performance incentives as well. The Consumer Advocate has addressed the need for regulatory review and continuous improvement for the implementation of performance incentives in his statement of position. The companies are critical of the Consumer Advocate's proposal However, they do not offer an alternative to address the identified need. 
Financial incentives, whether PIMS or shared savings mechanisms, should be reviewed periodically to determine whether they are adequately and cost effectively encouraging the companies to attain exemplary performance and to continue to meet regulatory goals. The Commission should establish a process to enable modification of a performance incentive mechanism on an ongoing basis if and when the mechanism does not serve the intended purpose or isn't efficient or equitable. This flexibility to evaluate and redesign incentives should balance the two goals of providing utilities with regulatory certainty to make financial decisions that may result in long-term commitments, such as long-term service agreements or capital investment, and modifying the incentive over time to adjust for changing circumstances and lessons that we have learned. This completes the Consumer Advocates presentation Dean, Ben, and I look forward to responding to your questions. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Ms. Roberto. I believe Blue Planet is up next. Yes, thank you, Chair Griffin. Good morning, everybody, Chair, Commissioners, Commission staff, morning. all the parties. Isaac Moriwaki, Earth Justice, on behalf of Blue Planet Foundation. I'm joined by Ron Bins cruising in his car there. Uh, he's actually in transit home, I think, right? Although it doesn't seem like your car is moving right now. Um, and I think Melissa Miyashiro is also joining us today. I, I, I should note for the record that I've interrupted my vacation. I'm parked in the parking lot in Vail, Colorado to attend this hearing. Brownie points for Ron. Okay, I believe I uh, we have a PowerPoint presentation we're going to share. Is anyone else seeing it? Because I'm not sure, I'm not sure that I have that. Let me let me check with with folks. Apologies. Did receive it. Um, just a second. Uh, sorry, Mr. Morawaki and Mr. Bins. We'll get it up. No problem. Um, I'll just note that I, I'll take the lead for the opening statement, although Ron Bins is available for color commentary and, of course, also to answer any questions on the specifics. Okay, just pulling it up. Thank you. Thank you. Apologies for the delay. So as Blue Planet has made clear in its statements of position, we're really focused on incentives, primarily making sure we get the foundation right on addressing this overarching imperative of getting off of fossil fuels and towards renewable energy. Frankly, if we don't get this foundation right, five to 10 years, no one's gonna care if we had a call center PIM. No one's gonna care how many people, how many times someone checked their uh, energy management system. Uh, this is really the foundation, why we're all here, the impetus for this clean energy drive to create the clean energy to the, the future. Uh, and so let's get this right. Uh, and certainly we, we support a whole constellation of PIMs uh, that we can develop probably over time as a practical matter. Uh, and all these PIMs matter, but this is the primary focus that, again, Blue Planet wants to get right. Now, uh, if we can get to the next slide, um, we are proposing a portfolio approach to this overarching, overriding imperative to get off of fossil fuels and move towards renewable clean energy. And this is a PC priority. It's a legal mandate. We respectfully disagree with the consumer advocate that it's some kind of externality that uh, utility regulation can ignore. In fact, we're getting rulings from the Hawaii Supreme Court saying the exact opposite. Uh, but apart from the law, this has been a policy priority uh, for everyone engaged in, in this arena 10 plus years ago. Started, started off with HCEI, the inclinations from the commission that identify getting off of fossil fuels and attacking that 
major cost on the bill head on. Uh, we responded to commission guidance in this case, again, focusing on those major costs centered in the ECRC. Uh, and again, HRS 296-6B, the mandate to consider this very issue uh, and Hawaii's legal mandates, including the RPS and the carbon neutrality mandate. We, we simply can't ignore this and we have to lay this strong foundation. So our portfolio to attack this issue has three components. First of all, in the very short term, a fossil fuel reduction, call it a PIM or, or, or shared savings mechanism. We also uh, support uh, uh, Sydney County Honolulu's efforts to develop a greenhouse gas PIM and Ulupono's uh, initiative and efforts to develop an RPS APM. Frankly, we're okay with all of the above because as the IPCC tells us, this is gonna require a multifaceted, all hands, all across the board effort by everyone. And we got 10 years to do it. Um, and, and we can tailor those incentives, all part of a portfolio, but we need that short-term incentives, annual systematic reduction in fossil fuel use. Uh, in addition to that short-term mechanism, we are also proposing revisiting the ECAC risk sharing incentive uh, to make that more meaningful uh, than the initial step the commission took two years ago. Uh, and again, the long-term phase out of the ECRC. Uh, next slide, please. So these are the details of the fossil fuel use reduction PIM. Uh, this was, again, in direct response to the PUC's guidance, urging parties to come up with proposals to address this issue. Um, there are basic parameters here that we are recommending. Um, and I, we believe that this provides a sound approach to establishing this sort of incentive. Uh, whether it's fossil fuel use in totality or some other parties have expressed openness to fossil fuel use intensity. Uh, this is, I think, uh, through the efforts of, of Ron and, and looking at the various approaches and, and the various details, this is the way you can start addressing that issue. Um, first of all, again, annual reductions are rewarded. Uh, we're proposing reward only, although you can also penalize uh, backsliding. Whether normalize the data, and so there's that element of objectivity and fairness. Include all fossil fuel use, so utility plus purchase power, so you don't have any leakage from one plant or the other. Uh, and we propose using MMBTU as really the bottom line metric. Uh, but the utility has indicated that MMBTU is not available for IPPs. So Ron, uh, Mr. Benz is proposing for IPPs, we can convert megawatt hours, which is reported to MMBTUs using an estimated or assumed heat rate. Uh, and that's gonna get us good enough, close enough, because what we're looking at is the overall changes in fossil fuel, fuel use uh, year by year. And so even using an estimated or assumed heat rate, uh, we're hitting basically the metrics with sufficient precision. Uh, so recalling Carl's point about precision versus accuracy. Um, another important aspect of this would be to apply a dead ban because there's already a declining trend in um, fossil fuel use and reliance. And so use a five-year average, uh, find the trend line, and a dead ban around that decline and any exemplary performance in reducing fossil fuel use would be rewarded. Um, Ron, do you wanna add anything? I think I pretty much covered all the bases there. No, I think that's pretty good. Um, thank you. The point I think I would emphasize is that the utility can reduce um, the use of carbon-based fuels in lots of different ways. Um, obviously, moving from uh, oil to solar is one way, and that's underway. We're offering the ability to speed that up. 
but also uh, energy efficiency efforts on the company's behalf, efficiency gains in the operation of the power plants. Those all contribute to the reduction in use of fossil fuel. So it's um, it, it's a it's a SSM or a PIM, whichever you choose to call it, that's um, broad in the sense that it captures lots of possible activities, but it also is going to be very difficult to game. Um, shifting production between the company and purchases won't really uh, uh, change anything. So um, we'll show you some statistics in just a minute that uh, shows how this would work. Uh, if you could advance to the next slide. Uh, so, so this shows the reduction in Pico's fuel use from their own plants. Uh, next slide, please. Before you leave that. Yes. The um, two lines there, one's green and one's blue. The green is the actual, the blue is the weather adjusted. So if you look at the change from 2018 to 2019, there would appear, appear to be an increase in fossil fuel use. That's true, but because of weather, uh, if we factor that out, you'll see 18 to 19 was about flat. Okay, so here is a demonstration of Mr. Bin's proposal, uh, which is, again, a five-year average dead ban based on, uh, sorry, uh, a dead band based on the five-year average decline. Uh, and so if you look at 2017, there was a 1.58% decline, uh, which exceeded the five-year dead band by 0.58%. So you would take that exemplary decline, multiply it by the fuel price, average fuel price for that, the, the, the previous year, uh, and then you could do whatever you want in terms of sharing the savings from that reduction in fuel use. Uh, this is just an illustrative example, but obviously the PC has discretion determining what kind of rewards attach to this incentive. Next slide, please. Uh, so before I move to the, the next point, uh, I did want to acknowledge the PUC's uh, information requests inquiring about several proposals uh, related to this idea of incentivizing a reduction in fuel use costs. Uh, the, the specific nature of those proposals look, try to uh, incorporate the cost of acquiring renewable energy and directly compare that to the savings uh, from getting off of fossil fuels. I think the party's response covered well sort of the concerns that that type of approach raises um, and Blue Plant's open to that type of approach, but I think there are some details that would be, need to be worked out as the parties have explained. Um, so moving on to the second prong of this portfolio, and that is to increase the ECAC risk sharing. Uh, Blue Planet in the previous rate case cycle proposed a 5% sharing percentage with a 10 million annual cap and 1 million annual cap, uh, sorry, 10 million annual cap for HECO and 1 million annual cap for Miko and Helco. Uh, the PEC adopted an amount less than half of that, uh, which they called a deliberately conservative and gradual approach, but expressly said they would revisit this issue uh, in this proceeding. Uh, and Blue Planet notes that the current sharing amount really is a drop in the bucket as far as financial impacts on HECO, uh, and it should be increased to make it more of a meaningful incentive. Uh, compare the impact of just the decoupling revenue adjustments, and we're talking, in that case, an order of magnitude greater than the financial impacts of this ECAC risk sharing. Um, we plan to emphasize that even if we go to that original proposal of 5% sharing and a higher cap, really it's the annual baseline reset that's going to be the controlling factor. This is not going to go wildly out of control because every year we're annually uh, we're, we're resetting the baseline, and that's going to be the ultimate cap. Um, and as Blue Planet has indicated in the data we shared in our standard position, rarely does 
the annual fluctuation in fuel use ever hit that cap. It's always under the amount sometime and only maybe a year or two, it will hit that cap in a, in, in a wide fluctuation. So just wanted to emphasize that point. Um, and responding to the consumer advocate, uh, which has proposed to get rid of this mechanism and institute instead audits. Uh, Blue Planet doesn't oppose an audit and a both and approach couldn't hurt. Uh, but as we've emphasized, citing other commissions that have implemented this risk sharing, an audit is not a substitute for skin in the game. And in fact, Blue Planet would emphasize that some kind of sharing is really legally mandated by HRS 269-16. Uh, next, please. Next slide. Now, this ECAC risk sharing that was established in the rate case starting two years ago was always just a first step to start addressing this issue. And that's why we are proposing other aspects of this portfolio. And, and another aspect that we propose, even in the rate cases, and even in the decoupling and reexamination docket, was this long-term phase out of the ECRC. Fossil fuel use, again, has been steadily declining. And all this phase out does is to reinforce and confirm that trend and put our money where our mouth is as far as our commitment to get off of fossil fuels. And the long-term incentive here is to make good on that promise to shift to renewables and fairly share the risk between the utility and its customers. The, the, the mechanism is basically returning the utilities and regulation to the previous practice when utilities did not have fuel clauses and really the fuel use costs were on the utilities and were an issue of utility performance rather than risk shifting to customers. Uh, next slide, please. And so here's again, um, the total generation or total fuel use of the HECO companies and IPPs. Oh, this is, oh, I'm sorry, this is only uh, HECO plants because we're tracking HECO's fossil fuel reliance. Uh, next slide, please. And, and this, we also shared in our statement of position, which just shows the year to year decline of fossil fuels showing a steady trend, uh, more or less. Next slide, please. And, and uh, these are the details of that mechanism. Basically, every year, the eligibility, the total amount of fossil fuel eligible for pass-through is decreased. That fuel use amount is whether normalized. When that annual ceiling is hit, if it's hit, then basically the fuel price is frozen at an average for that year, and then the utility bears the risk of price fluctuations for the rest of the year. Uh, we consider an approach where if the cap is hit, then the utility will be responsible for all fuel costs and not just the changes, uh, but we thought that'd be overly drastic. And so again, the risk is on the fluctuations for the rest of the year once the cap is hit. Uh, this provides a long-term incentive again, and it really should be combined with that initial incentive to make sure we're reducing fossil fuels year after year. Next slide, please. Um, and this just summarizes our portfolio approach. There's different aspects and incentives for each of these incentives. And they play a complementary role. You need them all to cover all the bases. So again, the fossil fuel reduction PIM reduces fossil fuel in the short term. The risk sharing avoids the moral hazard of de-risking fossil fuel reliance levels the playing field between low price, fixed price renewables and volatile fossil fuels. And the phase out provides that long-term signal that we are actually going to move away from fossil fuels and lead the performance risk of fossil fuel reliance and costs on the utility at the end of the day. Uh, going back to skin in the game, as the commission said in its inclinations. I was just about to turn it on uh, if he had any additions, but he, he just turned off his video. So next slide, please. 
Oh, go ahead, Ron, if you have anything to add. Uh, we can go ahead. Isaac, this is Ron. Um, you just disappeared for 30 seconds, so I'm not sure what's being said. I, I just want to remind the commissioners that the fossil fuel reduction PIM, the first one that Isaac went through, was actually uh, stimulated by comments that Commissioner Michael Florio made in the earlier workshops. Uh, Blue Planet in that workshop had reminded the group about the risk sharing mechanism that got that was included in the ECRC. And um, so thinking off the top of his head, Mike said, um, well, it would be better, wouldn't it be better if you could, re you could incentivize the reduction actually in the amount of fuel that they use? And we had never really looked at that before. Um, and it began to uh, develop and we began to see the merits of it, including, as I said earlier, that this is broader than just um, what goes into the generation portfolio. It includes other efforts the utility might make um, that would, as a general matter, reduce the amount of carbon used to provide uh, the, uh, the people of Hawaii with electricity. So um, I, I didn't want to lose the tribute to Mike Florio. We internally call it the Florio PIM. Thank you, uh, Ron. And, and I also want to add that although this was in response to commission guidance in this proceeding, this is not a new idea and we need to emphasize that. Uh, the consumer advocate and HECO have expressed openness to this concept of incentivizing fossil fuel reduction, but have tried to pivot to maybe an alternative of uh, addressing fossil fuel use intensity. Blue Planet's open to that. And I think the same approach would apply with the various parameters we discussed in terms of dead bands and uh, exemplary reductions and what have you, uh, weather adjusted. But we want to emphasize that this idea of a fossil fuel PIM, and specifically the fossil fuel intensity alternative has been raised more than five years ago. Uh, in fact, here's a fun fact. TUC parties IR3 in the decoupling reexamination docket asked about this very issue about fossil fuel use incentives. In response to that TUC IR3 in that docket, the consumer advocate said, ECO said they were open to a fossil fuel intensity PIM. In this docket, PUC parties IR3 raised the same question. And so really the, the issue here is, are we going to stop talking about it and say we're open to it and actually moving forward on this uh, overridingly important incentive? Uh, next slide, please. So th this is a, the last slide regarding our overall principles and recommendations regarding PIMS. Uh, we covered this in our statement of position, so I'll summarize. We agree with that priority focus on outcome-based PIMS. We support the establishment of one or more outcome-based PIMS on this overriding issue of fossil fuel reduction, renewable energy acceleration, and greenhouse gas mitigation. Uh, we can conceive it as a, conceive it as a sub portfolio. Uh, again, uh, more than one PIM would help. It's, this is not an externality. It's a mandate uh, for the PUC uh, and for our, for our energy goals. Uh, yes, 200 B, uh, basis points on ROE equivalent is what we've been advocating for the beginning. Anything less than that, why are we even, we, we even bothering? We need to make it meaningful. Uh, and we have proposed to relocate the development of PIMS, particularly the DER-related PIMS, to the relevant subject matter dockets. I know this proposal is uncomfortable, and believe us, Blue Planet has been pushing for incentives since 2008, the original decoupling docket. Uh, it was all about a quid pro quo. You get decoupling, the people get, the public gets real incentives. Uh, and so we do not take this recommendation lightly, but the fact of the matter is the development of these PINs, particularly on DERs, 
has been lagging. Uh, we object, we reject the assertion by the companies that somehow Blue Plan has been dragging its feet and we're only saying this because we don't have a, a, a concrete proposal with regards to, for example, interconnection. That's completely untrue. Blue Planet, the DR parties have been addressing and raising the shortfalls in the, for example, the interconnection PIM throughout the working group process. And we still have a proposed PIM just looking at the initial intake step of uh, conditional approval. Uh, we can do that. We better. We can do better. We must do better. Um, and I think even the companies acknowledge that the DR PIM could be rendered, quote, irrelevant or outdated, quote, based on all the efforts in the DR docket to really transform the utility interconnection process and utility DR programs. Uh, and so, yes, we are suggesting that particularly on these really important PIMs where the underlying work on the programs, the underlying analysis, for example, in IGP is still ongoing. Um, it's better to have a PIM later that's based on real analysis and real data rather than something that simply locks in the status quo. Again, we don't make that recommendation lightly, but it's, it's really the fact of the matter. What we can do in this case, however, in conclusion, is established those PIMs on those priority no regrets outcomes. And in fact, we would call it a huge regret outcome in the sense of if we don't do it now, we just have 10 years to turn this around anyway, we're gonna have huge regrets later for having uh, missed this prime opportunity to finally supercharge our efforts uh, and, and put in those real incentives to get us on that path. Uh, I recall in conclusion, one question in the working groups, what does the headline look once the commission order comes out? Uh, Blue Planet submits that it all comes down to transformation and it all comes down to that question, why are we here pushing clean energy transformation? That headline should read, Hawaii leads the way for incentives on shifting away from fossil fuels to renewable energy and decarbonizing the energy sector. Thank you very much, Chair Commissioners. Thank you, Mr. Milwaukee and Mr. Bins, uh, especially Mr. Bins, thanks for taking time out on your new journeys, forging new ground here. I, don't, I think that'll be the first time we've had testimony from a car so far, plus a nice view. So appreciate it. Uh, next up is the city and county of Honolulu. Can we bring your presentation up, please? Hello, can you hear me today? Good morning, Chair. Good morning. Yes, Good to speak with you. And I'm not speaking from my car, but I do have a painting from Africa that I have uh, South Africa that I haven't hung up yet. So I'm speaking potentially from South Africa. Sorry, I think Mr. Johnson, you're speaking for County of Hawaii, right? That is correct, yes. Oh city city and county of Honolulu is up first. Gotcha. Yeah. Sorry, apologies. No worries. Good morning, Chair Griffin and Commissioners. This is Melly Coleman, Deputy Corporation Counsel for the City. I will be uh, passing this presentation over to Robert Rocky Mould. He is our Energy Program Manager. Thanks, Melly. Uh, and thank you, Chair Griffin and Commissioners and PU staff and all parties. Um, uh, this has been a, uh, a, a really productive ride and you know, the city really appreciates having a seat at the table during this. Um, next slide, please. So really the, the, the city's position in PBR has really been, um, uh, you know, driven by its desire to, you know, tackle really difficult transformative goals for our energy system transformation. Uh, and to do it um, with the power of stakeholders and, you know, aligned on critical priorities. Um, you know, the city's, you know, position is informed by, you know, our responsibility to uh, our stakeholders to prudently manage and provide public resources um, and services, uh, to invest in long-term solutions, and really a, a focus at the city over the last few years with the creation of our office, the Office of Climate Change, Sustainability and Resiliency, has been 
you know, laser focused on climate risk and the cost of carbon emissions. And we really think that it, it's, it's an urgent priority to begin um, reducing our carbon emissions, accelerating those reductions in carbon emissions now, given all of the science that, that has been telling us um, uh, that, you know, we're, we're, we're running out of time. Um, you know, so we, you know, our office developed a resilience strategy. Um, it's not just carbon, you know, emissions and carbon reductions. It's, it's also, you know, improving resilience, and lo which is long-term affordability, um, preparing for uh, disasters um, that are increasing in frequency and, and, and you know, and, and strength um, because of climate change, uh, um, carbon mitigation and adaptation, uh, and then uh, this fourth pillar we have is about community cohesion and really harnessing um, the power of stakeholders in the community to, to lead in the decision-making process and to really incorporate input from communities into decisions that are made sooner and more uh, unequivocally. Uh, the city's also, you know, developing a climate action plan. We've had a draft that we've sent out that includes a number of um, strategies to, um, uh, to reduce carbon uh, emissions in GHG. We also have a 100% renewable transportation goal, um, 2035 for, um, for our city fleet and 2045 for the overall community fleet. Um, again, we really see this as an opportunity uh, to align stakeholders together on a shared mission uh, moving forward. Uh, next slide, please. And, you know, similar to um, what Blue Planet Foundation was saying before, you know, we really focused um, our intervention on, you know, higher level transformative outcomes, um, for lack of a better term. Um, and a lot of those are in, were, are in the city's resilience strategy. Um, it, you know, we really think that, you know, these are higher level priorities, and so we were focused on those. We do think, you know, um, the the, the prioritize outcomes for this proceeding are important and those should also be addressed but given some of the some of the limited resources that we had we really focused in on these higher level goals as we saw them and of course you know GHG reduction um, uh, is one of those we, we recommended creating a PIM on GHG reduction um, we see uh, reducing you know uh, carbon emissions whether it's through energy efficiency through renewable energy through fossil fuel use reduction um, and eventually, through the electrification of transportation and grid modernization, we really see that as a high-level priority. Of course, cost control and affordability are always important. We want to minimize um, impacts on residents and, and ratepayers, uh, particularly low to moderate income ratepayers who aren't able to protect themselves, not only against high rates, but also the future uh, um, you know, cl uh, climate uh, risk uh, that is approaching rapidly. Um, and of course, resilience and, and social equity and inclusiveness are, are high on our priority list as well. We really, um, you know, uh, sort of designed our preferred suite of PIMs, SSS, and, score, and scorecards based, based on these higher level goals. Next slide, please. So we maintain a preference for a GHG reduction PIM. Um, the reason we like the GHG reduction PIM is because it is this higher level priority. We believe it's technology and measure agnostic. Really reducing emissions of greenhouse gases into the air is, is of the utmost importance. And we believe that, you know, that a GHG reduction sort of umbrella PIM would also incent energy efficiency um, as well as, you know, DERs and grid services and some of these other measures um, um, you know, and outcomes that we're, that we're looking for. Um, and we think it sort of, it sort of, sort of sets the, the framework at a very high level, um, does pro put, you know, a, you know, implicit price on carbon, um, not nearly what the social cost of carbon would tell us it is, but it does get us going in the right direction. Um, you know, we, we understand some of the critique of the GHG reduction pin being that, you know, the, you know, the, the data is not clear. There are questions about which data to use. Um, there's now this new priority of doing life cycle uh, analysis uh, coming from the Hawaii Supreme Court. Um, uh, we understand those are, you know, those are challenges. However, we think that, you know, that shouldn't stop us 
from moving forward. Now, the, 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 the perfect should not get in the way of the good on this, and a production-based in-jurisdiction GHG reduction PIM um, will be beneficial, we believe, uh, uh, for the overall system. Um, and of course, you know, it will begin the process of, of rectifying a huge mispricing of climate risk that we have in all of our asset prices, in all of our electricity prices, in all of our prices across the board. We believe we can start that process here through a GHG reduction PIM. Now, we understand, um, we also think the RPSA PIM that Ulupono Initiative has presented and that others have supported um, due to, you know, the significant research and analysis that has gone into it from Ulupono Initiative. I should say the city and county thanks Ulupono Initiative as well for helping us further flesh out some of the GHG reduction PIM ideas we had, and we support that analysis from Ulupono Initiative. Um, we would, you know, we, we support both the, the GHG reduction and RPSA because we believe that the, the addition of the, the incentive levels for them don't even come close to what the, the cost and risk is over, over, over the long-term time frame. So we think it's a good cost-benefit analysis. Um, so we actually do, if, you know, the commission uh, and this proceeding feels that it's not, you know, we can't get to a GHG reduction PIM yet, um, we do support an RPSA PIM, and, you know, we suggest that, you know, some additional complementary measures be made that would sort of bring in some of the um, some of the benefits we see of an overall GHG reduction PIM. For instance, a, a robust a, a GHG reporting program or scorecard, which includes the two metrics that um, Hawaiian Electric has mentioned in terms of the mass-based and the carbon intensity approach. But we also recommend that that scorecard and that reporting program be uh, augmented with monetization uh, figures and metrics and estimates. In particular, social cost of carbon, also um, marginal abatement costs uh, could be added in there, as well as uh, this, an emerging term called the social value of carbon mitigation, um, and that these be projected against a business as usual or RPSA pathway. Um, these have, you know, there is, what, what we realized in some of our prior filings is that there is a high value to early carbon mitigation a very high value. Actually, the, the earlier the carbon mitigation, the higher the value there is to the overall system. So, so we would just uh, point that out. We, so we would think uh, that as part of a scorecard, we would want to put some of these monetization measures in there as well. In addition, um, we'd like to see a strengthened and prioritized set of LMI-focused customer engagement PIMs, particularly for CBRE load reduction and utility bill relief. And we're very encouraged by the IRs uh, that the Commission uh, sent to parties, which, which mentioned two uh, ideas for how Hawaiian Electric can collaborate with some of Hawaii Energy's programs. Again, this, this addition of energy efficiency and load reduction measures was one of the reasons why we liked the overall GHG reduction PIM, and I think this would make, this combined with RPSA would, would help uh, w with some of those. In addition, um, we're also supportive of uh, Blue Planet's, um, you know, ideas for fuel use reduction, as well as a long-term phase-out of the ECRC. As energy efficiency and renewable energy increases on the system, we think it just makes sense that um, you don't need um, that clause as much. Um, uh, and, you know, we think uh, Mr. Binz's uh, analysis and Blue Planet's analysis on this is compelling. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and the city supports a, a shared saving mechanism, basically based on the prior shared saving mechanisms um, that, that the commission has issued. We also are supportive of some of the updates to those that have been recommended by different parties. Um, uh, you know, we think this provides effective cost control for renewable, addition, renewable energy additions. There's a track record of implementing this. And regarding this question of, what, of duplic duplicativeness with the RPSA, we think the RPSA, in a sense, accelerated addition while the SSM assures that those, those additions are cost effective. We think those are complementary to one another and mutually exclusive. Um, in addition, um, uh, we think, you know, effective customer engagement and interconnection experience PIMs will mitigate any concerns of an overemphasis on grid scale projects, which 
um, we were, were we would be a little bit concerned about, uh, and want, again, why we wanted the higher level greenhouse gas reduction PIM. Um, we would also want to, you know, include, you know, that, you know, we we've, we've been looking at the city with um, how to incorporate um, uh, communities' concerns uh, earlier uh, in the project process. We put in some comments in the IGP process on this. I know it's not in this in this panel, um, but if there's an, a really targeted LMI focus on some of these customer engagement um, PIMs, we, we really think that would mitigate some of our concerns uh, around uh, a, a very tailored um, uh, RPSA. Um, we would also like to see, you know, we've we've been reaching out to, to parties on, you know, how to make data, energy data, more transparent uh, and available. For, for planning purposes, and that, that could be included there. Um, uh, and the city concurs with and defers to other parties that, you know, some, you know DDR effectiveness and interconnection experience, they might be better served uh, in other dockets right now. And we really, you know, um, w where there's a really intense analysis going on in, on them, and um, there's a lot to be worked out with them, we think, still. Um, and that's why, you know, we, at the city have been, you know, focused on, you know, these, the, the higher level, what we, we call higher level um, uh, PIMs. Um, uh, next slide, please. So for scorecards, again, we, we mentioned a robust GHG reporting program. We think this, um, you know, going forward, um, there could be a really, you know, in developing the scorecard, if it's not going to be part of a GHG reduction PIM, um, even, and, and if it were part of designing the GHG reduction PIM through a tariff, um, this would be a really productive, complementary, and collaborative effort with a number of stakeholders, and we would want to invite in other folks to help us put together this GHG reporting uh, program or, or, or scorecard. Um, uh, you know, if it does become a scorecard, um, we would like you know there be there to be an intentional focus on elevating it to a PIM by the next control period, um, and uh, we would want to include both life cycle and in jurisdiction analysis uh, uh, for the scorecard. And as I mentioned before, we want to include monetary metrics for the value of GHG emissions reductions. And uh, we, we, we would like to see scorecards or metrics uh, on resilience, EOT, and equity in particular in this proceeding. Um, and with that, uh, uh, I will uh, end it there and just say once again, we really look forward to working with, um, the, the, you know, appreciate the, you know, working with the stakeholders here and have seen a lot of, um, a lot of common ground reached um, among all the parties, including um, Hawaiian Electric and the consumer advocate uh, and the interveners. And we're very encouraged by it and we think we can, we, we're very hopeful um, that this proceeding will, 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 will result in productive and constructive um, uh, alignment of incentives going forward. So thank you very much. Great, thank you, Mr. Mould. Uh, just in the, since everyone has been so efficient this morning, we're gonna take a break here um, and pick things up with the County of Hawaii's panel. Uh, we're gonna go on a 15 minute break. So let's reconvene at 10.35 and we'll pick things up with the rest of the presentations. Uh, thanks everyone, we're journeying briefly, thank you.
So we're going to get started again in a few minutes. Hi, do we have Mr. Johnson? Yep, that's me again. Good to see you today. Hi. Great, we're going to get started very shortly. Perfect. You've got your presentation up. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, we've got the live stream up and working, so we're going to call the hearing back to order. Uh, continue on with the presentation from County of Hawaii, and Mr. Johnson, you'll be doing the presentation. Correct. Great. Thank you. Please proceed. Perfect. Uh, aloha, and uh, pleasure to see all the commissioners again, uh, interveners, and also members of the public and society. Uh, one of the things I always appreciate about uh, partaking within the performance-based regulation discussions is it's uh, engaging collaborative and it provides an opportunity for knowledge sharing just as these sessions today it's been a i would say continual thread of conversations as well as these conversations and how we think about uh, energy power regulation and technology providers and utility structures also in the south and southwestern states and so I always just want to uh, recommend, uh, recognize that and thank everyone for their insights and opportunity to provide our own as well. Next slide, please. So just as a short summary, there are four different mechanisms that I'll be covering today, um, both involving uh, uh, PIMs, scorecards, and then also report metrics. Next slide, please. Starting off with DR asset effectiveness, one thing that I've appreciated about the terminology chosen because it embodies a philosophy that effectiveness is beyond the value of mere just adoption. And so effectiveness tries to ascertain and ask questions that allow us to get the most out of what we're installing. And so when we think about grid services as a broader envelope, it includes energy capacity and then also uh, ancillary services. Uh, county is taking the position to put greater emphasis on ancillary services because DERs have the capacity to provide that, particularly with enhancements in technology, communications, and control, noting, however, that there is also additional regulation, business models, reward mechanisms, and then also potential cost considerations to include unlocking and unlocking the value of those uh, assets for different forms of ancillary services. Next slide, please. And to summarize those briefly, we often think of these in terms of frequency response, uh, spinning or non-spinning reserve based upon the duration of time it takes to become synchronized and utilized, or voltage support. And sometimes these could be categorized as a subset or fast frequency response, depending on where you're at uh, in the world, uh, what data is being gathered by the utility and what's being monitored. And while these are options uh, uh, to include a more inclusive and expansive 
a subset of these may also be worthwhile or reasonable from a metric standpoint um, for DR asset effectiveness. Next slide, please. One thing that we also realize in this is that uh, by unlocking the potential of DERs to provide ancillary services, such as spinning reserve and non spinning reserve, that capability can then displace conventional thermal generation with higher OPEX costs and potentially higher CAPEX, depending on how you look at the problem, for providing similar capabilities. And so, in that essence, that means that we're utilizing existing infrastructure, getting more value from it. And that allows us to displace the cost we put elsewhere, which ultimately leads it to a shared savings model. There's a few ways, however, which the savings could be shared. This broken up between companies, all customers, and DR owners. Um, often we have seen this broken up just between companies and all customers. The reason that DR owner is there as well is the question of is ancillary are ancillary services being financially compensated? Are that financial compensation being transmitted to the because the owner might need to install additional technology or, for example, partially ramp down their solar PV to provide frequency spots for regulation up, and that reduces the value or, or the benefit to them uh, individually. And so then a the question is, do they need to be compensated for that benefit? And that's not to say it, it needs to be done either as a share of the ancillary services revenue or as a shared savings for the displacement of the ancillary services that would have gone through thermal generation sources, just some way to recognize for the additional cost or the reduction in value to the DR owner by utilizing those assets for the power system. Next slide, please. And the, the first bullet largely summarizes what I said. The second thing is to indicate that uh, utilizing um, DRs for ancillary services provides us with new opportunities for non-wireless alternatives. And then also, depending on the level of sophistication, control, and business models, there's a variety of things noted there at the bottom, such as load uh, load leveling, reverse demand response, uh, reductions in capital upgrades, um, stabilizing power quality, and et cetera, which can be done in the future now that we have the market mechanism to reward DR, DRs for this form of effectiveness. Next slide, please. One of the questions that's been increasingly raised is the interconnection experience. And so we responded directly to the remarks circulated within the last two weeks. And so this essentially summarizes uh, that response back. Is it looking at the interconnection of systems less than 100 kilowatts, there's been a question of how do you handle, um, do you take the, the mean value of the duration of time being reviewed, or do you take the median value of the duration of time being pursued? Uh, and also, how do you handle the outliers at either side? Uh, county here is proposing a, a mean or average value, then with the outliers removed at either side. And you could look at this as in that way or the mean or the median way. And this is really up to the commission to think about the form of incentive that is going to be, or this, the type of behavior that is intended to be incentivized. Because if it's a, a median value, there could be an option of, for example, having a fast track interconnection process where 55% or 60% 60, 60 go, go through a fast track process, and then there's no attention, furthermore, as much paid from an incentive format to that remaining 35% or 40% or whatever that value is. And so the county, county feels that having the mean value reported better specifies the breadth of everyone's experiences rather than a simple majority in this case. And so that's really up to the commission, I think, but this was another uh, idea or option for a lot Another thing to consider from the first bull's perspective is that um, are we is the duration of time the the conditional approval of the interconnection agreement and what is within the company's control of that process again uh, a consideration that needs to be reviewed and approved by the commission because as interconnection processes have changed over the past 10 20 years and will continue to change are there additional steps is there uh, parts of that that are paired off and sent to other parties. And so just to be aware of what, quite clearly what bins of, of the process are being included within the duration of time being done. Next slide, please. Um, so looking at this directly follows the date specified timelines that I discussed in center out earlier. The 27 duration and the 20 duration, noting that the first has a, both a reward and a penalty, an upside and a negative side. 
and any further advantage is pursued if the mean value is less than 20 minutes. Next slide, please. Uh, continuing on, I talked a little bit about the uh, behavioral differences between what a median strategy or a mean value strategy would look like. And then I already mentioned a bit about the interconnection process to be considered in the review uh, before that being approved, and then reviewed periodically in the future as that process potentially change. Next slide, please. To think more about resilience, and then we'll close with a bit of discussion on uh, GHG emissions. Uh, we realize that over the course of the, the PBR discussions in the course of uh, last five, 10 years, is that resilience has been a growing topic, a growing consideration of looking at uh, the fragility or brittleness of the electric grid. Um, but conceptualizing it has often been a challenge. And this has been stated publicly by many individuals uh, in our sessions and also realized as well in literature as well as you no know, universal metric by which we establish resilience. County's position on this one is that it cannot be uh, pigeonholed into a singular technical metric. And there might be certain types of assets or capabilities to enhance resilience, such as microgrids. But the simple matter of having those systems at your beck and call does not make a, a behavior or resilience system. And so it's really a property of the technology, the, the uh, stakeholders involved in the training and the organizational process. Uh, and as always, as things change and evolve over time, we redo our risk management frameworks and we also re redo our resilience analysis and our plans of action. Next slide, please. To continue here, as we summarized a variety of different metrics pulled, as indicated in our statement of position, um, from existing uh, data that other utilities are collecting, uh, other uh, non utilities or third parties are collecting, and piecemeal formats around the nation and globally. Noting that there is not a universal compendium of this information that you can just find on a particular internet site or report. But these are the types of information that we uh, selected from the other resources that other uh, companies and groups are selecting as what would be the most critical to also um, uh, complement the existing technical metrics and financial metrics that the companies are, are reporting to the commission. Next slide, please. Furthermore about this is, yes, uh, resilience is an evolving issue. It requires an expansive dialogue. The other thing I'll indicate there on the bottom is as the commission's request for some of the information is not just information being presented, but what might come next is the target values, for example, in a reported metric. Or it's a scorecard. Which values are we going to take from other utilities or third parties? That can be reviewed in a workshop or even uh, asynchronously offline to come to some form of common uh, consensus or value of the values and the metrics that we set. Next slide, please. So going ahead to the last one that I'll speak about today is greenhouse gas emissions. And what the county is proposing and what we've uh, looked at from the beginning from the original conversations about performance-based regulation is the, the total greenhouse gas emissions versus uh, greenhouse gas intensity, and if it is either one of those, how do you actually specifically calculate that metric? Because the calculation of that metric embodies uh, uh, the concept which drives a particular action or behavior by the utility and by other parties engaged in the industry, in energy industry. So the county is recommending here that this includes all generation and all loads. Now, this is important to realize is that as the energy industry changes, the utilities are not just um, vertically integrated or horizontally integrated. They are, they can become platform entities that are essentially required, mandated to not only provide safe, reliable, cost effective, and renewable power, but do so in a way that includes a mix of assets, load management, electric vehicles from a variety of different customers. And that changes their business model and it changes their requirements quite substantially to be something that they need to essentially create a Lego block style grid. And then how do you um, manage and provide them with a mechanism of value to, to uh, um, further instantiate that, that capability of role being a platform-based entity? Next slide, please. 
What I did want to do is show how the metrics are related or potentially linked to one another, at least effect. And so typically when we would think of greenhouse gas intensity, we would look at it from a point source such as thermal generation, natural gas power plant, all centralized generation together across the entire fleet or portfolio. And then lastly, which is what came to a common consensus in one of our, uh, our earlier PBR meetings in one of the tables that I was at, of saying, uh, given the utility is moving to be a platform entity, and given that the utility is needing to manage and provide value and stability to you know, solar PV generation without the backup power locally and other third parties coming on, what about all generation and all loads? And so if we were to think of that first one, just to summarize this quite briefly, is that as more and more renewables come up broadly on the electric grid and your uh, output of your thermal power plant went from, let's say, 90% to 40%, I'm just taking numbers out of the area, the efficiency would drop, and as a result of that as well, your greenhouse gases, gases would go up on an intensity level. Uh, they would, as a total level, reduce, but on an intensity level, they would go up. Centralized generation, we take a look at that, if as we're you know, creating and looking at metrics of DER effectiveness and how valuable they could be, more DER is, is the current goal, uh, and what's being reported is how do we create a, uh, facilitate the introduction of more renewables? But a good question is, Depending on the unit commitment that day and what assets are on or set at, your greenhouse gas emissions could go up or down in terms of intensity basis. But if you look at all generation, including what the utility owns and what is third party and customer sided, and also all loads being used, what is inherently the basic mathematics is that as DRs went up, GHG metrics would go would also go uh, they would uh, go down, which is what we want to see. And so by looking at all generation, all loads, we create reinforcing mechanisms, reinforcing metrics to further uh, incent the behavior that we want to see, which is a sort of global feature that is uh, sustainable and cost effective. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is just a quick summary of that, uh, again, in text form on the metric. Go ahead and next slide, please. And then a few additional considerations is that the whole system metric also provides a more complete picture of carbon emissions over time. It also, up to the Commission's discretion, allows us to consider how the metrics of performance-based regulation that we're talking about relate to transportation as well. Because then if we're talking about electrical loads, uh, EVs also then become electrical load. In the future, if there is a future uh, for a vehicle to grid and how big that future is going to be, that would then also be an asset of generation that would likely be categorized as a non-spinning reserve provided it's actually physically available to utilize since it's a storage entity. Um, that could then be reevaluated with this metric in the future. Uh, county is recommending a reported metric because there's a limited amount of data to compare against other utilities. And partly that's due to the last element right there is that um, there could be an issue with monitoring and getting data on what the, the load loads are or the electrical loads divorced or separate from any on-site renewables generation, particularly in a net metering scenario, because you're just kind of rolling back the dial. And so if there's insufficient metering uh, set up at points of customer-sided uh, renewables to disconnect uh, uh, loads used from generation, um, that would pose something that would pose a potential problem that might be cost prohibitive, but it's something to think through, something to evaluate as a means to get to this renewables future. And that concludes my remarks, and I'll pass it back to you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, we'll move next to the DER parties. Do we have Mr. Harris, you're speaking? Yes, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes, please proceed. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to present and to participate in this proceeding. My name is Robert Harris, and I am joined by Will Giese, who will be both the DR parties' witnesses moving forward. The focus of the DR parties will largely be on the performance incentive mechanisms and how to optimize DR deployment within the broader electrical system. As an initial note, we observe some parties have questioned the need to have DER-specific PIMs. This is a fundamental issue nationally, and not just in Hawaii. There is a tension between the competitive DER marketplace and electric utilities. We've seen these debates in multiple states with relatively few examples of DER customers and utilities 
being able to work together collaboratively. We hope Hawaii can be a leader and pave a pathway to a better electrical system that sees DERs as an opportunity and not simply a disruption. As this commission has, has observed, DERs are an emerging technology and existing regulatory mechanisms may not do a good job of encouraging exemplary utility behavior. The DER parties believe fundamental changes to the cost of service model is necessary in order to navigate a shift towards a customer centric model where DERs are fundamental building block of the modern electrical grid. Appropriately designed PIMs are a stepping stone towards this effort. That being said, the DER parties joined Blue Planet's proposal to defer a DER interconnection PIM to the DER docket. <clears throat> we note that substantive efforts are ongoing to expedite the entire interconnection experience. The utilities have been asked to present a holistic review, which the DER parties hope will result in a faster and more efficient process. Pegging incentive to Hawaiian Electric's current performance could undercut this effort. To the extent the Commission wishes to proceed at this time, we note the need to consider an interconnection experience from the customer's point of view. There are few purchases in life to take the current time frame to interconnect or what is being proposed by the Hawaiian Electric Utilities. Delays to interconnection have real cost to customers and cause lower adoption rates. As the DR parties have previously presented, delays in interconnection and permitting currently compromise about 30% of a total DER system cost on a national basis, a figure the DER parties believe is higher in Hawaii. If we want DERs to be more available to LMI customers and to provide more electrical system benefits, we need to reduce the overall delay and the associated cost of interconnecting. Hawaiian Electric has done more to map and document the status of its circuits than most utilities. It should already have the ability to pre-approve or allow interconnection on most circuits without substantive review. Non-exporting systems or systems with advanced inverter features should be able to interconnect and turn on in a matter of days, not weeks or months. As the DR parties have noted in their IR responses, a more aggressive PIM would follow the standard practice of comparable utilities. PG&E, which handles more interconnection applications than any other utility in the United States, typically interconnects customers within five to 10 business days after receiving customer documentation. Puerto Rico, a similar island grid, allows systems under 25 kW to interconnect and operate immediately upon receiving certific certification by an electrician that these systems were installed appropriately. To reiterate, Hawaii, with its extensive experience with interconnection and overall need for DERs, should be a national leader in an expedited and, and efficient interconnection process. At the very least, an optimal time frame should be comparable to PG&E's time. With regards to defining the steps within the company's control, we propose those discrete steps in the interconnection process where the utility is required to take action and needs no further materials or information from the DER customer to take such action. Turning to asset effectiveness, the DER parties have previously proposed a system effectiveness PIM. It offers several advantages other, over other concepts, including aligning utility incentives around energy efficiency, rate or program structures, and encouraging cost-effective deployment of renewables. The core concept is to encourage efficiency in how the system runs at any particular period. The goal of optimizing, optimizing around low cost, the full gamut of resources under the utility's control including rate design and DER programs. We note, however, that other proposals may get similar um, benefits, such as the proposal just proposed by, or just uh, presented by Blue Planet around fuel reduction or the county's proposals around greenhouse gas emission reductions. We also note the DER parties proposed a utility investment deferral PIM. On a going forward basis, we anticipate increasing electrification will require substantial investments in modernizing the Hawaiian Electric Grid. The purpose of this proposed PIM was to encourage the utility to defer unnecessary infrastructure improvements for other proposals to address the underlying system needs. Finally, the DR parties support shared savings concepts. 
we believe it is a risk-free stepping stone towards encouraging non-traditional utility behavior. That being said, as we've stated in the past, shared savings by itself rarely provides a positive incentive to utility. It at best frequently returns the utility to a neutral position. An economically rational utility will compare it a share savings incentive to potential loss of revenue over a 20 or 25 year period. Without other PIMs or changes to the cost of service model, shared savings by itself are unlikely to encourage significant changes to utility behavior. This has been borne out with experiences in both New York and California, where utilities have failed to aggressively pursue shared savings options. This concludes the DER party's presentation. We thank you for the opportunity to present. Mr. Harris. Next up, we have uh, Life of the Land, Mr. Curtis. Aloha, commissioners, staff, parties, consultants, everyone else, including those watching us on YouTube. In the opening of this regulatory proceeding in April of 2018, the Commission spoke of an old regulatory paradigm needing to adjust to the new era of disruptive techno technological advances. Quote, by providing rewards for specific outcomes and objectives, PBR framework should provide utility with the opportunity to earn fair compensation based on business model that is well aligned with the public interest, unquote. While some PBR mechanisms such as decoupling have been implemented over the past decade, the current PBR proceeding seeks to move leaps and bounds beyond the initial mechanisms. Lifeline has been involved, has been a party or a participant in more than 50 PUC proceedings spanning a half century. Lifeline greatly appreciates the collaborative work that we have all been engaged in for the past two plus years in this extremely important and extraordinarily complex undertaking. Just as cell phones and the internet reinvigorated the telecommunications industry, the digital transformation of the electrical sector through smart two-way communications, visualization across the entire grid, and the phenomenal growth and shrinking prices of solar, wind, and energy storage is transforming the world as we know it. The coronavirus has digitalized meetings, hearings, and notifications, so it has had one plus. How the utilities are incentivized to meet public policy goals is truly complex. What goals, what carrots, and what sticks? The Hawaii Public Utilities Commission stands in the middle of this disruptive storm, guiding and leading the process, mindful of the need for utility and stakeholder engagement, transparency, and cross-silo thinking. The HECO companies answered PUC HECO IR 30 at seven by stating that they, quote, file somewhere in the range of 400 separate reports with the commission of varying length, complexity, and frequency, unquote, in 2019. Having a one-page web-based real-time listing of those filings with links to the reports would increase efficiency. The commission has developed the first web-based calendar of commission hearings. Someone needs to expand it to cover all energy meetings and conferences so we all can participate at a greater level and avoid conflicts. One of the most interesting aspects of this proceeding is that Life of Land found that we were in lockstep with Ulupono Initiative's analysis. Not merely that we do not oppose some of their positions, but that we are in full support of their positions. This proved critical as we were absorbing vast amounts of new material in this proceeding and also actively engaging in a number of other cutting edge proceedings at the PUC. The RPSA will move the utility faster to adopt renewable energy, which is currently much cheaper than the avoided cost. This will drive down the overall cost and will lower rates and should alleviate some of the consumer advocates' concerns about that mechanism. The climate change nightmare does not follow a normal statistical pattern. At one end of the spectrum, things may not be as dire as the scientific consensus predicts. 
At the other end of the spectrum, most global e ecosystems will cease to exist and all life forms larger than a house cap will die. This isn't a time for measuring how we are doing compared to others. This is a time for action. To deal with climate change, we must rapidly decrease all greenhouse gas emissions. This proceeding may suggest scorecards for reporting greenhouse gas emissions or greenhouse gas intensities. These scorecards should be limited to serving as a snapshot of something that is occurring, but should not serve as rebuttable presumption or conclusive presumption in fact or in law in any other proceeding. To develop greenhouse gas PIMs that reduce life cycle carbon emissions and intensities, it is necessary to determine the appropriate baseline. LifeLand has raised greenhouse gas emission issues for 20 years at the PUC. And following our two victories at the Hawaii Supreme Court, the PUC is aggressively overseeing and guiding some intense life cycle greenhouse gas analyses in various electric, gas, and refinery proceedings. Many of these greenhouse gas proceedings involve life and land, but none of them involve greenhouse gas PIM advocates in this proceeding. These other proceedings are the correct place to consider life cycle baselines, how greenhouse gas reduction should take place, and how any performance incentive mechanism might be applied. Some parties have suggested using fossil fuel as a proxy for greenhouse gas emissions. Other parties have proposed various greenhouse gas PIMs and metrics. Life of Land has serious concerns about these limited analyses. In conclusion, we thank the Commission for this transparent, open, stakeholder-involved collaborative process. Mahalo. Thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Curtis. Next up, we have Ulupono Initiative to give our final presentation for this panel. Thank you, Chair Doug Kodaga, outside counsel for Ulupono. And uh, this presentation will be made by our lead witness for this panel, Murray Clay, president of Ulupono. If I may, Chair's permission, turn it over to Mr. Clay. Yes, please proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, staff, parties, aloha. My name is Murray Clay. I'm the president of Ulupono Initiative, and I'm pleased to present our proposal for performance incentive mechanisms. Next slide, please. So the PBR docket has been largely framed around these 12 outcomes, and the outcomes that are listed in boldface are the ones that commission staff has proposed that PIMS focus on. So I won't read them to you. I think we've all become fairly familiar with this list of outcomes and have debated uh, rigorously the relative merits of each. Next slide, please. So the commission has also indicated that as a matter of good principles, metrics, and therefore PIMS as well, should reflect desired outcomes, be clearly defined, be quantifiable through reasonably available data, be easily interpreted, and be easily verifiable. And we certainly support all those requirements and believe that our PIMS in fact meet all of those requirements. Next slide, please. Beyond sort of good uh, procedures and framing for PIMS and metrics, Ulupono has had three fundamental guidelines or principles that we've used in addressing this docket. The first is that we want to get to our 100% renewable energy future by the lowest cost price path. And then if we make the incentives right, if we get this right, we really should be agnostic as to utility or non-utility ownership. Shouldn't matter who owns it as long as we've got the incentives right. Similarly, we're not here to pick winners and losers between technology programs, uh, technologies, utility programs, or coal. Really, we should be focused on least cost price path to 100% renewables. Next slide, please. So as has been discussed in the past, we have three main PIMs that we're supporting through this docket. The first is the Renewable Portfolio Standard Accelerated, or the RPSA, the Electrification of Transportation PIM, or EOT PIM, and then various shared savings mechanisms. 
that we kind of discuss together for convenience. And all three of these are clearly outcome based PIMS. Next slide, please. So the RPSA's purpose is to reward the utility for accelerating the achievement of Hawaii's RPS goals. It's outcome based, upside only, and has a reward of $10 per megawatt hour, which is exactly one half of the penalty amount that's already that, that already exists. We believe this PIM addresses at least seven of the 12 identified outcomes, DER asset effectiveness, customer engagement, interconnection experience, cost control, affordability, grid investment efficiency, and greenhouse gas reduction. And I'll go through those. Next slide, please. So for DER asset effectiveness, even though the RPSA PIM in its calculations is completely equal between utility scale renewables and DERs, you might actually think that DERs could have some advantage with, with the RPSA PIM in that they don't require lengthy competitive procurement processes to add. So the fastest way in many cases for the utility to add incremental renewables to achieve the RPSA is simply by getting more DERs on the grid. In terms of customer engagement with a reward available for accelerating the RPS available every year, the utility will have a strong incentive to offer attractive programs to bring more of those customer cited renewables onto the system. And for interconnection experience, we've discussed at length that we think that the RPSA PIM actually addresses interconnection issues in terms of timing more than debating day counts and what's in the utilities control or in someone else's control. If the utility has a strong incentive to accelerate renewables, obviously those renewables can't count unless they're interconnected and producing to the grid. With that incentive in mind, the utility will have a strong incentive to interconnect as quickly as is reasonably possible. For cost control, we know the utility has no control over oil prices, but it does have quite a bit of control over how quickly they can add renewable energy to the system. And we do know, as many folks on this uh, uh, today have mentioned, that renewables generally come at a lower and fixed price as compared to volatile, often higher price oil. So that goes to the affordability outcome for consumers. Grid investment efficiency. If the utility knows, again, that they can get rewarded for accelerating the RPS, they will likewise have a strong incentive to invest in the grid to maximize the amount of renewables that the grid can take. And for greenhouse gas reductions, solar and wind are zero emissions at the source, and even when total life cycle are considered, are generally lower emissions than fossil fuel and other conventional assets. Next slide, please. So late in the working group process, the commission requested that we perform benefit cost analyses, and we responded to that with this analysis. So we broke the RPSA PIM down into three sources of benefit. The first is carbon reduction, which goes to the greenhouse gas reduction outcome. The next is having more fixed and less volatile bills for customers, which is something that customers value, and that goes to affordability. And the third is resiliency benefits, and that has to do with having the ability to generate energy uh, tends to be further inland from the ocean, whereas the ports are a bit more susceptible to hurricanes, tsunamis, and shore-based disasters, as well as geopolitical events. So having that, that generation on site rather than ported is a further benefit. Next slide, please. So this is a slide that uh, most folks in the working group process have already seen. This is a brief summary of the work that we've done. I would note that all of these amounts and values that are presented in the summary have been made available to all the parties through working papers. Everyone can check sort of the calculations and assumptions directly themselves. And we thought that was important to make this, as I believe the consumer advocate mentioned, it's important to have a transparent benefit cost analysis. And we believe we've done precisely that. So the first column goes to carbon emission reductions and to try to not be too heavy handed with it, we went with low, mid and high values for each of these. And that I would note is using $36 per metric ton of CO2 as the valuation, even though most commissions that we've uh, seen that do use a dollar value for greenhouse gases in, in, for example, resource planning, tend to use 42 or $43. We use 36 to allow some room for a greenhouse gas pin without being duplicative by not counting the same portion of value twice. The next column is about customer bill risk reduction, making them again more fixed versus less volatile. And that was supported by the work of Dr. Constantinides at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. And he indicated that customers would be willing to pay somewhere between $1 and 
to fix their power bills instead of have the risk of having them be volatile. And that's broken down on a per kilowatt hour basis from those low, mid and high values that you see there. Everyone I'm sure can notice that resilience has a question mark. We did make an effort to quantify that. We reviewed studies uh, that are used elsewhere. Unfortunately, quantifying resilience is still in its infancy. It's not really for, uh, very far developed. And so we had to leave that as a question mark. We wanted to put that in there because what that means is the benefit is at least greater than because resilience is better than zero. So it's greater than the amounts that we're showing, which is why total benefit always says greater than the amounts that are shown. And when you boil it all down to a per kilowatt hour number, what we're showing is the values that we're proposing paying out for the RPSA PIM are about 10% of the value. And I would say comparing to shared savings mechanisms, we're, we're looking at 20 to 30% of value being paid out. We're uh, pretty uh, modest and only really asking that 10% of that value be paid out to the utility. Next slide, please. So this is a graph that we borrowed from a previous docket. I think this is probably the commission's, one of the commission's uh, graphs from an earlier docket, but it does a good job of showing how renewable energy is both generally fixed price. And you can see that trend line downward that it tends to be lower price and trending downward over time. So having the RPSA really just gives the utility incentive to accelerate renewables and get more of that lower fixed price renewables on the grid, which will benefit customers. Next slide, please. So we did, we spent a lot of our time in this docket. In fact, uh, an exceedingly a large amount of time in this docket focused on financial modeling with the risk financial model that was shared as early as November of 2019 and was the subject of uh, quite a great deal of collaboration with as many of the parties as had an interest, as well as resource planning with Dr. Fripp using the switch Oahu model that he developed. And he's been working on that and, and doing that type of modeling since the, the PSIP work. So a, a years of effort have gone into this modeling. And this is what we believe is achievable, very difficult, but achievable for the utility in terms of the PIM values. The left y-axis is millions of dollars pre-tax. The right y-axis is after-tax ROE impacts. So we can see there's real dollars at stake here. This is gonna be a very strong motivation for the utility, but importantly, this is again for beating the corrected RPS, not the statutory RPS. That's one manner of acceleration. And the other manner of acceleration inherent in the RPS is that the RPS value they must beat goes up every year. We've just interpolated between the 2020, 2030, 2040, and 2045 numbers. We've just drawn straight lines. So for example, in 2020, the amount is 30%. In 2030, it's 40%. So it would go up one percentage point per year over those 10 years as you draw that line. So there's two manners of acceleration inherent in the RPSA, and essentially there's real money at stake, but the utility will have to work very hard to achieve this. Next slide, please. Next is the electrification transportation PIM. That's to reward the utility for being a partner and accelerating the, the transformation to clean transportation. It is outcome-based, upside only, and we propose one cent per kilowatt hour for charging to unmetered stations, and three cents per kilowatt hour to metered stations because of the additional grid services and other things they might later be able to offer. So this EOT PIM does address four priority outcomes, customer engagement, electrification of transportation, greenhouse gas reduction, and grid investment efficiency. Next slide, please. So for customer engagement, it was very interesting to see that in Hawaii between 2018 and 2019, fossil fuel vehicles were relatively flat, Fossil fuel vehicle sales were relatively fat, flat, whereas EV sales were up about 25%. Additionally, nationally, we're seeing that even in the COVID crisis, while both fossil fuel and EV sales are down, certainly, EV sales have taken less of a hit than fossil fuel vehicles. So we see that customers want to make this choice, and the utility can assist them in making that choice by making range anxiety less of a problem and charging simply easier. The electrification of transportation is itself an outcome because EVs are three times as efficient as internal combustion engine vehicles. And importantly, they put downward pressure on electric rates because you're spreading those fixed costs across more kilowatt hours coming from EVs. So this benefits clearly not just EV drivers, but non-EV drivers alike through the possibility of lower rates through decoupling. And then for greenhouse gases, we know that the transportation sector, so light cars and trucks, 
are about 32% of Hawaii's fossil fuel consumption, whereas electricity is about 28%. So transportation is an even larger source of greenhouse gases than the entire electric sector. And just as an example on the efficiency side, again, the Nissan LEAF, even when you consider total life cycle emissions from cradle to grave, has about half the greenhouse gas emissions as the average internal combustion engine vehicle. So this fully addresses the greenhouse gas outcome. Next slide, please. Similar to the RPSA, we broke the benefit cost down analysis down into three parts. Certainly, as I was just saying, carbon reduction, which goes to the greenhouse gas reduction outcome, customer bill reduction through decoupling, which goes to affordability, and grid supported benefits for things like time of use rates, demand response, and vehicle to grid that can help manage the grid more efficiently, which goes to grid investment efficiency. Next slide, please. So similar to the RPSA, we broke down the benefit cost analysis into its various components. The first column is the value of avoided carbon from not burning gasoline, getting kilowatt hours into EVs rather than burning that gasoline. The second column is the slight additional emissions that you do have from charging EVs until the grid gets to 100% renewables. So we wanted to be fair and net that out. The middle column then is the value from decoupling. We put a lot of work into that through our financial model to figure out how much fixed costs would be covered by all those extra kilowatt hours that go into EVs. And that's a per kilowatt hour valuation of that using low, mid, and high values depending on what year you're looking at over time. And the total benefit then is the emissions reduced from using EVs minus the slight increase from charging EVs plus the value of, uh, of savings from decoupling, from pushing those rates down. And we find here, I, I think it's kind of a remarkable finding that we're looking at paying out less than 10%, really about 9% of the value of that benefit as a PIM value at the one cent per kilowatt hour rate, and call it, you know, looking at the range, roughly 25% of the value being paid out, even at the three cent per kilowatt hour range. And I would point out that the vast majority of stations are currently unmetered, and so that three cent would be paid on a very small minority of charging stations. So I, I would just call this honestly great value for the money. Next slide, please. So this might be one of my favorite slides in, in our presentation, just because of how dramatic it is. So the yellow line is the value of avoided carbon from not burning all that gasoline and instead doing kilowatt hours in an EV. The blue line is that slight additional amount of emissions you get from charging EVs, and that's based on the resource plan and what, what percentage of renewable you are over those years, plus the increase in EVs. And so you can see at the very end, that kind of goes off to zero as we get to 100% renewable energy. But the difference between that yellow line and the blue line is, especially in the later years, tens of millions of dollars of difference in avoided carbon. Pretty strong result. Next slide, please. So this is some of the financial modeling work that I referred to to try to figure out how much fixed cost coverage you get from all those EVs that are charging. And you notice that it starts off fairly modest because we're only at 1% of EVs right now. And so it's kind of like two and a half million, as you can see in that middle column. But by 2045, because you have significant EV adoption, you've got well over $100 million of fixed cost contribution com coming from those EVs that are being charged. And that's something that wasn't, I don't think, contemplated when decoupling was put into place, that EVs would help share that load. And I mean load in terms of fixed costs, not electrical load. And that's a real benefit, again, to all rate payers, not just EV drivers. And the last two columns break that amount down into a per kilowatt hour value of fixed cost coverage, uh, both nominally and then the, the far right column is in 2020 dollars. So you can think about what that means on a per kilowatt hour basis today. And again, Either the carbon valuation or the bill reduction through decoupling, either one alone supports the PIM values that we're talking about. Next slide, please. So I'll, again, using the risk financial model as well as the, the scenario 2.1 from Dr. Fripp's switch model, these are the amounts that we're forecasting could be available through the PIM as we propose it. And again, you do see that it's relatively small dollars, a small incentive in early years, but there is the potential as this graph shows to have that exponentially increase if the utility is able to significantly accelerate the adoption of EVs. So it starts small, but can become significant later. Next slide, please. And then lastly, our shared savings mechanisms. These are fairly similar to many of the shared savings mechanisms proposed by other parties. I think we're fairly comfortable and familiar with how shared savings mechanisms work. 
They are outcome based, upside only, and then we're proposing 30% of assumed savings, which might be different than some other parties. We believe that the shared savings mechanisms that we're proposing achieve four of the PBR identified outcomes, including grid investment efficiency, cost control, affordability, and interconnection experience. Next slide, please. So with an incentive and a shared savings mechanism to expressly address grid services and non-wireless alternatives, we think that will definitely benefit grid investment efficiency. And simply by bringing in lots of low cost resources that will benefit cost control and affordability by keeping customers bills down. And then on interconnection experience, we do feel very strongly that the RPSA is perhaps the best and cleanest way to incentivize fast interconnection times without debating day counts or what's in the utilities control or not. But at the same time, we realized based on uh, when we examine the commission IR number nine, asking about a shared savings mechanism for IPP uh, interconnection times that the cost of interconnection can oftentimes be a surprise. There's an estimated amount that we understand goes into the negotiated PPA price. We understand from developers, oftentimes there can be a very unpleasant surprise later at what the actual interconnection cost sometimes ends up being. So we think it's perfectly fair to have a shared savings mechanism as we proposed in our response to that IR that makes sure that ratepayers never pay more than the agreed upon the contracted PPA price. And yet, if the utility and the developer working together are able to reduce the interconnection cost below the cost that was used in the, esti the estimated cost that was used in that PPA negotiation, that those savings could be shared between the ratepayer, the utility, and the developer. So it could be purely a win win situation for everybody. So we, we suggest that as, as an additional benefit for interconnection experience to address the cost of interconnection whereas the RPSA more addresses the time or the speediness of that interconnection. Next slide, please. So it's been suggested by some parties uh, throughout this docket that perhaps the RPSA and shared savings mechanisms are duplicative. And we strongly believe that a very simple analysis of what each of these PIMs, if I can call them both PIMs, reward shows that's clearly not the case. The RPSA incentivizes the speed at which we reach our RPS mandates, how fast we get to our renewable energy future, whereas shared savings mechanisms are clearly focused on price and price alone. We want to certainly we want to procure the most reasonable and cost effective prices, but there is a clear difference between speed and price. For example, a utility, if it really worked hard to bring on a lot of renewables, including both DERs and utility scale could potentially beat the RPS and they could beat it potentially year after year. And yet when they bring in competitive procurements, they may not be able to, to beat, they might only meet but not exceed commission expectations on pricing. So such a utility would deserve a reward under the RPSA, but if they can't beat those prices, they would get literally zero, not one penny under a shared savings mechanism. Similarly, if a utility was just able to keep up with the RPS, or maybe even they fall behind the RPS, but they're still procuring renewables, but they do so at attractive prices, they would get zero on the RPSA, and they would get something for those lower prices on the shared savings mechanisms. So we view it as really impossible to describe those as being the same thing, when you might earn a reward for one, but not the other, and, and the other way around. And similarly, I think if we, if we find ourselves to be lucky enough to have the, a utility that's both able to accelerate the RPS and at the same time do so at attractive prices, I think we sh should consider ourselves very fortunate to be paying out both PIM values because speed and price together are worth more than either one of them is by itself. Next slide, please. So this is how the shared savings mechanism breaks down from our financial model and resource plan. And the volatility in the amounts is really driven by when the optimizer is adding new, new generation assets to the grid. So it does vary over time and largely driven by competitive procurements or renewable energy, as well as the timing of grid services and non-wires alternatives. Next slide, please. So many of you have seen this slide before. This again comes from the risk financial model together with scenario 2.1, which was updated in our RSOP, a slight update to uh, what was seen in our SOP. And this shows the value of those three PIMs, RPSA, EOT incentive, and shared savings mechanism stacked up over time. 
And you can see that it approaches about 1.4% of ROE after tax. Now it's important to note this is a forecast and this indicates what's possible, but this is only possible if the utility aggressively attacks these, these PIM opportunities. This will not come from business as usual. This will truly require exemplary effort to achieve these values, but thought it would be fair to show certainly the group the sum of those values taken together. Next slide, please. So as uh, some other folks have mentioned, including uh, city and county of Honolulu, who we worked with to some extent on the greenhouse gas uh, emissions reduction PIM that we've proposed, we do remain supportive of a GHG PIM as a supplement to the RPSA, which is why we reduce the carbon value for the RPSA to allow some room for a greenhouse gas PIM if we wanted to have both. So they are not duplicative in that they don't each one separately only accounts for a part of that social cost of carbon value. But if we had to choose between the two, certainly we would choose the RPSA. And I feel like some of the other parties, including City County of Honolulu, and I think uh, Henry Curtis, Life of the Land, just sort of said the same thing. So that's kind of where we are. And I, I, we see a lot of overlap with the other parties on that topic. Uh, next slide, please. That being said, if you did want to look at our original proposal for a greenhouse gas reduction PIM, and you add that in with the RPSA, the EOT incentive, and the shared savings mechanism, this is how it stacks up. And again, this is for exemplary performance. This will not be achieved through business as usual. And as with our other charts, the left y-axis is millions of dollars pre-tax, and the right y-axis is after-tax ROE impact as driven through the risk financial model. And you can see it gets up to about 1.7% by 2028. And again, that will require substantial efforts to get there, but it's also enough, we believe, to motivate the utility to really pursue these, these outcomes. Next slide, please. So we believe that all of the PIMs that we propose are objective because they use quantitative and not qualitative assessments. They're measurable and they leverage existing reporting and data such as the RPS. They're immune from gaming because they leverage verifiable data and they're not based on forecasted results, they're based on actual results. Next slide, please. So I wanted to run through our PIMs at a high level one last time before finishing up. Our PIMs or our portfolio of PIMs, we believe address seven of the 12 identified regulatory outcomes as I described in the previous slides. They're fully aligned with statutory precedent and as some folks mentioned, the, the Supreme, Hawaii Supreme Court decisions, they're also aligned with judicial decisions as well as local level policy commitments, thinking mostly about the RPS mandate, the county's clean transportation commitments, and especially even HRS 269-94, which expressly authorizes the PUC to offer incentives to the utility for accelerating the RPS. Murray, you have five minutes. Sorry, I couldn't hear that. You have five minutes remaining on your Thank you. Um, these amounts that we've talked about are roughly 2% of ROE, which many of the parties seem to be targeting, and we do believe that's sufficient to incentivize utility performance. These PIMs are very administratively simple. They've been mostly unchanged since as far back as January of this year. All parties have had plenty of opportunity to look at them. The numbers, the benchmarks, the calculations involve simple arithmetic, and it's fully specified. They're easily interpreted and verifiable because it's based on objectively measured results. And importantly, we feel that our PIMs are fully formed. We thought that with this PBR docket taking about two years, that our goal was to have a portfolio of PIMs that are ready to go January 1st, 2021, or for a commission decision and order in December of this year. Our PIMs are fully specified, fully articulated and quantified and could be employed right away and not wait for a lot of additional work as some of the less formed PIMs that have been proposed may require. We also believe that these PIMs are transformational and will achieve the grid of the future that we want. This is not just an incremental increase in shared savings mechanisms, which we think would be falling far short of PBR's potential. And finally, these PIMs are immune from gaming because it rewards actual results, not forecasted results, and not tallies of activity. And that may be my next slide, but next slide, please. Yes, and thank you all for your attention. I believe I just made my time limit. Thank you, Mr. Clay. Uh, so that concludes the presentations we received from the parties this morning. We are gonna go uh, into recess and take a lunch break. 
Uh, thank you all for again for being efficient. We're gonna go. We're gonna take a little extra time. We're gonna go until one o'clock with our lunch break, and then start with uh, questions from commission staff. That way, we have no. Um, we're not gonna break up the question and answer period. Uh, so we'll we'll proceed at one o'clock with questions from commission staff. Please be on time because. Uh, as I think as we noted in the intro, questions can go to any party at any time. I do have a note here that some of the witnesses may not be available till two o'clock. We will do our best if a question is directed to them to hold it until a time that they're available. So I do have that note here. Um, but with that, we will, again, one o'clock, we'll proceed with questions from commission staff and then move directly into questions from the commissioners. Thank you all for your time this morning. Uh, we'll go into recess and see you again at one o'clock.
Hi, everyone. We're going to try and start at one o'clock sharp. So please, if people can start filing in virtually. Um, we're going to start off with identifying the witnesses and swearing in. So it's important that we can try and get the whole group in uh, in the room on time. Thanks. Okay, we're going to get started shortly. For those of you that are witnesses on the panel this afternoon, if you could please turn your camera on so we know you're ready to go.
Okay, we're just verifying the live streams running and then we'll get started here. Okay, we're gonna call the hearing back to order. This afternoon, we're doing our performance mechanisms panel. We'll begin, uh, actually, we're gonna depart from normal procedure a little bit. We'll begin by asking the witness to identify themselves. So I'll call out the organization and then I'll call out your name. Uh, so please identify that you're present. Then when we get through the whole list of panelists, we'll do the group swearing in. Hopefully that's clear enough to everyone. So we'll start with Hawaiian Electric. Hawaiian Electric's lead witness is Rod Aoki. Uh, please identify yourself. Present, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, additional witnesses for Hawaiian Electric. Jimmy Alberts. Yes, present. Colton Ching. Please just unmute and say you're present. Colton is here, I'm present. Thank you. Michael Colon. Mr. Chairman, I'm. Uh, apologies, but Mr. Cologne could not be present today, but Aki Marceau of the Hawaiian Electric Companies will serve in instead as well. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Aoki, duly noted. Uh, Natalie Epinsea. Present. Chong Ha. Present. Thank you, Darren Ishimura. Present. Robert Eisler. Present. Yo Kawanami. Is Yo here? Okay. Um, we may need to swear him in later. Shelly Kimura. Present. Aki Marceau. Present. Thank you. Rebecca Dehoff Matsushima. Present. Dean Matsuura. Present. Sean McCormick. Present. Thank you. Rick Pinker Pinkerton. Present. Uh, Tane Sikimura. Present. Thank you. Kaulani Shinsato. Present. Joseph Viola. Present. George Willoughby. Present. Thank you. Peter Young. Present. And Mr. Chairman, I just noticed that I believe Mr. Kawanami has joined the WebEx. And apologies for the delay. It's OK. Uh, Mr. Kawanami, you state if you're present. Present. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Okay, that takes care of Hawaiian Electric's witnesses. Uh, moving to the consumer advocate, we have lead witnesses, Cheryl Roberto. Present. Thank you. Ben Havumaki. Present. Thank you, Dean Nishima. Present. Great, thank you. Yes, present. Okay. Uh, Blue Planet, lead, lead witness is Isaac Morawake. Yes, President. And I'll just save some time and, and mention that Ron Bins is in transit right now. He does intend to join, but uh, I don't think he can do it while he's still driving home. And Melissa Miyashiro has a conflict she can't make it today. Okay, so Mr. Bins does plan to join later though? That was the plan, uh, but it's gonna take him a couple hours to drive, he's he's in transit right now. Okay, uh, I guess just please inform me when he, when he shows up so we make sure we swear him in, if we have to swear him in later. Sure, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, city and County of Honolulu, Robert Mould. Present. Thank you. County of Hawaii, Nate Johnson. 
Thank you. To ER parties, uh, lead witness Robert Harris. Present. Thank you. Uh, Will Giese. Present. Thank you, Will. Life of the land, Henry Curtis. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Curtis. And Ulupono, uh, lead witness Murray Clay. Present. Present. Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, was that? Sorry, was that Murray? Mr. Clay? I'm present, but that voice you heard just now wasn't me. That was Yo. That's right. Okay, that's what I thought. Uh, your other witnesses are Aaron Sowerby. Present. Okay, Matthias Fritt. Um, Chair Griffin, this is Doug Kodaga outside Council for Lupono. Dr. Fripp is teaching right now, so similar to uh, Mr. Benz, if it's if, if we may request the commission to allow him to hear and be sworn in uh, later this afternoon, he should be able to rejoin around two thirty. Okay, thank you. And uh, last is Mr. Uh, Mr. Kodaga. Present. Okay. All right, everyone. Uh, we're going to do group swearing in here. Do you all solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Hey. Yes. 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 Okay. Thanks, everyone. Uh, duly noted that when Mr. Bins, Mr. Fripp show up, we'll make sure that um, they're sworn in. And with that, we will turn over to uh, examination by commission staff. Uh, commission Council Mark Kayatsu will be the examiner. Mr. Kayatsu, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, before we begin, on behalf of commission staff, I just wanted to acknowledge all of the party's um, efforts and responding to all of the commission's IRs over the past couple of weeks. Uh, we greatly appreciate everyone's efforts it's really helped us to, um, on staff's behalf to understand um, everyone's positions and analysis on these topics. Um, the majority of these questions today are, are clarifying to help us fill in some of the blanks and make sure we understand everyone's responses. So we just wanted to clarify that um, our questions today aren't necessarily reflecting particular interest or disinterest. Um, it's just helping us understand what, what you've done and you've all done great work so far. So thank you all very much for putting in the time and effort under a very short time frame. So um, I'm going to start our questions under the first topic of what PIM should be implemented to specifically address the ER asset effectiveness. So this first question is to the Hawaiian Electric Company. So I'll um, ask this question to you, Mr. Aoki, and you can, um, I guess, direct it as, as in your discretion. In response to uh, PUC HECO IR44, subparts A and C, the company state that they do not presently utilize DER resources in programs that deliver grid services. Um, specifically, I think the language was there are currently no DERs that have been enrolled, enrolled into programs that deliver grid services. Staff would like to better understand this response. Um, is this uh, strictly true? What about existing residential and commercial DR programs, such as the um, direct load control programs? And aren't DERs in these programs actually utilized by the companies in providing grid services, including system operation benefits? Thank you, Mr. Kayetsu. Uh, may I ask the Commission's leave to redirect this question to our witness, Mr. Yo Kawanami? Yes, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kawanami, did you uh, get a chance to hear that question or would you like me to repeat parts of it? I'm wondering if he's having technical difficulties. I just saw him on the on the WebEx screen. This is this is Shelley. He's trying to log back in right now. I just got a text. Okay. Oh, um thanks. making the interest of, of moving this along. Um out of curiosity, Mr. Mr. Aoki, are, is Mr. Kawanami going to be the witness you would you would defer to on um, questions regarding um, 
I guess uh, these these DER programs and um, the metrics that you're using to track them currently? Primarily with regard to the DER asset effectiveness proposals of the company, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Katsu, as well as you know anything related such as DER type programs as okay. differentiated from DER programs. Okay, in that case, I'm going to move to the next topic while um, Mr. Kawanami works on that, just in the interest of time. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'll move to the next topic, which is what PIM should be implemented to specifically address customer engagement. So again, um, I'll direct this question to you, uh, Mr. Aoki. Um, turning back to the presentation that you gave this morning, um, I noticed that on behalf of the companies you propose customer engagement PIMs, uh, that adopted Ulupono's uh, EOT PIM as well as the RPSA PIMs. I'm curious, are, are these what the companies consider priorities when they think of customer engagement? So I could ask at least for the question with regard to electrification of transportation and Ulupono's PIM, Mr. Kaitsu, could I request mm -hmm. the commission's leave to def, uh, redirect that question to Ms. Aki Marceau? Yes, and for the sake of our efficiency here, uh, Ms. Jaka, you, you have permission to redirect to the member of your team as the various topics. Uh, so please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, uh, this is Aki Marceau from Hawaiian Electric Company. Um, with regards to the customer engagement PIM, we support um, Lupono Initiatives EOT PIM. Mm -hmm. um, I guess maybe the question I'm trying to get at is it's not so much do you support it, it's it's um is this consistent with what the Hawaiian Electric companies how they could how they uh characterize or define customer engagement internally? I'm I'm trying to understand how do the companies perceive the concept of customer engagement and how is this reflected in in an EOT PIM and RPSA PIM? So, Mr. Kaitsu, just so I make sure that we can respond fully to your question, mm -hmm. um, I think first I will I'll take a broad brush attempt at answering the question and defer specifically on electrification of transportation to Ms. Marceau, mm -hmm. and then more broadly on the RPSA type policy question about in, in interest in uh, accelerating procurement of renewables to Mr. Jim Alberts, if that's okay. And that's uh, fine. So, as a, a broad brush response, as we've you know kind of touched on. I think for electrification of transportation, when we looked at Ulupono's uh, proposals and presentations over the course of this proceeding, it really, you know, did touch for us that this was going to be a significant method to uh, engage with customers uh, just across, you know, various types of outcomes as we move forward. Um, and then certainly for RPS as, a, as well as Mr. Clay has uh, you know, discussed in his presentation, because of the various outcomes it promotes, you know, across things like um, renewable acquisition, you know, cost control, things like interconnection experience, that presents another you know method for us to engage with customers moving forward as we really need to look at you know, new models and how we interact with them and how we interact with our customers becoming the, the prosumers that we've been talking about uh, for through a number of proceedings. But we've done very high level. Um, type of, of description. Maybe I can defer to first to Ms. Marceau to talk about how EOT helps with customer engagement and then to Mr. Alberts. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Aoki. Um, EOT will, with, it's, with regards to customer engagement, it's going to require and, and currently does require um, broad outreach and education and actually the, um, the change of behavior um, to choose uh, alternative forms of transportation for our customers. And so we believe that it's an adequate um, PIM to um, support customer engagement initiatives. Okay, um, taking a step back even from, from that, I can see how, how those are aimed at achieving what you've defined or you've described as certain outcomes that will engage customers. I guess what I'm trying to get a better sense of even more conceptually is what does customer engagement mean to the companies? You know, what, what standards do you use when you're talking about customer engagement, when you set standards or policies or objectives to, to engage with customers, you know, within Hawaiian Electric? Um, for that kind of higher level question, Mr. Katsu, um, I'd like to defer it, at least I, you know, in, a, in a first attempt, 
to Miss Shelly Kimura, who is, um, Hi. I'm sorry, go ahead, Sean. <laughs> Hi, thank you. So I'm SVP of customer service. I think that's what you're going to say, Rod. <laughs> <I'm> gonna <interrupt laughs> you. Um, yeah, so thanks for the question. Um, internally, what we look at for customer engagement, and we have a number of, of metrics we look at. We look at um, a number of customer satisfaction surveys. We look at the number of programs customers are enrolled in. Um, we also look at recently we've been increasing our discussions around LMI. It's been a discussion over the last couple of years, but as you guys all know, the current environment has increased our focus on that. Um, and in response to one of the IRs last week related to um, partnerships with Hawaii Energy, we proposed, um, we appreciated the, the concept of a PIM related to partnering with Hawaii Energy, and we proposed that it be focused on LMI program enrollment. Um, EOT is definitely a significant part of our customer engagement strategy. It's another option and an important um, strategy for decarbonization and engaging with customers. So that's one of the reasons why it was highlighted. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, somebody... DER programs, but that's also in separate PIMs. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So for some of those specific metrics you just listed, customer satisfaction, um, number of programs customers are enrolled in, um, you know, opportunities to reach out to LMI customers. Does, uh, how does the company measure and track progress against these metrics? Uh, we look at those quarterly and we report it um, internally to track and monitor and see how we're doing against goals. And how do you determine, how are those goals set? Uh, we set the goals at the start of every year, um, and in some cases at the start of a five-year strategy, and um, we monitor our progress against that. Um, and it's based on historic, and then creating a stretch goal to to improve it. What kind of considerations do you put into determining how much of a stretch the goal should be? Um, I don't know that there's a specific formula. I'm just trying to remember how we came up with our, our recent goals. Um, I don't think there's a specific formula. We look at various inputs, including, you know, historic, of course, but also looking at current market conditions and things that may impact um, how how we perform in the, the year or years ahead. Mm -hmm. Um, you mentioned that sometimes these are uh, based on one year or five year plans. Do you have any longer range plans for um, engaging with customers or is it is it kind of reevaluated every year, or every five years? So we set a five year strategy um, and then we have annual goals based on that five year strategy. But every year um, we reassess those goals to either reconfirm or to um, adjust and modify. We always say that strategy is a living document and we have to continuously uh, evolve as the market and customers and technologies evolve. As we look out farther than five years, um, we're talking about our long range plans like IGP and PSIP and all the things you are all familiar with. Um, and when we set actual action plans, we have those long-term goals in mind, but we know that there will be a lot of um, changes in the variables and assumptions for those longer term plans. So the actual actions are based on, on five year um, outcomes, stretch outcomes, and then breaking that down into smaller chunks of one year goals. And once it gets down to um, process area and department levels, we're often breaking those down into quarterly milestones as well. So we can track if we're gonna um, get our goals. Mm -hmm. Um, at the moment, what are the most important customer strategies for improving customer engagement? Um, we, <laughs> that's, a, that's a big question. So we have um, several things going on. We have our customer experience strategy that we're focused on, um, looking at everything from the customer perspective and um, our, our um, our conceptual goal is that we become our customer's trusted energy partner. Um, and we're looking at the customer experience from that perspective. Um, so that has a lot of, of different aspects to it. 
We are also very focused on the DER customer experience. Um, and I think many people on this call are familiar <laughs> with what we're doing in those areas. And it's the subject of several dockets. So I won't go into detail on that. Um, as I mentioned, EOT is another big area uh, that is of great strategic importance to us. Not just for customer engagement, but for all the other um, renewable and grid benefits. Um, and I should mention that in combination EOT and DER, when I say DER, I'm also talking about grid services. Um, so mm -hmm. for us, that's all in one group. Okay, um, thank you. Oh, oh sorry, I'm sorry. Please, please continue if there was more. We're also looking at the experience for our, our new customers. So we had a group called um, CID that is part of our recent reorg. They've now come into customer service. And we're looking to streamline that process to further automate it and to um, reduce timelines for customers and uh, make that process much simpler for them and improve the experience there. Thank you. Mr. Kayatsu, um, it yes. is my understanding that Mr. Koanami has now joined by phone. I'm not sure if he wasn't able to get the WebEx working, but. Um, if maybe we could test if he's available to answer your question um, via audio. Okay, um, Mr. Kawanami, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Sorry, apologies for the mishap. No, no, that that's no problem. Um, if you don't mind, I, I had another question for um, Ms. Kimura. I guess I'd like to follow up with, but then I can I can come back. Thank you. Thank you. Um, oh. oh, well, I'll, I'll direct this commission uh, question to you, Ms. Kimura. But if if um, you know, there's someone else on the panel you think is more appropriate, please um, just let me know. Uh, what are the functions and services the companies expect their utilities customer e-service portal will provide to customers? Um, I will defer that question to, um, I think Yo is our, Yo, are you the designated person on that one? Or maybe Nat? <laughs> I believe Nat can start and I can cover the grid service question afterwards. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Natalie Epinesa, Director of Customer Relations. Can you repeat the question again? Sorry. Sure. No, no. What are the functions and services the companies expect their utilities customer e services portal will provide to customers? Oh, um, okay, great. Yes, lots. <laughs> <laughs> um, to replace our existing um, because that goes away in a couple years. Um, but we really want to focus our efforts on self-service. So hopefully in the future, as um, we implement the portal, um, anything from starting service to stopping your service, kind of the basic functionality that we do and we provide to our customers, um, payment arrangements, um, applications, um, this would kind of be the one stop shop for the customers. So any link, um, or any, um, information on CBRE as we uh, move forward with that as well. So that portal, um, kind of the one stop shop for our customers so they can ensure, so we can ensure they have a seamless experience, um, regardless of what they're looking for. So again, I, I think our focus and our strategy has always been improving and automating that self-service for our customers um, mm -hmm. in terms of having that one place. Um, did Hawaiian Electric look to uh, portals used by other utilities and other jurisdictions in forming this? Yes, I believe so. We've had a couple of, in the, um, in the review, I know we've had a couple of demos that were provided to us um, that were utilized by various um, utilities. I can't remember what, who, who they were at this moment, but yes, we did go through that process. Okay. Um, how do you, or how do the companies believe the portal will attract and engage customers? Well, it provides us an opportunity, right? When, once we have them online and utilizing um, this online self-service um, portal, it allows us to one, educate, to be able to push notifications out to them. Um, we can identify by utilizing our data that we have in that portal to identify different segments that perhaps we would want to target in terms of um, different types of DER, you know, programs that might be out there in the future. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, what is the timeline for um, fully for fully launching this portal with all the services and functions you provided? All of the services. Well, next year we are looking to implement the foundation of it. Um, I think we are currently going through the process of identifying which um, features would probably be the first um, in terms of self-service moving forward. So I'm we're looking at a couple of years, probably three, three years. Okay. Um, and have is this broken down into like a timeline with the remaining steps that you need to accomplish? We are currently working on that. Yes. You you know when that will be that roadmap or that timeline will be finished? Mm, I didn't <laughs> we're in the middle of working that working on that probably first quarter next year. Okay. Yeah, there's there's a lot of features that we're looking to do um, in addition to the basic services that we provide. Okay. Thank you very much. Um Mr. Colin, uh, Mr. Colin Ami? Yes, sir. Okay, I will uh, move back up. So um, this is in regards to um, the company's response to PUC HECO IR44 parts A and C. Um, okay. in, in those responses, the companies um, stated that they do not presently utilize DER resources in programs that deliver grid services. I believe the, the language used was um, from subpart C there are currently no DERs that have been enrolled into programs that deliver grid services. Um, we just want to better understand this response. Is this strictly true? Um, you know, as we understand, there are existing residential and commercial DR programs, and uh, aren't these DRs in these programs actually utilized by the companies in providing grid services? Yes, sir. So in part A, we we had to make an, an assumption with what the question was seeking. So we define D for this particular IR, we define DER as the DER programs that were in place, namely um, CGS, CGS plus PV and storage type of programs. Uh, so when we defined it as such, we said, oh, currently today, September, there are no uh, PV, so PV storage type of loads being delivering grid service at this time. But to your point, demand response, which we have been defining that resources from demand response is indeed DER. So we, we were a little not unsure of how to respond to this, but yes, we do have grid services that are currently being provided by demand response programs from residential and commercial. Yes. Mm -hmm. um do the companies have metrics that they use to measure the amount that uh, these programs are, um, how these programs are used in system dispatch and unit commitment? So the current programs that we have in existence, residential and commercials are mostly one-way technology. So we have an enrolled, um, uh, enrolled amount based on an assumption, based on uh, evaluation measurement verification process that was done years ago to assume that such program will probably deliver so many megawatts. Residential is ranging anywhere from 8 to 12 uh, megawatts at any given time. There's an assumption, but there's no true verification until we get to get those programs into a two-way technology. Uh, so that will be the metrics that we, we do. And then the other metrics is we do uh, submit in the March filing of every year, we uh, submit to the commission a report called Accomplishments and Surcharge Report uh, at the end of March, where we list the, all the events that were called by the system operators for both residential and commercial. So if, if I can, so I'm trying to process all of that. So if, if as I understand it then, so you're saying for these, the, the programs you have, um, for these DR programs you have currently, you have estimates, but you don't specifically track their use, but you have um, these reports you, you, you publish that or provide that that indicate what, what what programs they were used for, which programs were used, or, sorry, could you elaborate? Yeah, so apologies, I, I kind of went all over. So let me start with the uh, number of events being called upon first. So system mm -hmm. operators would, at any given time, uh, press the button, so to say, and issue an event for residential and or commercial. And we would have a log to capture that, that such event was called at this time and for one hour or so. 
and we would record that and we would provide that to the public filing that says residential program throughout the year was called so many times at this date and from this time to this time we provide that information how much megawatts was provided at each of those events we we do not currently provide as those is merely an estimate at this given time so we do not have an accurate uh, number there does that make yeah sense? no that that's that, that that gets to it thank you um do you have uh uh does, do the companies have plans to start tracking how how many megawatts are, are being provided under these programs yeah so the currently we have migrated over to through commission guidance and through the market that has evolved the new approach that we have been going on is not the existing demand response program, but more the grid service uh, procurement process that we've been going forward. And the commission has allowed us to proceed with currently one aggregator, uh, OATI, that is currently enrolling customers to get ready to deliver these grid services. And this uh, mechanism is a two-way technology and it is performance-based so as we start dispatching the aggregator programs going forward, that is this aggregator program is technology agnostic. We did not specify in our RFP that it has to be this resource. Aggregator can choose to bring a water heater and an electric vehicle battery. It's up to them, but they mm -hmm. are performance based. So once we call upon the event at every month end, well, actually a few weeks after the month end, we would go back to all the events that were called upon and we work together with the aggregator to assess what the performance was that impacts their payment and we are we will be able to report back to the to the commission we enrolled this many megawatts through this aggregator and they performed at this megawatts at these events on average okay um leaving aside the programs that are not yet deployed um under the, like, the oati contract and the aggregator program how do the company system operators actually use the DERs that are providing grid services currently? So there is, uh, we have a software platform called Demand Response Management System, the DRMS, and that, that went uh, live last year. And all the demand response programs that are currently providing grid services is connected to that Demand Response Management System, DRMS system operation would log in to the DRMS and they would call upon by typing in uh, or clicking the programs that they would want. And they, that's how they would dispatch the systems. Okay. But the aggregator, again, uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry, but, but again, that, that uh, program will, will dispatch them, but it's not necessarily uh, tracking um, how it's being used or, or where it's being used per se it's been used well it's all of our programs are load reduction programs mm -hmm. so and when the system operators calls it uh at peak time at uh, 6 p.m we we do give and um, we do provide to the system operators residential will probably give 8 to 12 commercial will probably give about 10 megawatts so they do know of, they have a rule of thumb of how much megawatts will be delivered um, upon that so they would utilize that rule of thumb to dispatch that programs for their use and we do mm -hmm. have one more good service that is being provided by the legacy what we call legacy demand response program and that's the fast uh, under frequency response where it's not a dispatch but us by the system operators but rather when the frequency drops to a certain point all of our resources will automatically detect that frequency deviation and will reduce their load at that time and we will we we Hawaiian lecture gets notified of that frequency deviation and we will log that that our our program provided some contingency back up to that event mm -hmm. okay let me pose a hypothetical to you then mm -hmm. um, say for example if there are roughly 30,000 DERs in the direct load control program how does, how does that affect the system operator's decision making? Do the system operators schedule or uh, reduce the amount of reserves online since they are utilizing the DERs? And if so, how is that tracked? They, they do. Um, that part, I may need some assistance from uh, maybe Colton or others that are online. It, it's, a, it's a decision making for system operators when they call 
Volta. It's about the megawatts. So system operator, it has two choices. Well, there's more than two choices, but I'm just gonna make it two choices in this hypothetical. They have a choice to either saying, okay, if we press the DRMS button, the load can be reduced by eight megawatts, or they can go to a fast generator that can be brought up and turn that generator on and covered at eight megawatts. That's the two way street the system operators have. And, and they have to, it's a, it's a, each system operators have a different, not a risk tolerance, but their experience on how they would use the, our demand response programs. And they would log that in their mechanism that rather than um, they chose to use demand response at that time to cover that. And we would have a feedback with the system operators to, to see if the programs did in fact cover them so that they didn't need to call the uh, fast generators after, and that we would call that a success. Uh, it's not necessarily a metric, but we would call that a success that we were able to avoid bringing that generator on that instant. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Just, Mark, if, if, I, if I may reach out to Colton, I don't wanna butcher this too much. Did I capture that operations on how system operations would proceed with that? Is that accurate? Yeah, hi, this is Colton. Can folks hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay, um, so Mr. Kaitsu, maybe to just expand a little bit on what Mr. Kawanami uh, explained. Um, our system operators will use, uh, I think you're referring to our residential direct load control program, our residential um, DR program. Um, and our system operators will use uh, that as a resource in, in several ways. Uh, to help manage the system and help uh, reduce costs that we would otherwise incur. Um, probably the most uh, common and regular uh, is to schedule uh, the enablement of the programs, reducing load um, for times of the day where we're expecting, expecting a peak on the system. So here in Oahu, we typically peak at about 7 p.m. And based upon the loads over the course of the day and the forecast for the evening peak, a system operator may schedule may choose to schedule blocks of, of our residential direct load control program to reduce our net loads that allow us to serve our peak loads, carry the necessary reserves that we need to carry through that peak, and avoid, say, for example, starting up uh, another generating unit, uh, perhaps allow us to shut down a generating unit sooner than we would otherwise, things like that as, as examples. System operators will also use the residential direct load control program at other times of the day. Say there's a delay in a startup of a generator that's needed to serve a growing load over the course of the morning, for example, or where a generating unit may be experiencing some problems. Uh, we'll, uh, and the operator will choose to enable uh, the, those blocks because they can get a pretty quick response uh, from them versus say starting up a generator. Mm -hmm. uh, and, then, and then we'll use uh, also the, uh, the, the residential direct load control program as Mr. Kaunani mentioned earlier in an autonomous way when we have a disturbance on the system, they have an under frequency uh, switch on it and they will automatically um, turn off loads when uh, when that frequency is detected. So that's not an operator controlled activity, but one where um, a pre-programmed uh, signal will, will enact it and it's actually being utilized at that point. Um, Mr. Chen, can I just follow up with you quickly? So for um, those types of events or circumstances you just described, are, are these like measured or tracked? Yeah, I'll, I'll ask uh, Mr. Kawanami to add to it, uh, but we do, um, the, the events when they're triggered are uh, collected within the, now today in the DRMS system. Uh, and I believe that in, in today and going forward, that data it forms a basis for uh, our ANS report that we file every March. Uh, so I believe the, the events, the number of calls, which blocks, uh, all of that is captured uh, by the DRMS system, which ultimately gets filed in their uh, ANS report. Yes, sir. That's how it is uh, reported back. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, moving, switching gears a little bit, um, Mr. Kawanami, I guess I'll just start with you, but let me know if there's someone um, you'd rather shift to. Moving away from residential, um, let's see. Do you track, uh, does, do the companies track utilization of uh, grid scale projects? Utilization of grid scale project for the purpose of grid service or simply IP for, grids, for, 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 for grid services, please, or for. For grid service, uh, I guess, uh, Becca, uh, they have months uh, can help me answer this right now. The grid scale program, a grid scale project that will be delivering the grid services will be under the renewable dispatchable generation projects. And uh, I, I guess, yeah, Becca can help me when that will be first coming online. I think that is the first one is not online yet, Mr. Kaitu on that. Becca, could you please verify that for me, for us? Oh, that's correct with regards to our renewable dispatchable generation projects, mm -hmm. but all of our IPPs you know, inherently provide um, some grid services to to the grid, and it depends on what type of facility um, it is and what you know what type of service that they're able to provide. For example, our firm generators can provide more robust grid services than an as available facility might. Um, though we're trying to change that through the use of the the RDG PPA, so we track the usage. Obviously, the the megawatt hours that we're taking from those facilities for the firm generators, we're tracking the capacity that they're providing at any given time to the grid. Um, and then as we move into, um, you know, we, we're, we're looking at when they're available, we, we also know, you know, how much of the, those services are available to provide things like reserves um, currently on the system. So that's being looked at as a, a whole when we're, when we're determining what resources need to be on the system and um, and what dispatch signals to send to those facilities. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm gonna move ahead now to another topic. This is gonna deal with um, interconnection experience. So, Mr. Uh, okay, I guess I'll direct this question to you and then you can um, defer it as, as you feel is appropriate. Um, I'd like to just get, get some more detail about um, how um, the, the companies are, are internally addressing, you know, interconnection experience and how it's been done historically. So I, the first question I have is just um, from the beginning, from the receipt of a customer's application to the energizing of a system um, for a system under 100 kilowatts, what is the fastest? Uh, what is the fastest the companies have accomplished this uh, in 2019? Mr. Kayets, if I could defer and redirect that question to Ms. Kayulani Shinsato. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Kayets. Can everybody hear me? Okay. I, I can. Yes. Great. Um, so I think that um, we have come a really long way in uh, improving the customer's experience uh, with interconnection. Um, a big part of our improvement was implementing the customer interconnection tool. Uh, and we did that in um, 2017. So we moved from a very heavily papered uh, manual process to a fully automated process with a lot of drop down uh, windows that contractors can use to um, choose when they fill out applications online. So that has uh, dramatically uh, streamlined the process for us. We know that, um, and we've talked about this a lot in the, the DER proceeding with many who are in this docket, um, we know we've come a long way in particular uh, with respect to the front end of the process uh, we still have room for improvement and we acknowledge that in the back end of the process. And so um, we have been taking a hard look at what improvements we can do there in particular as a part of the DER proceeding. Um, and as a part of uh, COVID-19, we've already implemented many uh, process improvements to help 
our customers and the contractors in particular through COVID. Uh, we said that we do some of those on a permanent basis, some on an interim basis for six months. Mm -hmm. um, but we are approaching the six month uh, point in time where we want to update the commission and say uh, which ones we feel comfortable with continuing uh, on a permanent basis. Um, so, so Ms. 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 Sato, sorry to interrupt you. I mean, um, and, and this is very helpful. Thank you. But I, I'm just curious, like what just, you know, in 2019, what was the fastest, you know, interconnection you did? And, and just to throw it out there, what was what was the longest you did? I'm just trying to get a range for for what the company is is experiencing currently. I don't have that those data points in particular uh, on right now, but I bet you I could get back to you in an hour's time <laughs> okay. um, to grab those. Um, Generally speaking, uh, as a part of actually last week's latest round of IRs, um, we took a look at what we did for all of the steps in the interconnection process that are under our control. Mm -hmm. And we found that the median time was 27 days and the average time was 30 days. Um, and so I appreciated actually reading the um, other parties' responses to that PCIR 9. Um, and it looked like in the DER party's response, they noted some references uh, and reports to California uh, and how they are having kind of the fastest interconnections. And California's Rule 21 requires a maximum of 30 days. So if you compare ourselves to California, we're actually doing um, pretty well. Um, I guess prior to um, this, this uh, you know, prompting by the information response and I guess the work that that's starting to be done in the DER docket has has do the companies have they uh, historically measured and, and tracked these interconnection times and and what standards how what standards have been set and how were they set? We we have tracked them so ever since 2015, um, in one of the commission's orders, um, we have been required to report on the um, on a weekly basis the interconnection queue status. And so we send that email out every Tuesday uh, to a pretty big distribution group. And as a part of that, we track durations for all of our programs um, up to the uh, IRS step in our process. We don't track durations publicly yet on the validation and the execution and meter uh, changes that are on the back end of our process. But as a part of our development of our PIM, we said that we would be um, willing to start doing that so that there's more transparency on what the whole process looks like on an end-to-end -end basis. Just adding, this is Shelly, can I add to one of your earlier questions on days? And Lonnie, just correct me if I'm wrong, but based on some statistics that were run the fastest, and I think this is 2019, but Lonnie might be able to correct me. I think the fastest we did in 2019, if we just look at the top 1%, was five to seven days. Thank you. Is that right, Lonnie? I think, are you referring to the, the table email? email? Yeah. I think that's right, Shelly. Okay. Yep. Okay. Oh, sorry, please, please go ahead. My apologies. I, I can confirm that, Mr. Kaiti. Okay. Um, I'd like to turn briefly to, I believe it's the company's um, response to what was PU Suhiko IR45, where um, you indicated the uh, the various review periods that um, you, you assert are within the company's control under Rule 14H. And you uh, provided the various times uh, um, time frames for each of those um, review processes as set forth in Rule 14H. Um, do you know uh, in 2019, you know, as it pertains to systems below 100 or uh, less than 100 kilowatts, what, um, notwithstanding the, the days provided in the rule, what the average and fastest times were for um, processing each of those steps? We do. So you're referring to PUC IR45. Uh, PUC HECO IR45, yes. Got it. Um, where we walk through each of the steps in 14H and mm -hmm. then the questions. 
makes sense. Mm -hmm. As well as the fastest, if, if you know. Um, we have, I, I know we have both. I don't have the fastest on me right now, but we'd be happy to pull that. Um, I think what you're asking for, Mr. Clarkson, you provided um, something close to that in response to BC equal IR20. Oh, actually, that was for. Okay. So we provided it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we have it for 2019. We just haven't provided it to you. Okay. Okay. Um, that, that, that's fine. Thank you. We can, we can follow up um, with post hearing if we need. Um, let's see. In your um, presentation, and I'm just going to direct this question to you, Mission Sato, but if you want it to defer it, please let me know. In your presentation this morning, when talking about um, interconnection experience, I believe the slide said you supported both the company's proposed interconnection experience PIM, as well as the PIM, um, as well as I believe it was the company's response to uh, the commission's PUC um, parties IR09, where we proposed an alternative PIM. I, I was uh, I'm wondering if you could clarify what the company's position was on that, though. As I recall, in the response, the company had proposed some um, some different assumptions of what were used in the in the commission's preface to that IR. So, could you please describe just describe what what you meant in that when you supported that, Pam? Sure. Um, I think in the beginning when we proposed this PIM, it was quite a while back. Um, and after hearing the feedback, in particular, the feedback that we recently received, like within the past week, it was really good to see all of the different ideas coming out. Um, I think now we are comfortable um, considering this um, new proposal that we put forth in our response to IR9. Um, we're, I think, a little bit hesitant at first, just because we only had one week to kind of come up with it. And so there's a feeling of it's not perhaps 100% baked and fully vetted by all of the parties, um, especially if you think about all of the months that we all went through in the different working group meetings discussing the original proposal. Um, but we are willing to put that on the table. And I think Mr. Aoki said this earlier too, we are willing to um, consider our PSA um, and, and forego something like a specific interconnection experience plan as well. So uh, I think we're flexible here. Mr. Kaito, I think you might be on mute. Sorry, my chair is squeaky, so I'm trying to mute it when I'm <laughs> asking questions. Um, thank you, Ms. Shinsato. I'd like to direct this next question to Mr. Harris. Um, as part of the um, HPVC, HSEA, and um, DERC re responses to IRs, uh, particularly the PUC parties IR9, I believe you suggested that um, sort of classifying all systems that were just below 100 kilowatts was was a bit too broad and that you should there should be uh, different size tiers along the way in, in developing this PIM. I was just wondering um, for each of those proposed uh, system size tiers you, you identified, do you have information on the average interconnection time for the steps that uh, the company ident the companies identified are within those control for those system tiers? Uh, thank you for the question. No, I'm afraid I think that question would have to go to Hawaiian Electric to answer. Um, okay. I, I, think, I think, sorry, I, I just slightly more broadly, I think the mm -hmm. intent of that answer was recognizing that different systems have different impacts on the grid. And so the idea is something mm -hmm. under 25 kW is going to have much less of an impact than something that's of the 100 kW size. And just recognizing mm -hmm. probably to treat them differently. Mm -hmm. I guess uh, related to that then, so um, following up from that then, for each of those system size tiers, uh, um, would, you say, would you say that the incentive uh, amount should be the same or should they be uh, calibrated differently? And if so, how? I think in this situation, we would you know encourage some averaging, but you might have different timelines that are average, averaged together or um, melded together for one consistent PIM. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. 
Um, I'm going to direct this one back to you, Ms. Shinsato. Sorry, that was a very brief break. But um, earlier, um, I believe earlier it was mentioned that um, the companies have been tracking interconnection time since the PUC ordered it in 2015. Do the companies specifically measure and track faster than average interconnection times? Faster than average for ourselves or compared to uh, another utility? Yes, yes, uh, for, for yourselves. For ourselves. Like kind of looking at incremental improvements, you know, if this is your average, you know, do you, do you track, you know, um, if you're making improvements or um, better than your previous averages? Uh, we, we don't track that way per se. I think what we have done is we look at what our tariff requires of us and then we try to find an internal goal instead and then shoot for that internal goal as a way of um, constantly trying ourselves to bring those review times down. And how are those internal goals uh, determined? Uh, with, our, with our team and we have to adjust them too. Um, if we are seeing that we're getting a lot more in validation, we might have to move more resources there in order to bring those times down. Um, so we adjust the targets as we need to as, as volumes are coming in. Um, do the companies have internal incentives for um, better than average performance or are there steps if there are below average performances to investigate to determine how this can be improved? I think absolutely we're in incentive. I think we're naturally incentive to do this. Um, we've already made improvements in the process that are pretty significant, even without a pin. Um, and I think that we would continue to make improvements uh, even without a pin. Um, one thing that we're starting to do is um, look at a pre-approval type of process, and this has come up by the DEO parties in the DEO proceeding. Um, and so we recently noted in that proceeding and have met at least uh, one time with the DER parties on how we could put something like that together. And so um, we're already doing these things, I guess, is, is what I wanted to say. Okay. Um, you say you're already doing these things. So if there were to be an explicit performance incentive mechanism uh, to incentivize the companies further, what, what kind of um, adjustments to these companies standards and policies and improvements do you think would result to, um, I guess, improve upon the actions you're already taking? I still think a PIM would help. So I said we're already doing these things, but um, a PIM would help, I think, because it would really cement the fact that we need to do more and that money would be tied to it. Um, we could get an award, we could get penalized. Uh, and I think it would help just from a tri-company perspective, right? Because our team works on, on customer energy resource applications, but um, many other teams also have to touch these applications and get customers interconnected. So I think from kind of a company-wide incentive, a team would still very much help us. Okay, thank you. Mr. Harris, I'd like to ask you another question very quickly. Um, currently, I, I, you know, we've all been focusing on, on Rule 14H as um, setting the pertinent deadlines for an incentive or a penalty. Are, do you think there are any other uh, applicable rules or standards that should be incorporated? Uh, what I heard from or I reviewed from the IR uh, ECO filed is I think a recognition that Rule 14H may no longer be as applicable, um, recognizing that many of these steps in there have been, uh, are, are maybe no longer necessary. And so um, I'd actually encourage maybe not to look at Rule 14H um, beyond a sort of an outer maximum. And, and I think it's, it certainly, it should be, Certain projects are going to be outliers and may require more time and examination. Rule 14H deadlines are still important, but from a consistent customer perspective, I would discourage looking at Rule 14H. And I'm not sure other rules are really going to be applicable in this case. Um, I think the approach that we encouraged was a customer-centric one, which is just trying to look at it from a perspective of customer of how do we allow fast, simple, easy interconnections um, 
that hopefully lower cost, but also make it a friendly process for the customer. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, in the event that they were the companies were to um, trigger a, a penalty, do you have a proposal for a penalty amount? We don't, not at this time. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to jump around a bit again, moving to um, this next topic on what PIM should be implemented to specifically or generally address cost control, fuel and purchase power costs, renewable generation, or other outcomes. So um, before I, uh, I launch into this, this line of questioning, I just want to um, maybe just provide some context. So um, uh, as you all know, you know, Uhu Pono, um, has proposed an RPSA, but it was proposed for the companies and they provided a lot of um, data to support it. So in one of our IRs, we we asked the companies to um, provide a, an expanded um, table and charts to show what this would look like on a consolidate, consolidated basis for all the companies. So this next line of questioning is just, is just asking clarifying questions about that. So I just want to provide some context up front before we, we get into that so you all know where we're going. So, um, Mr. Aoki, I'm going to um, direct this at this, but I'm not sure at this time if you want to, if you're, if you know who would be better, the best, and the bleh, who would be in the best position from your panel to um, discuss the responses to, um, I believe it is Hiko, uh, PUC Hiko IRs 46 and 47. Yeah, so initially, Mr. Kayatsu, just hearing parts of your question with regard to the RPSA proposal, mm -hmm. I thought that it might be Mr. Koten Cheng, um, but perhaps as the as the questions uh, develop, uh, there may be other witnesses that can uh, add in to clarify points. Okay. Um, all right. So I guess I'll just I can just ask the question, and then um, you can you know direct me to whoever is is the most appropriate. So. Um, I'm going to focus, uh, as I as I indicated, you know, um, PUC Hiko IR forty six um, in pertinent part asked the companies to prepare a similar uh, exhibit to mirror what was presented in Ulupono's initial statement of position, Exhibit B one, but to incorporate um, calculations for all three of the companies instead of just um, Hiko. So um, turning to attachment one, and is it possible to um, bring that up, Grace? Thank you. So um, to Hawaiian Electric, first, I, I just want to make sure I some clarifying questions. Um, can you please confirm that this table shows um, the annual information regarding forecasted compliance with the Ulupono RPS APIM for the consolidated companies? Mr. Kaitsu, this is Colton Ching. Yes, th this table is intended to represent uh, the consolidated Hawaiian Electric Utilities. All right, thank you. And then um, as I reading th reading this table, so um, on the starting on the uh, left hand side, it shows the annual values for the interpolated RPSA PIM percentage requirements in the first two columns. And then working across the columns to the right, it calculates the amounts of corresponding energy requirements and generation based on sales and generation forecasts. Is that generally correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay, and then in the rightmost two columns that you've identified as K and L, this indicates the calculated amounts of qualifying renewable generation uh, for the PIM in um, gigawatt hours and the amounts of the incentive payment to the companies that would result in millions of dollars as shown for each year. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. So column K represents mm -hmm. the or the amount of renewable energy uh, above or in excess of the calculated RPSA uh, value. And then mm -hmm. column L translates that uh, based upon the $10 per megawatt hour incentive into a dollar basis. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then can you further confirm that in those rightmost columns, uh, K and L, that the, um, the information presented there is um, 
the in the years uh let's see how can i phrase this um that in the years 20 uh before 2025 it is still based on the um i guess rps uh standards and then following 2025 it, it uses uluponol's corrected standards yeah mr kayatu subject to double confirmation i believe mm -hmm. that's correct okay all right now um and that was all the foundation leading up to the question so um now the questions that i want to ask um are just to clarify what renewable projects were are are factored into this the information on this table. So that, that brings me to uh, the company's response to PUC HECO IR forty seven. Um, I believe attachments. Um, well, I guess we can go with attachment two to that response. I believe shows all of the renewable projects um, summarized and subtotal by project status. Is that correct? And so, Mr. Kayatsu, as we move into this portion of the question, specifically uh, the company's response to PU HECO IR 47, in addition mm -hmm. to Mr. Ching, uh, I believe Ms. Rebecca Dehaf Matsushima may also be able to provide some input. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and we can zoom in as needed, but if, if, if you're familiar with the attachment, I just, I just want to clarify or confirm that um, these are all the um, new renewable um, projects, the um, company is, is planning, correct? These are the listing of the projects that are used uh, in the calculation of the RPSA uh, incentive in IR 40, UC HECO IR 46. Okay. Are there, let's see. Okay. And all of these projects are used in that um, RPSA table provided in 46, PUC IR 46 attachment one? Uh, yes, but if I can just add one to your one additional item to your to your question, mm -hmm. in addition to these new resources, the uh, table att in attachment one of IR forty six because it is a calculation of RPS or RPSA, it does include within this calculation the the forecasted uh, and modeled renewable contribution from projects uh, that are currently in service as well. Yeah, just to make that, okay. that, that, that clear. Mm -hmm. well, thank, thank you. Um, so aside from the projects that are, are already in service that you referenced and the projects that are identified in this attachment too, are there any other uh, new generation projects included in the table attachment one to PUC IR 46? Uh, no, the attachment one in IR 46 is the, the sum of existing grid scale uh, renewable resources, uh, existing distributed energy resources, these listings here of in-flight uh, uh, grid scale renewable energy projects and a forecast of, of future distributed energy resources, uh, renewable okay. distributed energy resources. Okay. Um, does this include the uh, Puna Geothermal project on the on the Helco's um, service area? Uh, yes, it includes the uh, assumed return to service of, of Pune Geothermal. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, okay, so I wasn't sure if there was part coming. All right, um, I'd like to turn back to the attachment one, the PUC IR 46, please, Grace. So um, going to, uh, if you look at column H, grid scale renewable generation, the amount of generation um, increases by a very large amount in the year 2025 um, from 2,627 um, gigawatt hours in 2024 to 4,429. And there's a corresponding increase in the amount of financial incentive payments in column L where um, it almost doubles to 22.6 million. I'm just curious, what is the source for this uh, sudden increase in renewable generation? Uh, 
Um, Mr. Kaitsu, I believe uh, the 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 increase that you see between 2024. Uh, okay, no, that's I'm looking at the wrong row. I apologize. Off the top of my head, I do not have um, an answer for that, but I can look into it further. Thank you. Okay, and just to confirm, um, does this table take, uh, is this table um, including forecasts for any, um, I guess, additional new grid scale renewable projects that are assumed to be added um, during the years 2025 through 2040? I'm sorry, Mr. Kritz, could you repeat that, the question again? Uh, yeah, I'm just wondering if, if there are any additional new grid scale renewable projects that are, are assumed in here to be added after 2025 through 2040. Uh, yes, in our production modeling that we did uh, to do the calculations for uh, IR46, we use a production simulation uh, and a resource plan that includes a sort of an updated or modified um, power supply improvement plan, resource plan, uh, where we substitute out uh, for the PSIP plan um, those more near-term resources that are identified as part of the stage one and stage two RFPs, but we retain uh, renewable resources in later years uh, that are included within our 2016 PSIP. Uh, for the purposes of, of this calculation, that's that's what we did. Thank you. Um, I'd like to direct this next question to um, Mr. Clay of Ulupono. Um, so, um, Mr. Clay, I just wanted to you know just to, to confirm this is um, this is all about sort of the RPSA PIM, which your organization has has developed and um, shepherded through this and. Up to now, I believe it's been um, contemplated on a on a HECO company only basis. So, I'm just curious, um, in light of this um, table and and the information that's being provided for this um, RPSA PIM on a consolidated basis, I was just wondering, um, after having had an opportunity to review this table, just if you had any observations or uh, comments regarding the company's derivation of your calculations. So I, to be clear, I haven't audited this uh, spreadsheet per se to double check the numbers. They do seem to be directionally accurate. It does seem to be right. The, at a high level, the statutory RPS requirement, obviously the RPSA, which goes up from year to year, all seems to be fail, faithfully reproduced here. I would say that in addition to the HECO's numbers here being consolidated, which as we've explained in the past, Due to budgetary constraints, we had a choice between going very detailed and thorough with HECO or going mm -hmm. very shallow with all three companies. We decided to go thorough and deep with HECO. So we can't confirm the amounts on the other, um, uh, the other uh, grids. But beyond that, there is, of course, a difference in the resource plan between what the utility is showing here and what is represented in the switch generated scenario 2.1. So there are differences in the speed and the amount of renewable energy that's added, but it, at a general high level, this seems to be in the right direction in terms of doing it on a consolidated basis. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm now going to move back again to the uh, questions about, um, I have some additional questions about customer engagement, so I'm going to take us back to that topic briefly. Um, I guess I will. Well, I guess I'll direct this to you, Mr. Aoki, and you can you can tell me who's in the best position. So, um, in the company's response to the PUC parties, IR11, the company's proposed an alternative PIM that would um, encourage joint efforts between the companies and Hawaii Energy to engage with LMI customers. And improve customer equity. Who would be the uh, best person um, to, to speak with from your panel? Could I please direct that question, Mr. Katsu, to Michelle Kimura? Okay. Um, so, um, Ms. Kimura, um, have, what steps, if any, have the companies taken to ex explore this kind of a PIM with uh, Hawaii Energy? Um, we haven't taken steps yet. Um, it was um 
thought of just last week uh, in response to the IR that was put forth to us. We've been talking to Hawaii Energy um, for a while now on in general on partnership, but more specifically and more recently on LMI on how we can better partner. Um, mm -hmm. So this specific PIM, we haven't talked to them. We did reach out to them when we got your initial IR uh, to see their thoughts on it and they were um, open to it. And those, uh, Lani Shinsatu, Shinsato, I think had the direct conversation with them and can provide feedback on that if that's necessary. But we do look for, if the PUC does want to look into this PIM, we do look forward to further vetting it with them. Mm -hmm. What, I guess, what would be the next immediate steps do you think you would need to, to do in terms of, of working with Hawaii Energy to, um, well, like, what would be the next steps? What would need to happen? Um, giving Brian a call and his team and just floating the idea with them, letting them know what we're thinking, seeing what their reactions are. And then I think we have to come up with the specific metrics, whether we have a floor, whether it's based on percentage increases, which programs are included, which programs are not. Um, I think all of those questions are on the table right now. Do the companies have any inclinations or, or preferences, you know, kind of as proposed or tentative metrics or, or appropriate programs? Um, we honestly, I specifically haven't uh, or personally haven't gone into a lot of detail on it yet. Um, just given the timing and the preparation for, for the hearing, there wasn't a lot of time to go into that. Um, but I think over time, there's going to be what well, um, Hawaii Energy has specific LMI programs. We have some specific LMI programs. I believe over time, we're going to be adding more LMI programs. CVRE is a very good example of that. Um, and so we can take a look at what um, our projections are for that. Again, that's going to be quite uncertain because it's going to depend on um, subscriber organizations' abilities as well. But I think that's all the more reason why a, a joint effort on this is important, um, and especially in this time. So the specifics on exactly how it gets measured, I think that the devil's going to be in the details on that one. Mm -hmm. I see. Um Prior to, I, uh, I guess, this idea being proposed and you, you contacting Hawaii Energy last week, have there ever been previous uh, outreach efforts either by the companies or Hawaii Energy to um, work collaboratively in this fashion towards reaching LMI customers? Yes, there has been. Um, we had a big group meeting, I would say, in April, maybe. I'm guesstimating around that time. And um, we identified points of contact on each of our teams to keep the conversations going and the ideas going. And there have been a few things where um, members of our team have been working with members of Hawaii Energy's team on um, some specific efforts and, and customers. Okay. Um, and was there any follow-up planned or any um, next steps kind of uh, is what happened with that April effort? Did it is it just out there, or are there plans to to move on this? Or oh no, that's what I was mentioning. That we mm -hmm. identified points of contact. They've been meeting on a regular basis. Um, our company and Hawaii Energy in general meet on a regular basis. I believe it's monthly. Um, and uh, this is another topic that's now added to to the list of things that we focus on. So there has been follow up. There has been um, collaboration. And, and actions being taken, and it's a continuous process. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Let's see. Uh, Mr. Kayetsu, uh, not just mm -hmm. after you break there, I wanted to let you know that Ms. Shansato had earlier mentioned that she would confirm certain numbers in response to your question regarding PUC parties IR9. She's available to provide that additional information if it's appropriate at this time. Oh, yes, please do. Thank you, Mr. Katsu, for the opportunity. Uh, regarding your, your question, the fastest we did in 2019 was five days, and the longest we did in 2019 was 175 days. 
And what I wanted to clarify about what I said earlier about our uh, response to PUC parties IR9 is that um, since we filed the response, we are willing to um, move to removing outliers. We understand the various uh, parties' concerns with this, although we would never game it ourselves. Uh, we understand the concerns. And so um, we would support excluding the outliers. Um, one uh, recommendation is perhaps allowing us to exclude the outliers only on the long side, um, just because we think that we want to be incentive, incented to achieve really top levels of performance on the fast side. Um, and so we wanted to offer that for um, consideration. And if we're allowed to exclude the outliers for the, the longer times, then I think we'd be comfortable moving to a, a higher number that's a mean number. Thank you. Um, thank you for following up with that so quickly. Uh, just a few follow-ups to that. Uh, those days you mentioned, are those um, calendar days or business days? These should be all business days. Okay, and just to clarify, is that to complete um, from application to permission to operate or just for those steps that you, you've said are within the company's control? Huh. I should probably double check on that before okay. I answer. <laughs> I understand, thank you. I don't you. wanna misstate anything. And I didn't give very clear directions to the team, too, so I will double check. Okay, thank you. Let's... Mr. Chairman, I think I'm winding down. May I have a few minutes to just review my notes quickly? Sure thing. How about, um, how about we do this? We'll go into recess and take a break. Uh, we'll give Mr. Kayatsu a few minutes to regroup, see if he has any final questions, and then we'll move into the examination by commissioners. Uh, so it's 2.25 now. Let's come back. Uh, start promptly at 2.35. Thanks. We're in recess.
Hi everyone, we're going to start the hearing in a couple minutes, uh, so please filter in when you can. We have a couple pieces of uh, follow-up. Uh, the witnesses that missed our earlier swearing in, we're going to swear in now. So that'll be Mr. Bins and Mr. Fripp when we start back up again. And then I'm informed Mr. Kayatsu just has a few follow-up questions, uh, so I'll turn it back to him and then we'll go to the commissioner examination. So that's our agenda for starting shortly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman and Mr. Kayatsu, just we also have a clarification point on something we committed to get back to you on prior to the break and we're ready to respond whenever you are. Okay, how about uh, we'll take that up after I swear in a couple witnesses before I forget that. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> and then I'll let you and Mark take care of the follow-up and clarifications. Thank you. 
Sorry, Mr. Kayatsu. Okay. Uh, we're at 2.35, uh, so we're going to call the hearing back to order. And our first item of business here will be, hopefully we have Mr. Bins and Mr. Fripp. I'm here. Great. Uh, Mr. Bins, are you present? Mr. Morawaki, is your witness present? He was just a little while ago. He is present. Okay. Ah, okay. All right. Uh, very quickly, for both of you, you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Great. Thank you. Uh, we're going to turn it back to Mr. Kayatsu. So I understand he has a few follow up questions and then. Um, I will turn it over to Commissioner Santian and start our examination by the commissioners. So with that, uh, Mr. Kayatu, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Aoki, okay, I hope you don't mind. I'm going to direct this question directly to Ms. Shinsato because I think that she's probably the one who is best suited to ask that. But if not, she, she can defer. Um, Ms. Shin, Ms. Shinsato, I just want to follow up on the um, suggestions made by the DER parties regarding um, Subdividing the interconnection PIM based on system sizes. I just wanted to know what HECO's uh, thoughts are on that suggestion. Yes, uh, thank you for the question, Mr. Kayatsu. I was also interested um, to see what that looked like uh, after I saw the DER party's IR response. Um, so we took a look at um, the breakdown of system sizes and um, how many we get in different categories. And actually, if I can find my paper here, pardon me. Um, actually, uh, most of our applications are below 10 kW. Um, I think it was 0 0.06 actually fell in the category of above 50 kW. And 10% were uh, under 10 kW. I'm sorry, I can't find my, my piece of paper that had that information on it. So does, uh, can I, um, does that indicate that the companies think it is uh, it is a worthwhile consideration, or it's? Um, I'm just kind of curious what your what your reaction is. I found it, Mr. Kaitsu. Thank you for your patience. Uh, no. Of course, it was right in front of me. Um, <laughs> zero point zero six percent. Um, so we look back at 2018 and 2019, uh, mm -hmm. and so zero point zero six percent were over 50 kW, um, and then in the same time period systems that were greater than 10 kW, it was 10.13%. Um, and then we looked at what the review times were in these different categories, and it was actually very close. So I'm not sure why, but for mm -hmm. the larger systems, actually, when we looked at it in a different way, we chose 6 kW as a median system size, and for systems above that, our median was 27 business days. And for systems below that size, our median was 26 days. So not much difference. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, the next follow-up question I had was back to you, Mr. Ching. Um, I know you indicated that you were going to uh, follow up to um, find an explanation for the uh, the increase in generation. I just want to clarify if you'd be willing to um, file um, file that with us either as an exhibit or as a supplement to the NIR response. And um, in doing so, could you also um, include, sorry, I'm trying to make sure I get the wording of this right. Um, could you file an exhibit or a supplemental IR response um, just clarifying what is causing the increase um, in generation during that uh, those two years, as well as providing um, 
as well as showing the output from each of the renewable resources contributing um, to the amounts in column H for each year. Yeah, Mr. Kai, so I can, I can definitely do that, but I, hopefully I can do one better than that as well. So we can provide a supplemental IR response as, as you're uh, directing, but I do have an answer, so, which requires me to actually correct something that I said earlier. So in PUC HECO IR 47, uh, that table that we went through shows the latest uh, uh, sort of snapshot of projects that are in flight. Um, where I need, well, then that's correct. Where I need to correct what I said earlier is that in IR 46, uh, the calculation of a renewable generation, the calculation of the RPSA determination, and then any calculations of uh, renewable energy above the RPSA target and a calculation in, in column K and a calculation of, of incentives uh, rewards in column L. We actually use, because of the timing, the, the short time in which we, we had to respond to this IR, we used the resource plan that were, was used in um, our initial statement of uh, position. Uh, I think it was in, um, I got the right reference. It was in um, exhibit P2 of it, attachment number one, where we compare um, Hawaiian Electric's uh, resource plan with um, a, a couple of variations of the resource plans developed by Ulupono. Um, so that jump that you see in 2025 uh, is because rather than using the latest information we have on the stage two projects, uh, for 2025 uh, and the, that table, we use a proxy. Basically, we use the full um, set of resources in the uh, stage two procurement, what we were seeking. Uh, and uh, at that point in time, we use 2025 as the assumed commercial operation date for all of those resources. So again, to correct what I said earlier, that's what we assumed uh, for that table. Okay, so can, would you, can you provide a, a supplement then that would have the corrected figures in that IR46 table because so if I'm understanding the the figures in the IR47 um, were not used in the IR46 attachment because of, of just the, the time frame so you can submit a supplement to the IR46 with with the um, the IR47 numbers in it yeah so we will develop a a, a new table uh, responding to IR46 which includes the um, the, the selected projects from the stage two um, that, that's shown in IR 47. All right, thank you very much. Um, then I have a question for the consumer advocate. So I guess that would be you, Ms. Roberto. Um, yes, sir, thank gonna, you. Thank you. This is gonna go back to um, the, the topic of, of customer engagement and this is, um, Kind of a broader question, but I just like to hear the consumer advocate's opinion on what are the biggest opportunities for the companies to better engage customers in the next five years? So I, I'm not sure that I can layer in, and then first off, I'll start off with an answer, but I'll also um, defer or refer to the uh, consumer advocate if, if that's appropriate. Uh, thank you. <coughs> So I'm I'm not sure that five years is anything that is going to guide the answer. What I would suggest that the consumer advocate cares about is where are those opportunities for customer engagement that will lead to an outcome we are all seeking. So when the consumer advocate talks about customer engagement, uh, the, the idea is it's not customer engagement just for the sake of engaging. It's customer engagement for the sake of a particular outcome. So the consumer advocate has focused on, for instance, the call center, because the end result of a well-operated call center would be customer satisfaction. The consumer advocate has focused on uh, the proposed DER asset effectiveness PIMS because they will require customer engagement, but they will lead to more cost-effective operation of the grid. Um, the, the IRs that were posed by the commission with regard to a closer collaboration with Hawaii Energy 
is the type of engagement that would lead to more cost effective customer service because perhaps the marketing functions could be combined. Um, Ratepayers pay for both Hawaii Energy and as ratepayers for the types of services. And if there are efficiencies and commonalities that could be gained, that is the outcome. Um, so, in, in general, the big picture idea is customer engagement leading to what good outcome. Um, and, and with that, um, Mr. Nishina, is there anything that I need to be corrected on or that you would like to add? Hi, no, um, thank you. If I if I could add, you know, one, one thing we were struggling when trying to propose um, particular PIMs for customer engagement, there are certain things that I think the company has um, could could engage in to provide value to not only integrating more renewable energy, but also help um, customers is in the area of um, outreach and education. And, and we hadn't made that comment before. So an, an example of where um, improved customer engagement could help uh, renewable energy um, could take for, could take the form of um, where we've seen some projects run into opposition. And if there's early engagement, and I think the company has already expressed agreement with the need to have early engagement often and early. And you know, if, if we can improve on that, perhaps we could eliminate those projects, or I shouldn't say eliminate, but we could uh, mitigate the, the costs that are being incurred and then the hardships that are being incurred in terms of pitting um, community members against each other in terms of whether a project should or shouldn't move forward. And again, you know, customer education that I think you know is being discussed in terms of having, say, collaboration between Hawaii Energy and Hawaiian Electric could help better educate customers about the means by which that they can take control of their energy usage, whether it's through energy efficiency or DER or DR or, or any other program. And, and and again, that's that's where we're struggling trying to identify an easily verifiable. Um, metric that could be used to not only measure that, but then determine what a reasonable value is based on a potential cost benefit analysis. So I, that was all I wanted to add. Thank you. No, thank, thank you very much, Mr. Nishina. And just uh, the last question I have is uh, to the other parties um, besides Hawaiian Electric and the consumer advocate. I just wanted to put that out. Um, if any of the other parties have any thoughts on um, the best ways to better engage with customers, um, just feel free to so if, you, if anyone has any thoughts, feel free to speak up now. I'm uh, Murray Clay from Ulupano, if I might. Mm -hmm, please. So I kind of gathered from the earlier uh, questions that were being asked that there was a question as to whether or not the electrification transportation PIM really did result in customer engagement. And it may, at least that's the way I interpreted it. That may not have been the intent. But what I would say is customer engagement is helping customers make decisions they want to make, but don't know how, or it's something they want to do that would help them, but they're either uncertain or feel fearful for how they might do that. And I believe from my presentation this morning, I shared that there are a lot of customers that do want to have electric vehicles, but the number one cited reason for being concerned about doing so is range anxiety. They're afraid they'll be stuck somewhere without a charge. And there's not, there's some uh, publicly available charging stations, but it can be difficult at times. And that's the number one way to help, help people make that decision. Similarly, on other customer engagement outcomes, we don't want to, as I think we've agreed, have things that are simple tallies of activity, website hits, how many newsletters are sent out, things of that nature, because there's not really an outcome other than touching base with someone really frequently. So again, customer engagement tied to outcomes, even for example, on the, the question, the, 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 the IR on Hawaii energy programs, uh, we made the point in our IR response, the issue isn't the percentage of customers engaged, it's rather how much energy is saved per customer or how much energy is saved because of that addition. You could have two, and I've, I've talked with Brian K. Loa as well. They've got a wide variety of programs. Some have a very small customer base, some have a very large customer base. And if you base it on percentage of customers that go up because of uh, HECO's involvement, you could be rewarding a very big reward for a very small in, uh, increase in energy savings. So we would position that engagement 
tied with a true outcome, like kilowatt hours of savings, not numbers of customers or percentage increases, it's really a more outcome-based way to do these types of things. So just in closing, uh, EOT is one aspect, it's not all of customer engagement, certainly, but it's one way to help customers make a decision that they want to make, but don't know how to make. Thank you very much, Mr. Clay. Does any, uh, do any of the other parties um, have any thoughts? Um, this is Henry Curtis with Life of the Land. And this uh, refers also to Dean Nishina's uh, recent comments about um, projects and early engagement. Um, part of community engagement is not having bad publicity from uh, projects. And one way of, of um, averting that is to have some forewarning of projects coming up. Um, rate cases, often you have to file a notice of intent and you can see what's coming. It would be helpful that the utility um, sort of gives some guide about what's coming in the next year and to have that move on a real time basis so that everybody can efficiently participate in the process. Thank you very much, Mr. Curtis. Uh, anyone else? I have no further questions, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, okay. Mr. Clyde, so just before you wrap up, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to point out that Mission Sato does have a response to a question that you had prior to the break. Appropriate. Uh, she can get updates and response. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kaetsu, for the additional uh, opportunity to update. I did check with the team and the five business days and 175 business days that I referred to earlier as the fastest and the longest. Um, that represents total time for us, so all steps within our control for last year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. No further questions. Thank you, Mr. Kayatu. Uh, uh, Commissioner Suntian. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to explore one one area, and um, I, I think this is more to all parties just to get a sense and, and maybe confirm my what's going through my head um we talk and this is on uh dr the the pim for dr asset effectiveness so i've heard today um right either there is one or move it to the dr docket to be determined or there might be a uh, i guess an alternative in using rpsa because it covers some of it um Right, according to Ulupono's presentation. Uh, so what I see, right, it, it's under that improve utility and performance. And you have the three areas, right, cost control, DR asset effectiveness, grid investment efficiency. And my question is, are we okay? Say we do move the DR asset effectiveness over to the DR docket to get kind of, you know, vet it out and, and to come up with what it would look like. Are we okay with uh, moving forward with just a cost control PM or SSM or, you know, something or and the grid investment efficiency for that particular area? And I open that up to, to anyone. Um, this is Henry with Life of the Land. Um, there has been a lot of discussion about how the PIMs need to work together as a portfolio. So it might make sense for the DER docket to work on proposals, but then to bring it back to the larger group for how it fits in as, as a total portfolio. Um, great portfolio initiative, if I might. Sure. Sorry, I wasn't sure if I was talking over someone or not. Go ahead, Mary. So I guess our answer would depend on what you mean by moving it to the DER docket. So if the idea was to go forward with the RPSA as we've supported it, 
and then have something supplemental or in addition to that that be considered in the DR docket, we wouldn't have any major complaints with that. Of course, as you might imagine, if the proposal was to move all DER related PAMs to the DER docket, and because the RPSA does count DERs and utility scale renewables equally in its calculation, that that would also be put off to another date or another docket. I would say that uh, we've provided plenty of information, uh, benefit cost analysis, and financial modeling to fully support the RPSA as it is. So I would say if, if you're asking about removing that and just looking at it in the DER docket, certainly we would not support that. We have no objection to any kind of supplemental DER focused things being addressed elsewhere. Thank you, Mr. Clay. I think you even answered my next question because I was going to ask, right, what does doing that does it impact any other PIMs that are on the table right now being proposed? So any other uh, thoughts on that? I, I mean, I'm just, I'm not, I, I don't have the answer. I think I'm just looking for, right, some of, right, there's going to be awareness like, like Mr. Clay said, right? There's, there's some impact on other things. Are we sure what we're, what we're talking about when we move uh, DR asset effectiveness? Right, that particular PIM, or are we talking about anything related to DR, where they can do it? And then what's, uh, like what uh, Mr. Curtis and Mr. Clay has offered, right? What's the mechanism for the thing to, to come back, right? Because it, it, this is supposed to be uh, a framework ready to go day one, right? And so if we're going to have, right, the timing of when things are uh, done in the DR docket, right? might not match up with day one. So how does it work from there? Commissioner, can I in one more comment on that topic? Sure, Mr. Clay. Thank you. I appreciate that. So again, if you'll if you'll indulge me in a small hypothetical exercise here, as we've discussed, the RPSA is available, fully articulated, calculations are simple, leverages existing reporting history and could indeed be employed starting January 1st of next year. So I do think it would be a shame not to do so. I would also say that if the RPSA and, and everyone I think noted the amount of dollars that we showed an ROE impact that could be at stake with that PIM, if that was made available, so if the decision order came out saying that RPSA was part of the PBR construct, if I were, and I'm not Scott uh, Seu, but uh, Seu, sorry, um, but if that PIM came out very early in January, I would sit down with my senior staff and say, well, we understand that RFPs one and two are kind of in progress. So what's the main way that we can bring a lot of renewables on to boost our RPSA PIM? And the principal answer would be increasing DERs, cutting interconnection time. Let's get as much on the grid as fast as possible. Let's cut any fat or inefficiencies out of the interconnection process because we get paid more if we do that. We don't have to debate day counts. We don't have to debate what's in our control or someone else's control. We get paid more if we interconnect interconnect the DERs more quickly and uh, on the RFP 1 and 2, if there's any way that we can work with those developers to bring forward at all, or at least make sure we don't fall back in time for the interconnection of those, those projects. So really DERs are one of the main answers to how you boost the RPSA PIM if you're the utility. Okay. Yeah, Ms. Maraki. Thank you. I don't know if we're doing raise hands, but um, I was trying to raise hands yeah. online. Um, yeah, great question. Um, a, a couple responses. Um, one, yeah, as far as Blue Plan's position goes, I think implicit in our recommendation that the DER related PIMs, those specific PIMs, be moved to the DER docket, is that we're okay with whatever time delay that might entail in the hopes, in the expectation that we're going to get a better PIM because sort of an ineffective PIM that locks in the inefficient status quo is worse than no PIM at all uh, for various reasons. Um, so we're okay, you know, to your question uh, about that with going with whatever we can do right now based on this record. And we support Ulupono agree that based on this record, we can do an RPSA PIM, we can do a few use reduction PIM, um, and that's not DER related per se, uh, and we wouldn't uh, you know, propose to move that to the DERPM. Uh, I would note that we're, we're not as 
sanguine, as assured as Mr. Clay is, in just assuming that an R RPS-8 cam standing alone is going to solve all our problems with regards to DERs, which are extensive, and we have an extensive record about the struggles uh, and performance on DERs uh, in this docket. Um, one thing that you know I think we should recognize is that correcting the RPS metric will actually take away an advantage that DERs enjoy under the current metric, where you know, some people have called it double counting, but you know, DERs take away, take away sales as well as increase the, the numerator. That's going to go away under the corrected metric. And so it's going to work to the disadvantage, at least in the status quo, uh, you know, compared, uh, you know, co sorry, compared to what we have right now. Blue Planet makes clear that it supports that correction, but I just wanted to clarify that we, we just can't assume that just because we institute the RPSA, him, which we support, then all our interconnection problems are going to go magically disappearing. Thank you, Ms. Milwaukee. Any other comments on the question or? Commissioner, Commissioner Sergeant? Sure. Um, Harris has a, a response. Mr. Harris? Sure. Thank you very much. Um, echoing a bit of Isaac's comments, I think uh, this morning, Scott Sue talked about trying to transform into the highest performing company and the intent of PIMS to encourage exemplary behavior. And so, uh, again, specifically looking at the interconnection PIM, the time frame, um, we'd like to try to use it as a way to reward point electric, particularly if we are able to transform the interconnection process, that there is a concrete benefit to the company coming out of that. And the concern would be is locking in a PIM now that rewards a lesser time frame may sort of discourage any future improvements. The additional thing with regards to um, asset effectiveness, um, a distinguishment with DRs and utility scale projects is currently, in the current um, paradigm, a significant amount of Hawaiian Electric's revenues does come from distribution um, grades, which, you know, if we look at electrification more broadly, um, if we really see significant load increase, the potential for needing to do a lot of distribution upgrades is significant. And the reason why DRs could be a great uh, complement to that is they can potentially defer a lot of those needs. And I think that's really what the asset effectiveness is trying to get at. We don't want to see a situation where um, utility scale, you see a lot of solar and batteries deployed. In the distribution side, you see a lot of solar and batteries deployed and essentially built twice as many batteries as we need. For, for example, and we want to try to find a way we are optimizing the system to be the most efficient possible. This is a long-winded way of saying I think the DR asset effectiveness probably needs deep look specifically. Um, that's going to be programmatic, where we're going to just have tariffs that naturally encourage people to be available to allow some type of visibility and control, or if we're to pursue procurement only. Uh, so these competitively bid out and. DR customers don't naturally fall into these programs. Um, and, you know, whether it's one or the other or both approaches, I think it's something that the DR doc has to resolve to some extent and say a, a, a direction going forward. And that PIM has to reflect that direction. Um, full disclosure, we've been encouraging more programmatic. We want everyone who has a DR to be participating in a, in a program that helps the group. And we think it's sort of the best pathway forward. You know, naturally trying to align that PIM with that, that approach. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sure. Uh, Cheryl Roberto for the Consumer Advocate. Uh, we would simply point out that, uh, as you can tell from our proposals, we're still struggling with the available information, and we do believe that more of information would be available um, about the DER incentives in the DER docket. But we do also need to highlight that the performance incentives need to be designed as a portfolio, taking into account how do they all operate together to avoid duplication, to ensure that the companies have a reasonable opportunity to earn that up to 200 basis points, uh, and that earning those uh, additional incentives is only the result of exemplary performance. Um, we simply do not see enough information to identify for the DER incentives what represents exemplary performance as a, as a beginning point. 
Um, and then, and then finally, um, we'd like to make sure that the company would be required to perform in an exemplary way on a number of outcomes uh, to achieve the entire uh, opportunity for the 200 basis points. That is that there's a balance across the portfolio and other than handling them all at once, um, we're uncertain how that gets reconciled. Um, so we're, we're of two minds. We need to go deeper. We don't have the information to go deeper at this point, but it's important to manage this as a portfolio. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Professor. Commissioner, may I, may yes. I address that as well for Hawaiian Electric? Sure, Mr. Bayona. Great, thank you. So, uh, I, I, from the company's position, we understand that, you know there's there's some logic in, in taking more time to to decide what to do in the future. But I, I heard the DER parties say that there's been an urgency for a couple of years now to have an incentive to uh, advance DER. We agree with that. So, I think kicking this out to another docket is going to delay implementation of that. And I agree with Ms. Roberto, and I actually agree with Mr. Curtis, that one of the great values of this docket was to allow us to have a comprehensive evaluation of all the PIMs, all the uh, adjustments that may be made on the uh, multi-year rate plan side. Uh, so if we're going to carve something out and push it down the road, I think that leaves a little bit of a hole that's not fatal, but I don't think that's a good practice here. And I think the promise of this docket was to understand the interrelationship of the PIMs that are going to be adopted um, as, as a full package. So it would be a downside if we, we push that out uh, to decide that. So thank you for the opportunity to address that. Thank you, Mr. Viola. Uh, Commissioner Sanchez, I think uh, Moriaki uh, Waki has a, an additional comment. Thank you. Sure, go ahead. Just really quickly, I acknowledge this point, um, which really has been common to everyone commenting. Um, Commissioner Sanchez saying, shouldn't we have this already on day one? Uh, and then others, including Henry, Cheryl, and Joe, uh, talking about uh, the, the the synergies between all of the PIMs put together. Um, you know, it, it's basically kind of a dilemma that we're faced here, but I, I'm not sure how much we can uh, avoid it given the state of the record. And are we going to be you know, delaying all of the PIMs pending, figuring all of this out, or worse yet, you know, going forward with some half-baked proposals. Um, I would just note two quick things. One is that we do have precedent for establishing PIMs in subject matter dockets where we have the record, we have the ability to dig in and to, and, and to get the proposals. We have that RFP PIM and then we have the DR PIM. Uh, so there's precedent uh, you know, for that. I realize it's not optimal uh, and you know, you would want to do this in one mammoth planning exercise the way they do it in the UK with Rio. That's just not what we have here. I think that's the reality of it. Thank you, Mr. Milwaukee. Any other thoughts? If not, that was the only area that I wanted to explore, Mr. Chairman. So I'll yield back. Thank you, Commissioner Subcommittee. Now, uh, Commissioner Potter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all uh, for being here today and joining in this. This is um, getting to this point uh, has been an extraordinary lift, and it's so great to see how far we've come. Uh, I was, you know, I couldn't believe that today was the day that we actually have this hearing, and so it's here. Um, thank you all for preparing the, all of the IRs that you've submitted over the last several weeks. That's really helped us prepare some of the questions that we have for you today to start filling in some of the blanks that we have left um, for, or for our decision making. So I have um, quite a few questions. I'm going to start uh, with the DER party. So I'll go through each party um, and address my questions that are specific to them uh, to gain their insight. So DER parties, I believe that will be you, Mr. Harris, to kick things off. Great. Um, so I, since we started off with, uh, we just left off with DER asset effectiveness, I'll pick up there. Um, so so uh, Mr. Harris, for the DER asset effectiveness PIM, or some have uh, you know, articulated that they'd like to see it as an SSM, so either way, many parties have asserted that a baseline should be informed and set in the IGP process. In the event that the IGP process cannot deliver a baseline output for DER asset effectiveness within a reasonable timeframe, the end of the year, 
is there a proxy baseline that could be used? I, I apologize, uh, Commissioner Potter. I, I'm just taking a second to reflect on your question. Sure. Um, I, I do think that potentially we could look at some other jurisdictions or plainly others that have incorporated some level of grid services <clears throat> that could be used as a, as a direct comparison. But mm -hmm. part of the answer potentially should be trying to be reflective of what the need is. And so I, I do think the IGP should be illustrative, mm -hmm. um, but as a proxy, potentially looking at uh, adoption rates in other places might be useful. Great. Great. And that kind of to piggyback on that, you know, what what would we be me measuring if we looked at other jurisdictions? Uh, would we be what is it uh, the amount of and value um, the amount and value of grid services for from DERs? Uh, what what would we be looking at in that type of baseline? Yeah, I mean, again, I, I've seen that parties have proposed specific services, and and I think that is probably a good start. However, you know, one of the general values of these resources and, and sort of lumping it even broadly into energy efficiency and others is a capability of um, offsetting uh, future utility investment needs. And so mm -hmm. like identifying a peak and being able to say, hey, we could reduce that peak significantly, thus offsetting the need for future investments is, is also, you know, implicitly sort of part of this need and you offset the need for future grid services as well. And so um, the question sort of, um, I think, goes in a bit of a rabbit hole uh, eventually, but I do think we can um, start with sort of trying to do a need assessment uh, within the IGP and then trying to say, how can we address those needs? Um, and then sort of baselining from that by looking at other um, models uh, in other, other jurisdictions. Great, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Um, Mr. Geisy, do you have anything you wanna to add to that? Uh, no, I, uh, can you hear me okay? Just want to make sure I haven't talked in a while. Yep, yeah, absolutely. No, I, uh, thank you, Commissioner. I do appreciate the question. And I don't have much to add other than what uh, Mr. Harris said to echo his thoughts. I do think, though, that, you know, if we think about a suite of different um, grid services, for instance, that are currently might be operating on certain systems that have been installed here in Hawaii that aren't currently valued. I mean, there are some, and it's kind of up to the folks in this docket, or if we move it into the DR docket, the folks there in the commission to determine what those services are and what their value would be. And I agree with Mr. Harris that there are some kind of proxy cases that we can look at in other states. I mean, you know, even places like Illinois or New York or California have um, looked at certain services that DERs provide and then assigned a value to them. Although it is, I think, pricing and um, the types of systems that are installed in Hawaii obviously are different. And so there needs to be some kind of determination going that way. But um, yeah, I, that's, I think those are, that's what I'll add to that other than what Mr. Harris said. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Very helpful. Um, let's see. So the second question I have around the DER asset effectiveness um, is that the CA has proposed a possible metric of percent of it in quotes, percent of customer cited resources utilized for grid operation, including third party meters, advanced inverters, storage, et cetera. My question is, is this a plausible metric that could capture the value of utilization of DERs? Uh, as an initial step, yes. Again, I think our goal, generally speaking, is to move to a state where the value is known, determined, and then there's the appropriate compensation. So the idea is no more, no less, you know, sort of under smart rate design principles. And um, we don't want to see a situation where um, the utility is being incentivized to engage more systems that maybe aren't necessary as sort of an outlier case. But plainly, we're starting in a situation where, I guess it's earlier questioning demonstrated, there isn't very much, if all, um, DR participation uh, in any type of grid service program, even despite the fact we probably have the highest level of DR per capita and one of the highest level of battery deployment per capita. And so, um, again, I think as an initial step as a moving in the right direction, that could certainly be approached with the idea that maybe it becomes more targeted over time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, that's helpful. 
Mr. Basie, anything to add on that? Uh, no, similarly, I echo my colleague, Mr. Harris's comments, but I will say that, like I said earlier, I mean, it is kind of a, a question of choice, right? There are services that are installed on systems currently operating that we or HECO or the PUC or all of us have just not <clears throat> made the choice to determine what that value is. You know, these systems that we're installing today are much more advanced in Hawaii than they are in a lot of other jurisdictions in the United States. And they are currently operating services or have capabilities that could offer a service that could potentially be valued. Um, so it's kind of up to us to decide what that is going to be. Great, thank you. All right, so next one is uh, what tools or tool, singular or plural, would be most helpful in informing the development of the DER asset effectiveness PIM, establishing grounding uh, grounded baselines and assigning the monetary performance incentive. In other words, how can we quantitatively determine the value to the system? Million dollar question. Yeah, so again, this goes back to um, the question I think you started with, which is looking at the IGP and potentially looking at the potential investments, the utility, plans and making, um, plainly as we move to 100% RPS, there's gonna be fairly significant capacity needs, for example. Um, and you know, a lot of people talk about how getting to some level, whether it's 70% or 80% renewable energy is pretty easy, and it's that last part that's hard. And that last part is the DERs, I believe. And so knowing how to integrate them um, is important. And again, I think it really does go down to trying to defer those future utility investments in an effective, productive way, I think it's gonna give you values. So again, the hypothetical of 10 electric vehicles in a cul-de-sac is likely gonna require new transformers, new vision, and then as that extends out, you're gonna start seeing a lot of deployment. However, DERs or uh, clever load management programs could potentially defer a lot of that, and that becomes a concrete value that we can point to um, that's gonna answer some of this question. Uh, in the absence of that kind of information or knowledge, um, we are probably just looking at uh, proxy values. And then in this case, you might just look at the load peak and say, hey, if we can clip that, what, what do we think the relative value of that would be? So, so just to follow up on that, Mr. Harris, um, in terms of a tool, um, I, I know you mentioned the IGP process, and I, I understand, of course, that they're utilizing tools in order to, to model um, DERs in addition to electric vehicles and other types of demand side resources. Um, are, are those the tools that we need specifically in order to determine? Uh, is, it, is it imperative that we wait for the output of the IGP process, or is there alternative tools and resources that we can utilize in order to come, come to um, developing some of these value estimates for these types of resources moving forward? Yeah, I apologize. This is a chicken or the egg um, answer. And I think the concern would be, and again, this is a, a, a one-sided view and Hawaiian Electric may have a different point of view, um, is that primarily in the IGP process, a lot of these, um, uh, uh, different variables are being considered something uh, as just as an assumption, something that happens. And I don't believe, like, for example, um, the commission recently hired Brattle Group to do a part of the energy efficiency uh, working group study, you know, actually looked at what some of the values would be at, at doing like a time of use program. And I'm not sure we're seeing comparable approaches in the IGP process where you're looking at uh, time of use or behavioral signals or time signals or DER programs as a mechanism to adjust needs. Um, so we're not necessarily seeing in the IGP, and again, just from what the stakeholders have seen to date, um, something that's really showing this as being used as a tool or resource versus just seeing it as just something that happens to them. And so do we need a PIM? Do we need something like what the consumer advocate has suggested in order to go to some level of movement um, and trying to get the wheel spinning with the idea that we can be more refined and more targeted over time. Um, I, I would state as just from a general need, you know, irrespective of where, what dock and when do we do it, I do think there is that need because currently I don't think it's in the utility's economic interest to think about it this way. Um, uh, you know, plainly on a, a traditional um, a cost of service model, um, you know, you don't necessarily want to see long-term losses of, of load, 
and and how do you sort of change that and and have a different approach um I, i've talked for quite a bit thank you very much for letting me speak thank you for your answer go ahead mr Casey, if you have something to add uh sure uh just thank you uh real quick i think you know in in terms of tools there are some things I, like mr harris kind of went around this question which is like a program or procurement is kind of like a type of tool that makes something effective, but then there are also modeling tools. Um, obviously in the DER docket, we're considering different types of modeling tools. There's other programmatic tools like rates. You know, if you're gonna put somebody on a TOU rate, they're gonna react differently and consider different assets based on that rate that they have, and that is a tool. Um, and then there's kind of existing data too uh, that we have, like for instance, Ms. Shinsato uh, cited some data from about interconnection, like the percentage of systems that were under 10 kilowatts, which I didn't know until now, but that data is out there that can be used to determine which programs are currently effective, what are the size of those systems, what is being installed, and what are the capabilities of those to be used. That exists, uh, you know, here within Hawaii um, and could be potentially a tool that we could use to determine other kind of programmatic outcomes. Great, thank you. All right, and here's here's the big question um, for the, the both of you. Um, so what do we need to prepare for a DER asset effectiveness PEM for 2021? Can that be done with the readily available data and analysis today? Um, I do believe that you could start uh, a move forward with some type of proxy or some type of mechanism that is going to be openly stated that we're going to be adjusting and changing over time. I mean, it's going to be an iterative process um, with the willingness to develop more information, to require more information, and maybe that's a part of the incentive program. And uh, I, I say this a bit hesitantly because I do think DR party suggested this as sort of their initial pre um, phase one approach was a lot of it is just trying to require data gathering and start trying to identify the needs and, and, and develop it. And I recognize the decision's been made. I, I don't necessarily want to rehash that that proposal, um, but I do think that, you know, this is going to be iterative. Um, I think classically PBR is aligned with some type of resource plan or integrated grid planning type of, of docket. And so that is sort of normal um, and, you know, I, I, so maybe to tighten the answer, um, I do think we could start with some proxies and start with some directionality um, incentives with the idea that maybe in a few more years, we're going to start getting a lot more are targeted. Great, thank you. Mr. Casey, something to add? Uh, yeah, I mean, I agree with Mr. Harris as well. Um, just to get kind of maybe philosophical about it for a minute, I think it's important to recognize that you know, DER is a very essential part to meeting RPS goals. Uh, you know, we have said this, ECO has said this, the PUC has said this, everyone has said this. Um, but the way that DERs function in the market is that we're reactive, right? Programs are made and decided for us, and then the market itself reacts to that. And in a way, I think, you know, we've, we've been able, obviously through PUC uh, proceedings, this one and others, to comment on how the market would best uh, meet uh, whatever goals are set for it or whatever um, things that we're trying to reach would be. But I guess it's just good to recognize, you know, what the DER is like and, and how can we improve on, on their ability to function. So, you know, what is going to be a good PIM to get us going in 2021? I mean, if we want grid services, we are going to need a proxy value for this. And you're going to have to send that signal to the DER market to start them getting those assets built uh, sooner rather than later. Um, but yeah, I also agree with Mr. Harris's uh, point about we should remain flexible. I mean, in the last five years, we've seen an explosion here in Hawaii on um, installs for with energy storage on residential systems. You know, over 75%, I think, DBET estimated last year, residential systems in Oahu had an energy storage component to it. And that is an untapped asset that we could potentially be using in a variety of ways. We just have to decide to do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I'm going to shift gears now, uh, but you both aren't off the hook yet. So I, here we go. And an interconnection experience. Um, so 
So I have quite a few questions. Um, the first one I think is the most significant for me, um, and I, I might have to rephrase this. So, so let's see if you get it based off this first cut, but do the parties have data that captures the opportunity cost for time spent and he goes interconnection queue? Other, another way to state it, what are the economic costs associated with delays or simply waiting for a project to move forward? Yeah, so we've previously in um, past presentation cited references uh, from both the Solar Foundation, I believe, and SIA, the Solar Energy Industry Association, demonstrating that approximately 30% of a DR installation is related to both interconnection and permitting. It's just that general delay, regardless of whether it's one or the other. Um, and we do not have specific data about how this is uh, happening in Hawaii correspondingly, but we would anticipate that it'd be similar or higher just because historically delays have been greater in Hawaii. Um, but, you know, we have seen in some states like Nevada, which is switched in a relatively recent time period where uh, we're seeing interconnections, and, sorry, installations happening within a matter of days and being turned on in sort of the same time frame. And you know, the reports have been that that's millions of dollars um, across the state in, in net savings. So it is significant. Um, uh, I hope that's satisfactory. I mean, again, trying to get the exact number in Hawaii is just exceedingly challenging without sort of a third party reviewing. Typically, uh, DR businesses can't talk about pricing, can't talk about the things just because of restrictions on, on anti-competitive behavior. So this, these are not easy topics to develop internally. Thank you. And so uh, a question too, to follow up, and then I'll turn to you, Mr. Geisey. Um, if, if this data was available, I mean, if we, if we had perfect information, right? And even if we just have proxy information, such you, as you mentioned with the 30%, could this data be used to inform the value of the incentive and or penalty of the interconnection PEM? Yes, I believe it could. Thank you. Mr. Geisey? Uh, yes, I agree with uh, Mr. Harris's answer on the last question, but I'll backtrack a little bit to your first to talk about just some numbers. And these were pulled from a presentation that we made in a different docket. But, um, you know, we kind of looked at where these costs are coming from. And nationally, I think Mr. Harris was referencing a CS study. And uh, the U.S. average residential cost per watt was $2.70. And 63% of that cost was in soft costs, uh, which include things like permitting, inspection, and interconnection. Um, in Hawaii, the average cost per watt when we made this presentation was around $4.85 a watt. Um, so you can imagine if you took even, you know, 50% of that, it's pretty significant in a cost per watt cost. And, and here in Hawaii, I, I think our interconnection times are, are a little bit longer than in some other states that have a high per capita penetration. So this is something that we could uh, definitely work on. And it's something that is very important, I mean, to like the end user. You know, that's that's the cost of their system. 485 is that that's what the resident is going to pay pay per watt. Yeah, this is it's an economic cost that's actually shared by everybody. So yeah, yeah. Thank you. That's that's exactly what I was trying to get at. So um, so the next question is, um, what's an appropriate baseline for interconnection time for systems under 100 kW, and how is it derived? I, I know your proposal of the, you know, the 15% or 15 kW and under and the 15 to 50%. And I'll get to that one later. But um, in, in a perfect world, knowing, you know, what you have right now, what's an appropriate baseline for interconnection time? Um, again, we pointed to PG&E um, as, as an example, and not to say it's the only example. Um, Again, as, as we stated earlier, um, Hawaiian Electric's done a lot of mapping of its circuits, and so it should have the ability to identify areas where interconnection can move forward relatively freely. And so, you know, relatively the time should be, um, and, and we argued previously, same day uh, for like a non-exporting system or a system on uh, a circuit where, you know, the hosting capacity is well known and available. Um, but again, I, uh, taking the approach like PGE and others, you know, of looking at it a five to ten day time frame, um, seems a reasonable and it would be a good step in the right direction. So, so really looking at comparative and other utilities, best practices from best performing utilities would be 
a good way to kind of set this, like you said, PG and E. Is that, yeah. I think it's a simple way of approaching it. Again, I think the ask uh, in the DR docket was for the utilities to take a holistic approach. And so, you know, why do we need customer signatures multiple times? Why do we um, need certain levels of review repeatedly? Can we try to simplify it down to one form? The idea of trying to make not only the experience better for the customer, but making it more efficient from the utility perspective as well. Um, not having to review form, amended forms, you know, an application comes in and gets changed three or four times. How do we eliminate a lot of that? So um, some of this will be derived, I think, from the specific information that the utility may provide. But, you know, again, just as a general proxy, other comparable utilities, I think is a good way to start. Great. Thank you. All right. Um, let's see. So should each island have a benchmark specific to each utility statistics for interconnection? As much as possible, I think we'd like to try to avoid that. Um, I don't think we want to go in a situation where each utility is very different and, and treated differently. Um, ideally, we have consistent standards among you know, all the, at least in this case, the Hawaiian Electric utilities. Okay. All right. Uh, so how, how should the commission treat interconnection of a system in a new DER program, um, e.g. the programs that emerge out of the DER proceeding? Um, currently, we have our legacy programs. Should, should this be different than the legacy programs, or should the standards be the same? Are we going to have to think about this differently after we dive into sort of the value and, and what we're, we're looking at within the DER docket? Granted, this, you know, assuming that we move forward with a, a PIM in 2021 and then essentially get re revisit this in another look you know so are we going to need to consider like two standards essentially because they're obviously going to have different operating requirements and legacy so i'm um, just thinking through that it looks like we just lost um oh no there there's mr harris um oh, mr I Garcia, if you want to take a crack at it too <laughs> yeah thank I'll you my primary go ahead <laughs> And I, I have some other comments after. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, again, I think the design of some programs has been trying to avoid some of the interconnection um, system delay. Um, so, for example, CSS systems, which are non exporting, um, are treated differently and, and skip a lot of screens under Rule 14H and potentially should be held to a different standard. Um, Smart Export, similarly, was designed specifically not to export during the peak periods at, with the idea, again, really trying to address the technical concerns and allow fast interconnection. So yes, I think that is, um, apologize for the background noise. Um, that is, uh, I think, part of it and maybe another rational reason for why the DR program track is kind of important. Go ahead, Mr. Uh, yeah, I appreciate the question. I, I would say that um, I agree to, I mean, we, we've seen in like the CSS uh, program or smart expert program, certain screens are skipped uh, for interconnection of systems. And you can imagine that I think it's a good principle to just say if a DER system overall provides a benefit to the grid over its lifetime, that it should probably be expedited for interconnection because that's something that all rate payers and the utility would benefit from, right? So it probably makes more sense to install it faster rather than to sit on it. Um, and in that way, I'm thinking, you know, in terms of systems that are uh, minimal exporting or export at times where it's appropriate and beneficial to the grid and provide other services otherwise. Uh, as far as legacy systems go, I think it's really, I mean, I, I think there is a question to be tackled, not so much about legacy systems having to go through the interconnection process again, but if you were to update a legacy system, you know, how would you approach that? And I think that might be something that we tackle in the DR docket as well, because that's more of a technical question. But again, I think the principle would apply as well if it's benefiting. And so an updated legacy system would likely benefit the grid more than an old system would, then it should be expedited. And if I could just to answer from a previous question about just timelines in general, I think, you know, for especially for these kind of 89% of systems uh, that are under 10 kilowatts, especially if they're kind of minimal impact or beneficial to the grid. Ideally, I think it should be applied for and installed and turned on within a day, if not a couple of days. And then, you know, any other systems, especially smaller systems at that side should be no more than a week. 
um, uh, or five business days would be an ideal in a kind of perfect world. Great, thank you. All right. All right, so in response to Commission IRs 9 through 11, the DER parties proposed several metrics and scorecards for consideration. Two of those targets are one, the average cost of DER, DER interconnection, and two is the number of pending interconnection requests with cost estimates and current status, including the track, they include the tracking of cost for interconnection. My question is, is what value does tracking HECO's costs for in interconnections provide specifically and overall? Apologies, sorry. I've um, so uh, again, I think that the general goal here um, that we've always uh, approached this was the idea of trying to reduce costs and provide a benefit for everybody. And so I think the idea of trying to um, reduce and understand HECO's cost for interconnection is important because some of the steps may not be necessary in trying to uh, further that, uh, bring that down, uh, both from the customer point of view and from the utilities point of view is something I think would be incredibly helpful on a going forward basis. So again, for example, uh, let's move to a away from a conditional approval state where before you had to apply for approval, but instead essentially allowed a customer to go ahead and apply, uh, go ahead and to interconnect, build, and then once they actually have something they actually applied as it was built, it was primarily from an efficiency perspective, it reduced their costs. They had less review to do. It was an easier and faster process for them. So, I mean, it's just an example of how efficiencies can occur, particularly if it's something you're tracking and monitoring. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. That was helpful. All right, so I think um, you guys are off the hook for now. Um, so thank you very thank much for you your responses. I appreciate it. Thank you. Glad to give lunch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Great. Um, I'd like to uh, move to the consumer advocate. So uh, Ms. Roberto, there you are. Great. I can see you. you're up on the screen. Um, let's let's have some fun. Um, I'm going to start off with the scorecards and metrics. Um, a couple of questions about potential metric or potential metrics or scorecards for you. So a potential affordability, affordability metric or scorecard for consideration is the number of customers in arrears by number of days, for example, 30, 60, 90. Could this metric adequately capture affordability? And if if this would be an appropriate scorecard, not just a metric, but a scorecard, how would you determine a baseline? So I am going to uh, ask Dean and Ben to jump in here as well, and they can just let me know when or how. Uh, I, I would say that arrearage is, is a less than perfect metric, but it was the best we could come up with. Um, our view on arrearages is that uh, if someone is unable to pay their bill, that's an indicator that it's not affordable. Um, how long they're in arrearage is an important indicator. Is there a program available to help them dig out um, a payment plan, uh, some some way to shorted, shorten that time in arrearage? Um, as far as setting a target, um, I think you don't want anybody on an arrearage plan. <laughs> I, um, I'm not sure how to set the ideal target. I I think we really viewed it as a metric, as important data to watch. Um, mm -hmm. Dean or Ben, you have both been very much a part of these conversations. Uh, what am I missing or how can we uh, enhance that? Hi, this is Dean. If I can add, I know in discussion with a number of other offices of the, um, there's a National Association of State Utility Consumer Advocates. That is one of the, the, the metrics that is has been discussed and, and many other jurisdictions are trying to ensure that there's a comparability of data as it relates to arrearages. Um, as Cheryl mentioned, it's not a perfect metric, but it is something that can more or less be objective and verified in terms of 
um, number of customers in our beverages. I, I think, you know, in, in the context of some of the discussions we've been having in some of the other proceedings, such as energy burden, um, you know, there is the um, that information as well. Um, I, I think there's a little bit of uh, hesitancy on my part in terms of looking at energy burden in terms of affordability, especially for the low income customers because I've seen different data from different sources that suggest that the energy burden for customers in Hawaii could be as low as, I, I think it was 11% um, give or take um, for those customers that are at or below the poverty line. Uh, and I've also seen some data that suggests that the energy burden may be as high as, I think it was around 44% give or take again for Hawaii customers. So um, I, again, you know, with, with respect to pointing out what might be a good metric and scorecard. Um, the arrearages was seen as something that could be objective. In terms of a, a target, you know, given that other jurisdictions are trying to also look at uh, arrearages as a measure of affordability, there would be that opportunity to look at other jurisdictions to determine whether or not what we see in Hawaii is uh, to, to for, for lack of a better term, whether or not Hawaii's experience with arrearages is reasonable compared to those other jurisdictions. Thank you, Mr. Nishina. That's very helpful. I appreciate it. Um, all right, so I'm going to jump on to the next question, which is a very similar one. So a potential metric or scorecard for consideration is the number of customers under a payment arrangement. Could this met met metric adequately contribute to the affordability outcome? If this were to be used as a scorecard, how should a baseline and metric be developed? So we see those two operating together. Um, mm -hmm. the, the arrearage we would hope would trigger an action by the company to put somebody on a payment plan. Um, again, it's an informational type of uh, data point. Um, I suppose the goal could be that anybody on in arrearage is on a payment plan. I mean, so that would be a target of 100%. Um, and I, I will ask Dean to speak to whether or not that is a metric that may be available for peer review through NISUCA. Um, just to add, I haven't seen any data from the other jurisdictions with respect to the percentage of customers on a payment plan, uh, the the numbers or the data that we've we've been circulating has focused primarily on arrearages. So I'd have to reach out to the other um, jurisdictions to see whether or not they also have information on uh, payment plan. But like like, like Cheryl was mentioning, I, I think we do see it as sort of operating on two sides of the same coin. And to some degree, the the percentage of customers on a payment plan might also be considered as a potential measure of customer engagement in terms of making sure the company has reached out, uh, um, informed the customers of what their options are and tried to encourage that there is some sort of payment plan rather than customers believing that there's no option for them other than to just kind of throw up their hands in the air and give up. And, yes. and Commissioner, we, we could check uh, a number of the metrics that were suggested uh, came from our survey of metrics in other jurisdictions. Uh, so we could go back and check our notes and spreadsheets to find out what other jurisdictions may be tracking those two metrics as well, if that's helpful information. Yes, that would likely be very helpful. Thank you. Good. Uh, so um, let's see, so one more on the, the scorecards and metrics. Uh, so on page 122, table six of the initial statement of position, the, the, the CA, sorry, not California, but the CA <laughs> proposed a grid investment efficiency outcome with the metric of total dollars value of projects in which the utility seeks an NWA divided by the total dollar of projects undertaken in that year with a value over X. Does the CA support the notion that this should be a scorecard item? Alternatively, does the CA support the idea of incentivizing this outcome? Oh, sorry. I have the I SOP. Got, Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you for the question. I have the SOP up in front of me, but I didn't find it fast enough. So I may have to uh, ask Ben again to backstop me here. Um, 
we proposed it as a shared savings mechanism, I believe. Um, or did we not? Yes, we didn't. We didn't. OK, um, our, our position is generally that we start with collecting data. And if we get adequate data that we can establish a target um, that makes sense and the target could come from historical performance, it could also be informed by peer review across other utilities. Um, it can even be informed by adjacent uh, industries, maybe even you know gas utilities or water utilities or in the case of a call center, um, even different industries because they have comp common functionality. If we can identify a, an appropriate target, um, the preferred key core way the consumer advocate wishes to address incentives is shared savings. So identifying what savings would be achieved, and it's perfect for an NWA because that's the entire point. You go with the NWA because it's cheaper than the alternative. Um, so you have an easy, easy identification of the savings and then some share of that savings um, with the companies as an incentive. Um, and, and Ben, I'm calling to you now. If you uh, can help me, is there anything else that we need to fill in on that? Ben, are you muted? Uh, sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Um, I, I would just add maybe one small clarification was, w w which is that if this is with respect to the, you know, the ratio of um, projects for which uh, NWAs are sought, um, I, I'm not sure that that, you know, um, that in and of itself represents savings um, in other words i think it's it's not a, it's not an outcome um, that that's associated with savings um, it's a measure of process that could lead to savings and i think what what we're after is the savings that would come from the nwas themselves thank you ben i forgot what we were i'm so sorry it's been a while since we looked at that i think what we were in trying to do is look for a metric that told us how many times does a company try so the NWA as a shared savings obviously provides the savings, but we also wanted to have an, a little insight or window into how often does the company try to achieve an NWA? How many times do they look for it? So that, that's what that was for, and I apologize. I couldn't recall. Thank you both. I appreciate that. Great. Um, so I'm going to jump over to PIMS, and we're going to kick off with the DER asset effectiveness PIM. Uh, or SSM in the case of the CA, uh, the CA stated that the baseline should be informed and set by the IGP process. In the event that the IGP process cannot deliver a baseline output for the DER asset effectiveness, is there a proxy baseline that can be used? You, you got us thinking about that as you were asking the DER. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, I, and I'm afraid that we don't have greater insight. We we have been considering the IGP process as um, sort of the, the technical analysis, the technical potential analysis for what's out there. Now, what we may find out, um, and this is a question for the companies, is that um, they may have internal projections that they've used as part of planning that perhaps they could share earlier than a full full blown IGP process. Mm -hmm. um, but we didn't come up with anything in our little sidebar while you were asking <laughs> the DER advocates. Well, thank you. Thanks for working on it. I appreciate that. Good. Uh, so the, the next one still around DER asset effectiveness, and this is for clarification. On page 171 of the reply SOP, the CA states that due to the lack of better information at this time, the consumer advocate agrees with the notion that shared savings should be determined based on the difference between actual cost incurred and avoided costs. Is the CA stating that the avoided cost data would come from HECO's current methodology for calculating avoided energy cost as approved in docket number 7310 BNO 24086 
Does the CA assert that these avoided costs appropriately capture the system cost and can provide a reasonable baseline for establishing the value of DERs? Thank you for the com question, Commissioner. I am going to defer to the consumer advocate um, who can speak to this. Hi, um, thank you um, for asking that question, Commissioner Potter. I, I think as as we acknowledge in the reply statement of position, you know, due to the lack of, of better information, we were looking at the avoided costs. I would have to um, clarify though, um, you know, given that the calculated avoided costs for energy as, as set forth in the procedure that has been kind of modified over uh, more than a couple times over the years. I, I don't know that that would be the best proxy for all of ancillary services. Again, you know, it is calculating the energy costs rather than the grid services. So I, I think that's why we we're holding out that there is a need for uh, a more detailed analysis in the DER proceeding to better understand how we can better um, I guess, for lack of a better term, slice off um, each ancillary service and then determine the, the cost or value for each of those services. But in, in the absence of either the IGP process or the ability to do that detailed analysis, we, we, were, we were pointing at the avoided cost um, calculation. But uh, I guess I probably should have been a little more careful about the wording there because we still would probably need to perhaps try to parse out from that avoided energy cost what might be an appropriate portion of those avoided energy costs for the grid services. Mm -hmm. Thank you for confirming that. I was thinking that might be the case. <laughs> so, all right. So um, next question is uh, around interconnection experience. How should the commission determine the appropriate baseline for interconnection of systems that are greater than 100 kW? So, for example, IPPs. And following that, is it necessary to have an interconnection PIM for IPP since the commission has been using PIMs to incentivize steady progress on commercial operation dates in the competitive bidding for a proceeding? And so there might be some redundancy there. Thank you for the question, Commissioner. I'm going to ask Ben Havamaki to respond. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, as far as uh, an incentive for interconnection of systems greater than uh, 100 kW, um, I, I would actually res respectfully defer that question to the consumer advocate. Um, but I would I would take up your your second question, which is uh, of the necessity for incentives for interconnection of IPP systems, um, or sorry, systems through IPPs. Um, I would just comment generally that that um, the consumer advocate, I, I believe, would would raise uh, the the question of whether the existing incentives already uh, in place for uh, uh, for those contracts aren't aren't sufficient to uh, in, incent the companies to interconnect, uh, you know, in a timely way. But I I would. Uh, I would ask the consumer advocate to, to speak to the 100 kW plus systems. Um, th thank you. If if I can, I I mean just to echo what Ben just said. I, I think you know this this might highlight the need to ensure that any PIM that we create is properly um, properly designed so that it doesn't duplicate, say, perhaps another shared saving mechanism or PIM that the commission may give on, say, the total. Um, on the total project as a whole. Um, I, I don't know that we should be trying to create uh, a PIM for interconnection versus a PIM for getting contract approval um, as, you know, say before the end of the year. It's, it's something that needs to be coordinated. And I don't mean to take it um, into a, a rabbit hole, but I would suggest that, you know, we, uh, when I say we, our office has uh, proposed certain considerations of, say, having a site um, pre-designated, having the interconnection study performed prior to even going out to bid, so that at that point, it's it's not really a matter of trying to incent the company or to encourage the company to expedite interconnection studies and the interconnection process itself. It's actually just a matter of trying to uh, on the PA with the um, 
independent power producer who may have won the bid. So I, I think that would potentially mitigate the need for an interconnection PIM, but to the extent that we don't have that, it any PIM for or SSM for interconnection, I think, again, needs to be um, designed within the context of any other PIM or SSM that may be granted for a particular um, uh, uh, RFP or, or a project that may be proposed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nishina. I appreciate it. All right, so last one for you all. Um, so on, on page 128 of the initial statement of position, the CA, this is a review process question, a review of the PEM process question. Sorry, I should have put that. So the, the CA states that, quote, rather than trying to craft exceptions to any PEM or SSM for an ex unknown exogenous event, the consumer advocate contends that the review process should consider when necessary, the impacts that exogenous event may have and the impact on any calculated incentive. Does the CA have any recommendations for how to make this review process less discretionary in the annual review of PEMS so that the companies will have some assurance that the review process will not be arbitrary? Uh Commissioner, thank you for the question. I'll, I'll give it a start and then I'll ask Dean to fill in. We consider that language to be almost um, a force majeure kind of opening. Um, so the commission has great experience in prior instances when forces beyond the control of the company um, were needed to, to be taken into account. Um, for company performance. Um, so I, I think that the language you're looking at was our attempt to say um, there are always circumstances that could be outside of the, cost of the company's control that have to open the door to the commission's discretion. Um, we do not see the annual review process as, as a wholesale review um, to overturn what's happening. We still think there needs to be a very gradual move, but the idea is um, we should learn from our experience. Um, we should correct if we're spotting inequities or unfairness um, or just plain ineffectiveness. Um, but it's something to be done over time in a way that doesn't undermine the company's ability to make longer range investments, whether those are in contracts or capital investments. Um, so we've tried to outline it as best we can, but the language you cite in particular really goes to um, a force majeure type of event. Um, and with that, I do want uh, Dean to weigh in to make sure that we're framing that as tightly as we can. Sorry, I, I, I just want to confirm that what Cheryl just conveyed is consistent with our internal discussions in the sense that it, I, I think it will be very challenging our guys to try to anticipate you know, some unknown exogenous events. So it is sort of um, the, the way, you know, Cheryl characterized it as, you know, just sort of a force, if, if it happens, you know, whether it's the commission, the company, or, you know, even our office could suggest that it's maybe a time to press the pause button and see whether or not that particular SSM or PIM may need to be reviewed in the context of that exogenous, extraordinary, unexpected event. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right, you guys are off the hook. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time and your responses. I appreciate it. Great. All right, I'm going to, uh, Mr. Chairman, how are we doing on time? Am I wearing everybody out or just keep trucking? Okay. Um, you guys aren't off the hook yet. <laughs> uh, well, I guess, is, would you prefer if we took a short break? Because, I, I mean, the other plan is I'm going to take it after you're done, I'll, we'll take a short break and then I'll follow. So do you prefer to do it now or, or just keep going? We still have like a couple of pages. So, <laughs> like, so um, probably Henry voted for a five minute break and that's okay. Then let's do five. Does that work? Five minute break. Okay. We'll reconvene at 4.05. Thanks Perfect. everyone. Thank you.
Okay, it's almost 4.05. Let's see, Commissioner um, Potter, which party do you plan to, uh, do you have questions for next? Uh, I'll, I'll ask uh, Ulu Pono. Okay, do we have Mr. Clay? I can do Blue Planet though as well. I'm Isaac's here. There's, there's Mr. Clay, he's here. Great. Okay, uh, let's proceed. Um, take it away, Ms. Uh, Commissioner Potter. Great, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Aloha, how are you, Mr. Clay? Doing well, thank you. Go ahead, go ahead. Thank you for everything you've done for this proceeding. It's greatly appreciated and duly noted. So a um, couple of questions for you today. Uh, it's all around the customer engagement PIM. So um, first off, want to ask, you know, Ulupono asserts that the expansion of a customer DER op op options indirectly promoted by the RPSA um, address the customer engagement outcome identified in the outset by the commission. This seems to address engagement, mainly through EOT, for, to a limited population of customers. Does Ulupono have any recommendations for PEMS? or SSMs that could be more equitable uh, in customer engagement or reach more of the population? So thank you for that question. Uh, I guess to continue my previous response when we when I spoke briefly about Hawaii Energy and some other potential customer engagement PIMs, for us, again, to be clear, we're not proposing that EOT is the only way, of course, to have customer engagement, nor are we saying that that's, that covers all aspects of customer engagement, but it is one very important way. And we do hope that certainly in time, the percentage of customers that directly affects as EV owners will go up dramatically. It's very small in the adoption phase right now, but technology uh, adoptions can happen in, in very short time periods, uh, 10 to 15 years it can increase exponentially. So that's a, a preliminary answer. But the more detailed one is, again, for us, it's what kind of customer engagement. We find that tallies of website hits or newsletters that go out or things like that just aren't very outcome-based. They're a tally. And I don't think that shows anything that's all that helpful. I think having the, the utility offer attractive programs for DERs to interconnect as well uh, as EOT, as electrification of transportation, both make sense. My example on the Hawaii energy front was, again, I, I don't think the relevant metric has anything to do with percentage of customers if you care about outcomes like energy savings. I would rather have 100 customers saving 50 kilowatt hours each than 1,000 customers saving one kilowatt hour each. So I think just looking at customer counts is problematic. I certainly don't have any uh, objection to things like the Hawaii Energy proposed PIMS that were suggesting that IR. In fact, for Ulupono's response, when we were asked in that IR which specific programs we would direct that IR, that uh, sorry, that PIM to, we gave a list that's based on our understanding of those that have the largest kilowatt hour savings of all the Hawaii Energy programs. Because again, customer engagement without purpose, without outcome, isn't interesting. But customer engagement that reduces kilowatt hour savings or increases kilowatt hour savings, increases abilities to interconnect, increases people's abilities to adopt EVs, all these things are solving problems for consumers versus just, you know, hitting them with a newsletter every week or something like that. I'm sorry, that's kind of a silly example, but just, just throw that in there. Great. Thank you. That helps. I'm I'm happy to hear that you're supportive of those Hawaii Energy pens. That's I, I am excited about those. So, um, just wanted to pick up on uh, really piggybacking off of what we just talked about. Uh, you know, Ulupono provides many arguments on as to how RPSA could meet several objectives identified as priority incomes by the Commission. 
uh, for the DER asset effectiveness, customer engagement, and interconnection, Ulupono appears to assert that RPSA would be able to specifically address these three, these three outcomes, but almost by proxy. What is unclear is how these priority outcomes would be achieved if not specifically and discreetly addressed as targeted and outcomes. How certain is Ulupono that RPSA would clearly and specifically provide incentives that address these outcomes? We have a great deal of confidence that they do address the outcomes. I agree with your characterization that in some ways it seems less direct. So the question is whether it's enough. And that's one of the things that, one of the reasons why we provide dollar values for these PIMs is show that there's real money involved and we're not dealing with a nonprofit. We're not dealing with municipally owned utility. We're dealing with a profit seeking utility that will take advantage of those opportunities. And I think it, it would it would make reason stare a bit to presume that they wouldn't. Um, are there other customer engagement uh, methodologies that could also yield benefit? Um, we've been, I think, clear from the start, although this is much earlier in the proceeding, that we're open to other suggestions. But again, we're looking for folks to suggest things that show a real benefit to the grid and to the customers beyond simply the action of outreach. I don't know if that was specific enough for you. I feel like I may not fully answer that. If there's more that you want to ask, I'm happy to try. I think your answer was yes. You have a, a great deal of confidence in the, the, the structure of RPSA that it can achieve these specific outcomes. Yes, thank you. Okay. okay. Um, so I think that's all I have for you. So thank you very much. Thanks for your input. Thanks for your hard work here. Thank you. Um, now I'd like to, to put Blue Planet on the hot seat. So um, Mr. Moriaki. Yes, thank you. Great. Um, these are kind of a blend of discussion around the interconnection and the DER PIM. Um, so I kick off to Pete. Blue Planet recommended, and it looks like a lot of people um, that agreed, that the DER and interconnection PIM were developed in the DER proceeding rather than in the PBR proceeding. Would these PIMs, once developed, be administered under the PBR docket, DER docket, or as standalone PIMs? Uh, I think it's uh, up to the commission to decide. <clears throat> um, when the PIMs were in the DR docket and in the RFP docket, excuse the acronyms, uh, were instituted, I think those were implemented in those respective dockets. Um, we, we could, I suppose, continue the development of the DR PIMs within the PBR docket and, and keep this docket open. Which I guess it's going to be open anyway for the annual reviews. Um, and all the relevant parties, at least the DR parties, uh, are the same in the DR docket as well as in the PBR docket. So um, I'm kind of amending perhaps the suggestion that we should move it to the DR docket uh, necessarily. Uh, wouldn't have to do that. Uh, we wouldn't have, sorry, we wouldn't necessarily have to do that. We could continue the discussion in, in the PBR docket, but I think that the key here is making sure we have a robust record and coordinate with the DR docket, otherwise, we might be working across purposes. Thank you. Okay, related to that question, what's the ideal timeline for development of these PIMs if they are considered in the DER docket? I would say as soon as possible. And Blue Planet's suggestion wasn't, you know, to defer this. I really dislike that term because it just suggests that we're kicking the can down the road. Um, I didn't use but, that word. <laughs> Right, and 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 you know, I raised in my opening statement that, in a sense, the Blue Planet has been waiting for real incentives uh, for utility performance since 2008, the the original decoupling docket. So we do not make this suggestion lightly. The the answer is as soon as possible. But um, stuff like interconnection, we are attempting to re envision that whole customer experience um, right now. And I don't see how you can simply come up with a PIM that, in Hiko's own words, may be mooted out or you know irrelevant or ineffective uh, in a couple of months. Um, and so, as soon as possible, and you know, my our intention is to keep keep on pushing uh, as much as possible, but to really add, uh, you know pay some focused attention to this. Excellent. So uh, another one, because you've been the, the filings have been fairly vague <laughs> in terms of, of what we we should be doing with this PIM. So um, this is a, a lofty question. So you know, bear with me. 
what should we consider as outcomes, metrics, and parameters for a DER PIM at a high level if we were to punt to the DER docket? Oh, which outcome on the DER? Yeah, on the DER for the DER PIM. What are the what are the kinds of outcomes? There's metrics. the DER asset effectiveness. effectiveness. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think a lot of discussions have focused on less so how many customers enroll in programs, although that, that's an important metric to keep track of. Uh, and more how many megawatts are deployed to provide grid services. So mm -hmm. you know we're at zero right now, literally zero. Uh, despite mm -hmm. all these efforts to get grid services going for DERs and going back to the original IRP docket, how do we integrate DRs into the system uh, and, and not make it an external factor? We're still at zero. So mm -hmm. um, we agree, Blue Planet agrees that the further downstream, I suppose, the upstream, depending on which way you're looking at it, in terms of actual megawatts deployed, uh, you know, the, the better. <clears throat> And I, I think we can only go up from here, you know, literally. Definitely. I think the accounting exercise is just going to be, that's going to be so telling, right? It's, it's, yeah, it's going to be good. So, um, so if the commission were to establish a PIM for interconnection in this proceeding, should the commission establish separate ben benchmarks for completeness renew, completeness review, conditional approval, and permission to operate? and include those as components in a single PIM for interconnection? So if I understand the question correctly, should we include all the steps? Yes, that's yes. correct. Mm -hmm. we, sure, we certainly shouldn't be piecemealing it and looking at the various parts of the elephant. What matters to the customer is how many days can I, can I simply turn on my system? You know, like comparing to any other consumer experience, can I drive the car off the lot? You know, can you give me the keys to the house? Um, and so that's what matters to the, the customer. Uh, I just need to emphasize in addition though, that rather than just looking at that system or that interconnection process as is with all these numerous stop start steps and those inefficiencies involved, we, all the parties in the DR docket are looking whether we can run those steps in parallel whether some of the steps are superfluous. And so, uh, you know, this goes again to the point that what we don't wanna do is establish an interconnection PIM that simply locks in the current inefficiencies. And that's why the, the, the current overhaul or re-envisioning of the interconnection process in totality is so important in the DER document. Great, thank you. So does, does, the, does Blue Planet support any metrics at all for customer engagement PIM? I believe you guys have been silent thus far. At this time, we don't have a proposal for that particular outcome. And you, you don't find any that you support at this time? Um, you know, we can take a look at the whole range of uh, proposals on the table. Frankly, it's been a little bit of a challenge to keep track of it all. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, not, not at this time, but we can follow up. Great, thank you. So here's a big one. So does the framework that Blue Planet has that Blue Planet does the framework that Blue Planet proposed reflect the innovation and flexibility that Blue Planet had envisioned when coming into this proceeding. The the framework meaning the uh, proposed framework that you've you've submitted in your proposals. So um, as Blue Planet has explained, um, we did our best given our limited resources, basically me and Mr. Benz. Um, to cover all the bases in this proceeding. Our primary focus has been on the revenue mechanisms just because it's so important to get that foundation right and to de-link uh, you know, utility profits from investment. And so as, as our statements reflect, um, that's where we had a lot of our attention. Now there's this whole other world of, of PIMS and how do you, you know, link up the incentives to performance. Uh, we have done our best to uh, provide suggestions, for example, on these fundamental PIMs regarding uh, renewables, greenhouse gases. Uh, we support those proposals on the table and we followed up specifically on the PUC suggestion and, and guidance to come to the table with a fossil fuel reduction PIM or, or you know, incentives to address that. And so, as you saw today, uh, we, we highlighted, we 
we have proposed a framework for addressing that, what we call overriding, overarching imperative. Um, as for uh, the totality of PIMS covering all the dozen you know, metrics or, or outcomes that the PUC has outlined, uh, we would support the continued development of all of it because all of it's important. Uh, but frankly, we, we have to take it uh, one step at a time as much as we can. Well, thank you. We appreciate all the work that you've put into this proceeding. So it's definitely been significant and you've been a real leader in this process. So thank you very much. And, and, and you know what? I just realized after all that, I, I may have not addressed your, you know, a question of do we believe it's, I, I forgot the exact word, transformative. Transformative or, yeah. flexibility. Yeah, and, yes. And um, we believe even what we have, uh, you know, pre presented is a great transformative start. And, and there's some key questions, both on the PIM side, you know, are we going to do these um, fundamental incentives regarding fossil fuel reduction or, or RPS acceleration? And on the revenue side, and we'll get to that tomorrow, of course. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Mariaki. Appreciate it. Thank you. Great. Okay. And I'm going to last, but certainly not least, um, well, I have a few for, we'll see how we do. Um, but let's um, put HECO in the hot seat now. And so I'm going to start with DER asset effectiveness. And so uh, I, will that be you, Ms. Sunsato? Yes, I hope. I don't know. Yeah, we'll go. <laughs> All right. The question is, um, Hawaii Energy is rolling out a customer-focused program for grid service technologies, installing smart devices in co commercial and residential buildings. With greater collaboration between HECO and Hawaii Energy, the pool of assets available to provide grid services could greatly expand. Has HECO considered incorporating these resources into a portfolio of grid services, which in turn could contribute to the DER asset effectiveness plan? Commissioner Potter, I was just gonna ask if I could defer to Mr. Kawanami on these questions. Yes, please. Thank you. Look, hello, Commissioner. Thank you for your question. Regarding the energies program that is providing basically a ready uh, grid service ready equipment we have contemplated we have thought about this and we do keep in connection with hawaii energy about how we can align ourselves to such opportunity right now the for lack of a better term challenge is we are trying to let the market speak in terms of how cheap we can get the grid services so our procurement process is done through the aggregator model so we don't specify please go we do not say hawaii energy is offering this type of offering and therefore aggregator you should go do this we, we don't do it that way we actually uh, mentioned to Hawaii Energy, the next RFP, perhaps we should mention that so that we can create some alignment to see if we can further drive the price. But today, uh, our aggregator methodology is, is slightly different. And further, if, I'm, if I may add one more thing, uh, we did used to have programs that drove a lot of these DR, demand response programs. There might be a nice hybrid where we can come up with a synergy of not penetrating the aggregator market, but a non uh, non existing classification, such as small medium business might be an opportunity for these type of collaboration uh, via program. Thank you. I appreciate the answer. I'm glad, glad to hear you guys are looking at other opportunities to collaborate. That's excellent. Um, so overall, what types of DER assets, and I, using assets like underline, not just you know solar and batteries, but other assets, including D, DR type enabled and, and smart automated communicating, you know whatever it is, um, <laughs> the asset that has what has Kiko considered that would contribute to the measurement or to contribute to the um, to yeah to the measurement of this PEM of the DER asset effectiveness PEM. We we were very technology agnostic. We were really focused on this PIM to be delivering kilowatts, megawatts in the various grid services that's being defined. So we were not uh, limiting if there is an aggregator or a program that we can deliver this through water heaters, air conditioners, building management system, electric vehicles. We are very much open 
to this opportunity to pursue this PIM as long as the first step is being met, which is a cost-effective solution that's being uh, proposed to us. Great, thank you. So I'm going to switch to interconnection now. Um, so the, the DER interveners, and actually you've already addressed this, but I'm just, for the record, I'm gonna ask it again. So DER interveners recommend that the commission adopt an interconnection experience PEM based on smaller system sizes at, less than, at, center, at system size intervals than 100 kW. The recommended intervals start at 15 kW and then between 15 kW and 50 kW and then between 50 kW and 100 kW. Does the company have data that captures the days and the completeness review, the conditional approval, and the permission to operate at each of these intervals. Thank you, Commissioner. I would like to pass uh, the mic back to Ms. Shinsato. Thank you, Commissioner Potter. Um, we, we do have that data. I don't have it on me right now, but we do have it. <laughs> um, but as I mentioned in response to an earlier question, um, the vast majority of our applications come in under that 10 kW size. Mm -hmm. So uh, we don't know if it would make too much of a difference in categorizing um, by system size like that. Great. Thank you. All right. And now I'm going to move to customer engagement. Uh, so please confirm that HECO's only proposal for a customer engagement PIM is the support of Ulupono's EOT PIM. I think Commissioner Potter is a kind of a global response to that for customer engagement. As I touched on during our presentation, we had an original proposal that was different. And after receiving guidance from the commission to explore and consider electrification of transportation for a potential uh, performance mechanism, we chose to adopt Ulupono's um, uh, electrification of transportation PIM proposal. Um, you know, that said, um, as we were talking through uh, the presentation, uh, to the extent that you know other PIMs has been raised by you know the commission through these various information requests, you know we've tried to answer as best we could, and certainly have openness to consideration of these proposals as we move forward. Um, just touching on the fact, as Ms. Um, Shelley Kimura had mentioned, you know some of that will need to go through some additional vetting to fully evaluate what those proposals could look like, as well as what awards would look like. Um, but that's kind of the high level uh, response based on our presentation. I'll defer to some of our subject matter experts if anyone has anything to add to that. Okay. Just to, to piggyback on that really quick, um, why? Why was that? Why Why did you move to support Ulupono's EOT only, take your PIMS off the table for customer engagement? Why was that a decision that was made? Um, it, so if I recall, I think our original proposal for was for an advanced meter um, type of count and based upon the commission's guidance in two respects. One, again, to consider something specifically for electrification of transportation. And at that time, we didn't have something. We had two reported metrics pursuant to the commission's guidance in DNL 36326. And the, uh, also the guidance we received from the commission to say, um, you know, as I think Mr. Mr. Clay was getting to, that we're not looking so much for kind of tallies or counts as much as real engagement. And based upon you know, what we saw from Mr. Clay's and Ulupono's uh, development of their electrification of transportation PIM proposal and where they saw it promoting different outcomes and engagement with you know, customers, as Mr. Clay mentioned, and things that we also saw, because as you know, in our own electrification of uh, transportation docket, we have proposals there. You know, the commission's asked us to, to enter into a pilot but certainly ways to engage customers in various ways to take advantage of the, the kind of grid services and other um, uh, services that EV could potentially provide to the grid. So for all of those reasons, we made the decision to move over and consider and adopt Ulupono's EOT PIM proposal. Thank you, Mr. Aoki, I appreciate that. Um, and, and furthermore, so the, the companies did propose two items for a school scorecard though, um, which one was the customer portal usage and two was an, a number of customers on a TOU rate. Somehow this all feels overwhelmingly in, inadequate. Why, why, were, why did we choose these only these two outcomes? 
So for the portal question, uh, Commissioner Potter, I, if I could uh, direct that to Mr. Kawanami, I believe he's the correct witness, um, but perhaps he can let us know. I'm trying to think of what the global answer. Why do we limit? I think the immediate answer is to uh, Mr. Aoki's presentation of how many reporting that we already do. And then we saw the value of what additional things that we are lacking. And one of them was the new up and coming customer portal that could truly provide the max and the necessarily valuation. So the combination of the global answer of having the various, I think Mr. Alki mentioned 400 or so reporting that we already have was the key decision to add. What else could we add to add value to the already existing platform, Commissioner? Thank you. Um, let's see. So I'm going to switch now to innovation. Um, and this is, let's see. Uh, this might be for tomorrow, actually. <laughs> I think this is for tomorrow. Well, actually, I'll finish with this one. Does the framework that HECO proposed reflect the innovation that HECO had in mind when it came into this proceeding? Similar to what I asked Blue Planet. And Commissioner Potter, uh, if I could defer that, uh, <laughs> I, I believe to Mr. Viola in the first instance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me take a crack at it. So, uh, Commissioner Party, yes, it does. What we propose is a comprehensive package. We believe it uh, embodies the innovation, the transformational nature of what was sought for in this docket. And, and in, in these respects, at least with respect to the PIM side, we think uh, Act 5, first of all, called for the development of PIMs um, to be uh, to tie more performance to our uh, to tie our uh, revenues more to performance. We think. The addition of the PIMs as the commission has designated on the emergent outcomes almost by definition will be transformational. So we think that's very important. We think the other aspect, and some of this is for tomorrow, I guess, but we think the other transformational aspect of this docket will be to break down some of the uh, inherent uh, CapEx bias in our framework. We think of being allowed to recover, um, you know, our uh, being allowed to defer and recover ex service contract type expenditures uh, will be transformational. We think as a, as a total package, uh, allowing the company to be rewarded uh, financially for achieving the priori priority outcomes that the commission has designated is definitely transformational. I said back in, I think, perhaps one of the first workshops, but I think a lot of what the company is doing now, a lot of the progress the company has made thus far uh, has been almost despite the framework. So we think by allowing a company, again, designating performance incentive metrics, so that we can be rewarded or, you know, as the case may be penalized on the kind of modern objectives, modern outcomes that the commission and all the parties in this uh, proceeding have identified as their priorities would be very transformational. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Viola. Great. All right. Thank you, Go team. Appreciate all your work on this, the voluminous work that you submitted to us. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so um, I, I think I'll finish up here with uh, City and County of Honolulu. Hi, Mr. Rold. Um, so you had, uh, it was a question and clarification on the DER asset effectiveness, PEM. Um, you, you noted in it, you called it a DER penetration, PEM, and you, you stated a percentage of DER services penetration. Can the city clarify that the percentage of grid service penetration is the percentage of grid services that are provided by DERs? Um, thanks for the question, Commissioner Potter. Um, I think we're open to different interpretations of that and hadn't yet really come down to a definitive, um, you know, um, uh, formula for that. Um, the key is we wanted to sort of get a handle on, in terms of DER effectiveness, you know, you know, how many DERs, whether they're DERs or grid services, how many were actually, you know, cost effectively being utilized to achieve the system goals um, of grid services? Okay. Sounds pretty consistent. Great. Thank you. All right. And with that, uh, Chair, 
Chair, I will turn it back over to you and thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, and just an update for the group here. We're gonna, I don't think my section here will take too long. I, I ask your uh, patience that we'll forge through the rest of the day and complete this panel so we can start with the revenue mechanism panels tomorrow. Um, and so with that, I'll start and just to give you a kind of heads up, I've, I've organized my questions primarily by topic. So first talking, looking at our first question on the DER asset effectiveness, Pim, and the various answers there. Uh, moving to interconnection experience, RPSA, and I think I then have a couple broader base questions. So just so you can understand where we may be going here. So the first question I have is for Hawaiian Electric team on your proposed PIM, sorry, your proposed shared savings mechanism for DER asset effectiveness. Um, if I understood it right, it was basically a continuation of the structure, whether it was a procurement or a program of shared savings that we've done for grid services. Uh, I just want to confirm that, but more importantly, I want to understand when you expect the next round of those to happen. As, as I understand it, there's no new grid services procurement uh, slated in the near term. Um, there's programs under discussion development for uh, in the DER docket, but I just want to get some, if we were to put this in place in a decision order by the end of the year, when would we actually see a proposal um, for one of these to take effect? So I'm not sure if Yo is the correct person or Colton or some combination, I'll, I'll let the HECO team. But again, when, when would we see the next round of these kinds of services that this PIM would, or shared savings mechanism would apply to? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. This is Yo. Uh, to answer your first question, you are correct. This performance incentive mechanism is closely uh, mimicked from the original PIM that's been uh, approved by the Commission to us in the grid service procurement process. And it's it's a continuation of sort, yes. Your second question regarding when, uh, when we'll be seeing the next set. Right now, we have two grid service purchase agreement that qualifies for the PIM that is being considered under Commission and the negotiation we have one more aggregate aggregator contract that's being currently negotiated and that will be submitted the third point of the next after the second procurement process we we did not fulfill the entire picture of megawatts that we were looking for uh, from the second rfp this contracts that we've submitted to the commission for budget approval doesn't fulfill all the megawatts so we do need to look at that we need to work with Colton's team to see uh, the potential of any additional good service that may emerge through the IGP process. We, we do want to time it uh, accordingly and be able to figure out when will be the next RFP that we would go forward. And as I vaguely alluded to with Com uh, Commissioner Potter is, is it the procurement process with the aggregator, the only option going forward, working with Hawaii Energy, perhaps there might be other options as well too. So we are, and your final comment was, we are working on a DER program track. We wanna align all those things this year and have a plan of when we would be issuing and requesting for megawatts that would align to this pin going forward. Oh, uh, Ms. Chai, were you going to, I just to maybe, clear, maybe, I appreciate, uh, that's all helpful context. Let me try to make it more specific. Would we see anything in 2021 that may fall under this, either of these categories? I would say yes. As we are, um, the current aggregator is not sufficient. We need to do another RFP or another program or another solution to make sure we have the good service needs that we are being solicited by the IJP. Uh, I'll ask uh, Mr. Ching to to uh, discuss about the IGP planning cycle. But yes, uh, Mr. Chair, we, we will have a 
2021 activity based on this pin. And, and Chair Griffin, just to this is Colton Ching, just to add to what Mr. Kawanami just said, um, the IGP process is, is underway, and uh, what Mr. Kawanami referred to is, you know, IGP is looking. Uh, for that sort of next tranche beyond beyond the near term, and we expect uh, that based upon the grid needs that we're in a process of identifying now, uh, acquiring grid services from a range of resources, included distribu including distributed ones, uh, will be part of the IGP resource plan going going forward. Uh, but that's still in the works. Uh, the question about near term, right, as it applies to the PIMS, I think that's more towards the gap. The gap grid, gap grid services. I have to be careful how I pronounce that. The gap <laughs> grid services uh, that that Mr. Kawanaki, Kawanami identified. We may have some opportunities to look for that in combination with grid services that um, the commission directed us to actually acquire and leverage through other procurements, including things like our CBR uh, phase two. Uh, RFPs that are currently in the works right now, uh, and then you know there might be one-off um, procurements, smaller procurements, not so much driven by integrated grid planning, but that happens uh, because we see a need for, um, say, a distribution system upgrade, and we could be going for grid services from DERs uh, to fulfill that. That may not be triggered just by something broader and longer term like uh, IGP. I think to the extent that we can leverage those opportunities, uh, we, we'd like to use those procurements um, uh, for consideration in this as well. Thank you, Mr. Ting. Maybe just to put it, um, so what I heard was pro probably uh, opportunities identified through the IGP, and then there's some interim period. Uh, Mr. Kawanami gave a, a fairly firm answer about activity in 2021 can you confirm that or i mean what i also note is we just issued a substation order where we you know lamented the fact that there was no non-wires alternative um from the filings that came before us there's another one upcoming uh there's several larger battery systems you know for us now so where i mean it seems like there's still opportunities in this interim period so are you able to confirm that we would see more activity in 2021 yeah for the short term yeah at the very minimum for the gap that mr kawanami identified what we had earlier sought to acquire versus what we we did acquire has that been documented in any IR response or plan filed with the commission I I I don't know off the top of my head. I'll defer to others if they on the HECO team if if they know. This is you. Uh, we we have not we have not created a summary of the first RFP, second RFP, and, and it's mainly because we have not completed all of our negotiations, and we uh, we're trying to finish the current negotiation, and and then we can really create a summary of the gap that's in place and be able to provide that to our our to the independent observer and quantify that this is what we need to do for the next rfp um okay well i think that's that's helpful i guess a further documenting what those plans are i think would be helpful for us to understand what the interim period would look like i think you know you heard a lot of the discussion today the questions from staff and my uh, fellow commissioners you know talking about where i also see the gap is you know in these questions about how many existing der's are providing services so i think we're you know the intention here of this pim is to provide a strong incentive for the for the hawaiian electric companies to go after these resources, you know, both for new customers, but particularly for the ones that are existing, you know, the 80,000 plus customers that have DERs today and participate in these programs. So I think we're, we're, I think we're all, we're, 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 we're 
we're not wanting to delay. We're trying, we're wanting to urge um, active expansion and enrollment of these resources. That was the whole idea of this to begin with. So I think if you can help us fill in what those near term plans are, that'll help us in our trying to resolve you know, working on this PIM. But I, I appreciate all those comments um, and to extent we can follow up and further fill in those plans that will help us. Uh, so maybe if I can uh, shift gears with a similar question to the consumer advocate. So I'm not sure if Mr. Roberto or uh, Mr. Nishina, but basically you're, when I look at table one, uh, you're proposing a similar structure, shared savings, uh, mechanism for DER asset effectiveness. And based on what you just heard, um, are you comfortable with that timeline that that will provide a strong incentive for the utility to move forward with these? Or I think or I'll just say my concern is that, you know, this would be something that we really won't see action on for several years out. And so I just, I want to, um, based on your proposal here, you know, are you comfortable with the responses that we just heard? start um, if Cheryl or Ben have something to add, but I, I think um, what I'm hoping that uh, the step that we can take in this initial I'm sorry. Dean, can you, um, oh, you I'm sorry. Time? Yeah, we're having a hard time hearing you. I'm sorry, my mic was up instead of okay. down. Can you hear me yeah. better now? Yeah, that's better. Thank you. Sorry, I apologize. Um, so I, I just was what I was saying was I, I think by pointing at the IGB process that that almost by default adds time, and hearing um, what Mr. Kawakami was mentioning does raise some questions. And you know we have been, um, as the commission is aware, in some of the the proceedings before the commission, um, you know asking the IRs in terms of what type of um, non wires alternative other solutions are being looked at, and I think you know it, it will probably be incumbent on on the commission and or other interested stakeholders who may be participating in some of those dockets to continue to push um, consideration of some of those non-wire alternatives instead of just waiting for the IGP, because otherwise, as I, I think your your concern is stating, um, uh, correctly stating, that we may not see something for a year or two. And I, I'm not sure we should be waiting that long, because um, there are opportunities now um, to evaluate alternatives and we should be looking at those alternatives, especially if there are cost effective alternatives. Okay. So is that a uh, you feel comfortable with the responses you heard or you would maybe like to see more urgency or at least a better clear picture of what this interim period period looks like? Yes, I think again, if if it's not going to be in the application themselves, I I can tell I can tell you with commitment on our part that you know we'll be asking the questions in those applications in terms of why the company isn't considering um, non wire alternatives or other options because you know that that is the guidance the commission has been given, and given some of the you know information that is out there in the market, we really should be looking at those things. So you know again, just waiting for the IGP, I think was something that we. Uh, offered in terms of needing to recognize that it's it's good to look at it holistically, but in the absence of having that process completed, we, we shouldn't just be waiting on the IGP. We, we really do need to kind of um, consider what options we have in, in front of us as soon as possible. Okay, thank you, Mr. Nishina. I think the only thing I would add is maybe more of a comment than a question is um, concern of by the time we get the application, it's hard to do much course correction, correct? There's, I know that, I mean, I can appreciate the companies have put a lot of time in, but to you know, press pause and wait for other things to trans, uh, transpire is a challenge for everyone. So I think that's on our side, the interest in wanting to see things move forward sooner so that these kinds of non wires solicitations, grid service solicitations can take effect before the application for the traditional solution comes before us. Then we have confidence that you know, we've we've given the market opportunity to offer an alternative. But if we wait until the application, um, that's where we have repeatedly been challenged. And I think that's the concern about seeing the timeline for some of the upcoming ones. Um, so again, we're this is where 
the the hope is that these are the incentives that will help spur that action and so i think to the extent that we can see the clear picture in the near term that'll help us understand what we can do uh in this upcoming decision so i just i just, do you, do you agree with that mr nishina just the need for that action to happen ahead and in parallel prior to receiving applications no that point is well well made uh chair i, I the, the struggle i have is um we're not always privy to know what projects the the company may have on the table and being able to kind of provide some course guidance prior to the application i, I think as as the hiko witness mr kawanawi was mentioning in terms of um, trying to rely on a market response I think it, it does make sense to try to provide the company some incentive or to encourage them to engage in that market response prior to the application being filed rather than after the application is filed. Okay, thank you, Mr. Nishina. Um, I want to uh, move over, uh, ask similar questions to Blue Planet, Mr. Morawaki. Yes, thank you. Uh, and then the DER party is following up on that. But just I mean, hearing our conversation here, the interest in expediting more of this activity in this area, I was surprised for Blue Planet and some of the others to be recommending that we at least move. I think you're trying to be careful to say it was not a delay or defer, but move the work on these DER related PIMs into the DER document. <laughs> Um, I guess my practical response to that is there, there will probably be delay as a result of that, just because that agenda is quite full also. Right. right. Um, and so, you know, in the context of the discussion that you just heard, which I believe your organization has supported, you know, right. aggressive right. pursuit of these resources and the need for incentives. Um, and, you know, I've, I've heard the conversation throughout the day. I think what we're looking for is how do we not, how, how do we make sure this interim period, there's still opportunities for the companies to move forward, have the right incentives in place. And so I, I think I can understand that there's a feeling that it's not the ability to have the perfect PIM in place. So I guess my, my question is, you know, what are some logical interim steps that we can take with a decision by the end of this year for six months of next year that will yeah. <laughs> provide stronger impetus in this area. Thanks. Uh, if I could clarify, when you're referring to an interim period, is that an interim pending the development of PIMS down the line, uh, more developed? PIMS? Correct. All right. I mean, uh, I'm in both the PIMS and, you know, the uh, at least conceptual market activity that we just heard um, that's supposed to be documented further um but you know just in the course of that docket you know you at least have to think it's going to be several months from now before things are ripe for any sort of decision making um so that would well based in my head i'm thinking inevitably some point further into 2021 um by the time plans take place you know that's a good year that goes by so what again what are the let's how do we yeah. not lose time here i guess is and i think we're something that because it's come i think we're all working on it and i think we're trying to the commission is trying to encourage that we all continue and not lose the opportunity right um, and thank you for talking on this it's, it's really helpful and to the extent that the PIM, uh, the puc is looking at PIMs to carry us over uh, in an interim fashion, while we continue to develop more robust PIMs based on more data, uh, a fuller vetting, Blue Planet doesn't want to get in the way of that for certain. And, and it's not just delay for delay sake, obviously. Um, and so if there are interim steps that we can take, put in a PIM right now, to address these upcoming solicitations, for example, uh, we would support that. Um, and you know, it, it's not what we don't want to see, though, is a situation where 
there's this comprehensive order announcing all these PMs and then the PC effectively washing their hands of the situation for the next five years. Uh, I just don't think that's realistic uh, given you know, the, the, the need to continually push this uh, on, on all fronts. <clears throat> so uh, with regards to this NWA situation, um, yes, uh, that should be a requirement regardless, but I understand we're talking about PIMs here. And to the extent that a, a PIM that encourages a, a solicitation or a real inquiry into NWAs would, would help incrementally, you know, we, we would support that. Um, I think the DR's, DR party's position is that that's not going to be the end all because there are a lot of incentives behind a 20 year or several decade investment in a big substation uh, that we have to overcome. Uh, nonetheless, an interim PIM addressing these types of things to make sure we keep on moving forward um, is something that Blue Planet would support. Okay, thanks. Uh, let me just turn basically similar line of questions over to the DER parties. Mr. Harris, Mr. Giese, you've heard, um, let me try and formulate it more specifically, but, uh, yeah, but think, I mean, I think what the proposal on the table from Hawaii Electric that is largely supported by the CA is a shared savings type mechanism. Um, and again, that works when you have consistent programs and, and procurement. And I think my concern was that if that was all going to be tied towards IGP that you know, we're talking about a while out, we have other upcoming solicitations. Uh, Mr. Kawanami talked about continuing need for grid services. Um, so it's either further solidifying that timeline, as well as developing other incentives or providing some other alternative in the near term. Um, again, the concern was that the response from the parties was to delay or sorry, to defer into a different docket, which likely would lead to delay. Um, I just want, if there was a more certain near term path, would that be something that your your party would support? Thank you, Chair. Um, echoing some of what Isaac indicated, I think we would support, um, I wouldn't want to call them interim, but um, PIMs that moved us directionally uh, to try to get momentum going with the idea that need to be reformed, I think, in the near future. Uh, we recognize that there may be some transformation moving from a uh, purely procurement approach to a programmatic, and that's really gonna be a different kind of look. And sometimes these are gonna be complementary, and sometimes they may be uh, competing with one another, and, and that's a decision that may shape some of the PIMs. Um, in addition, um, looking at, I, I think I want to be careful in saying that we, we support the development of PIMs specifically, but we are cognizant that by themselves, they're probably not going to create radical transformation. We've seen, for example, Con Edison in New York deliberately take the penalty in part because they just didn't see uh, the upside to be high enough for them to change behavior. Um, and so there is some transformational things perhaps being discussed tomorrow that will also be an equally important part of the conversation. Um, the um, concept of moving forward with shared savings, again, we think that's generally a positive uh, flag to put down regardless. However, we don't think by itself shared savings necessarily uh, is transformative. Again, I think it's a um, low risk mechanism to proceed forward with, um, relatively speaking. Um, and it can certainly supplement other efforts, and, and it's a good one to have in place. But I think if we leave it purely to shared savings, I think what we've seen nationally is very little movement in NWA programs, uh, in part because the shared savings wasn't deemed high enough. And you know, as, you, as you stated, it may be difficult to find what the baseline is to compare to. Um, uh, I can go on further uh, specifically on shared savings, but again, we do think it's a it's an important thing to have in place, but sort of recognize it's a tool that has to be used in association with other tools. Okay, well, I, I, that's well taken. I guess just to confirm, but waiting to resolve some of this is not necessarily going to help, correct? 
I think um, I would agree with Mr. Moriwaki's comment, which is if the intent is to set a somewhat permanent PIM that's going to be in place for the next 10 years or some period of time, then we'd rather try to craft that PIM carefully. The idea is to try to motivate or stimulate activity over the next year or two. We'd certainly support that approach with the idea that, you know, we would um, have to be iterative about sort of developing a more permanent PIM. Okay. Thanks. I appreciate it. And, and presumably, is, is it, well, I want to presume, um, similar perspective on interconnection? Uh, correct. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, my next set of questions have to deal with the RPSA. Uh, the first question is for, for the first set of questions for Hawaiian Electric, some of which was covered earlier uh, we'll get to the table that colton brought up but the first question has to do with um i'm just reading off of Hawaiian electric's position on page 256 in your reply sop i think this question's target uh, uh should go to mr aoki first maybe it says while the companies are in general support of the lupono rpsa proposal and believe that rewards for accelerating RPS results provide proper incentives to the companies. The companies do not believe that the methodology for calculating compliance with RPS should be modified prior to 2025. I just want, and, and right, if I'm understanding your proposal right, you agree in concepts, but the baseline to 2025 should be based on the current, um, current definition of the RPS as it is in statute today using the net sales. And then converting over and uh, starting 2025. Is that first? That's I'm correctly stating your uh, position on it. So I'll, Mr. Aoki. I'm sorry, <laughs> Sir Griffin. But if I could also direct that question to Ms. Deha Matsushima in case she has any additional input on sure. that. Whoever, I mean, whoever on your team is the most appropriate. Thank you. Chair Griffin, that's correct. We're proposing that um, for RPSA to use the current mechanisms until 2025. And then assuming that the issues that we've discussed in our uh, RSOP and SOP are resolved by that point, then switching to the new calculation. Okay, that's helpful. I just wanna clarify though, that this is a, this is not a change in statute. This is language to apply an incentive. Correct. When I hear compliance with RPS, we're not our our your compliance would still be based on the statute. This the what Ulupono is proposing is just the basically the baseline for incenting performance. And so I don't see them as one and the same. Correct. We're not seeing that they're necessarily one and the same, but the the companies are already on an aggressive push to far exceed the current provisions of RPS. And I think, as you know, you know, these, especially utility scale projects take a long time to implement, right? The developers have to find locations, design projects. Um, we have to run an RFP, then those projects have to be built. Um, many of which are, you know, multi-million dollar projects and they require the construction industry permitting uh, lots of different agencies and, um, companies within the state of Hawaii to all be in line. And so we see it as really, you know, our commitment from what is, you know, now until 2025 is pretty much set in terms of what can be done. And after, you know, we can we can change that, we can further increase the speed of things uh, under the new definition of RPSA after. We also recognize that, uh, you know, we're in a current economic decline due to COVID-19 and that has you know, some effects on development as well. And so uh, our proposal is um, that you know, we should be incentivized for increasing and um, meeting, exceeding the current RPS standard uh, as it is today based on, you know, the, the path that we've been going, which is to exceed and um, go far beyond what is currently in statute. Okay. So you're saying it's not you, you're you're saying you should be judged on the thirty percent up until twenty twenty five, and then 
adjusted upwards then as Ulupono proposes. Can, sorry, uh, no, no, I'm sorry, I have that first, wrong. You, it's based on the, sorry, I see this why. Uh, which, it's the, the net sales, sorry. How the percentage is calculated. Um, so let me address that in a second. We showed your IR response earlier today. I hope I don't mess this up, but I have a version of it Okay, so this um, this is the table uh, that this is your IR response table or attachment one IR forty six. Um, and what I've done, if you'll um, indulge me for a second, I haven't double triple checked, but this little calculation down here, I've added. This is the corrected RPS percentage um, based on column J. So this is your total renewable generation for, uh, estimated through the time frame uh, over total sales. So I understand this is these are the these are the total renewable percentages based on the schedule of development that you have. And so from here it's uh, estimated 32%, and uh, as was brought up in the questioning later, you see a big jump in 2025. Um, but what I look at here is in each of these years, according to the information you supplied to us, by next year, you're already going to exceed um, the target level under Ulupono's definition. Um, and I, I totally understand your point that um, these projects coming online are not 100% certain, but from the information you're supplying to us, you're on track to exceed this funnel. So I guess, again, in line of wanting this incentive to incent exemplary performance, it seems like this is the target we should be going for. So can you please, I guess, any response to that? Uh, Chair Griffin, this is Colton Ching from Hawaiian Electric. I'm sorry, Becca. Uh, maybe to confirm some of the, the numbers and the equations in this table, uh, what this table uh, has in, in column A is, I'm sorry, in column B, what's labeled as the RPSA requirement. What we've done there uh, is showed based upon Ulupono's proposal, and maybe in hindsight, we could have done a better job in labeling this column, but this just represented, represents the percentage uh, in this table in our calculation of, of the uh, payments, the, PIM, the incentive payments. Uh, we base the, the calculation uh, through for the first five years based upon um, the current statutory RPS calculation, but base the payments on achieving 31%, 32%, 33%, and so on of the statutory RPS in those years. And then we move to the RPS A def calculation uh, of RPS uh, for the for 2025 and beyond. So I just want to make that clear. It doesn't answer your question, but I just want to make clear what we did. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you're, you're qualifying, you know, you're this column here in the first five years is a larger number than you. So you would qualify for more. And I guess my point is, or my question is under your current projections, you're still expecting to exceed this target starting next year. Um, right. Or that's, this is just the, what I've calculated based on your information here. Yes, that is, that is correct. Okay, and then, all right, so glad you stepped in, Cole. I just, I wanna follow up on some of the questions earlier, uh, particularly the 2025 one. And so you confirmed earlier that this was kind of your team's planning assumption that the phase two projects would 
come up in 2025 versus the information that was supplied in the response IR response 47, which generally had them in 2022 and 2023. Is that correct? Yes, that is. Yes, that is correct. Well, you're saying the more updated information is the latter one. So you're you at least what the information the developers are provided to you, these numbers would shift up earlier in time. Uh, yes, it would tend to add renewable energy uh, earlier, at least from the stage two projects. The update for IR 47, though, also includes, uh, I believe, some changes in some of the stage one projects and, as well. And that may have some, it won't change the direction, but will have some offsetting as, effect as well. And okay, Ms. So Dayoff can elaborate on the specifics of that. She, she's got it down. Any elaboration? Yeah, I, I think, oh, go ahead. <laughs> I think that's correct. Some of the 2021 dates moved out, but all still within, um, with the exception of one, within the 2022 timeframe. So they'll still be before 2025, but um, some of the earlier numbers between 2021 and 2022 will adjust as well, as Colton noted. Okay. Um, one of the other, I think this is an observation I made. I just want to see if I confirm it. Um, based on the information you supplied in uh, the renewable status projects in IR 47 plus this table, it would seem to suggest to me that it's basically the build out of the phase one and phase two projects. You know, if those come online, those are what will push the utility into qualifying for the incentive. Is that a fair characterization? Uh, that's the majority of it. There's some other projects currently uh, in construction that will add to this as well. Two, right? If I remember right, there's two prior existing um, approved pro I mean, projects that are under construction now. Well, one on this island and one in PGV, correct? Um, there's, yeah, there's um, Nupomakani. Um, there's also a Malquafit one project, which is three and a half megawatts on Oahu, um, PGV, um, yeah, and PGV. So the three, those three additional projects. Okay, um, but if I'm thinking about this, and what is the incremental growth that will trigger the incentive? It's phase one projects, phase two projects. Any growth in DER that's assumed here. I guess I do have a question. What I didn't hear come up earlier was the phase two CBRE. Is that included here or not? Uh, Chair, the specific uh, scope of the, uh, is it stage two, phase two CBRE um, is not explicitly calculated in here. We can include that in the updated or supplemental uh, IR. We had a different assumption for CBRE and the uh, resource plan that was done in the March timeframe. Okay, but presume, I mean, assuming we all move forward on that quickly, some portion of that would show up during this, the multi year rate plan during the, you know, if I'm looking in the five year time window where this incentive is potentially in place. We would assume some of those projects would be additive to what you have here. It would okay. correct. It would be an increase from from what we have in here. Okay. Um, so again, I just want to. I again, when I look at this table, was very helpful for me in understanding. You know, if we look at kind of the baseline, Ulupono is proposed, and you know what is going to push the companies over that line. You know, it's it's really the pipeline of projects that are underway now. Pipeline of projects and programs is the way I would characterize it. Phase one projects, phase two projects, growth in DER and existing programs, any new programs that happen in that time frame. Um, what we have kind of in concept for CBRE that would would expect to happen in this time frame, plus whatever else comes along. 
but it's really the development pipeline that we're working through right now is this this incentive would apply to is that is that a fair characterization of it or am i missing something through 2025 that's correct okay and then you know and then obviously there's beyond that those there would be subsequent other development activities other programs so um Okay, that's helpful. Um, two, uh, two, just final questions for Hawaiian Electric. Um, Ulupono has said that uh, the RPSA should also provide a strong incentive for interconnection, um, really of of all types. Is that you? Is your position? Do you, do you agree with that? We do. They've also proposed yeah. shared savings for uh, interconnection costs of IPPs, though. So implicit in that seems to me there's an assumption that those costs are high. Is that if we were to dig into that further, how would that bear out? The cost of interconnection vary by project, so it depends on where that project is interconnecting, interconnecting and what is required. You know, obviously, if it needs a completely new switchyard and substation, then um, yes, the cost would be would be high. Um, other projects that are interconnecting to existing equipment would, you know, not be as high. So it, it really is project dependent on the cost of the interconnection facilities. Okay. Um, one final question. Uh, this is something out of all of our control, but it's a place we advocate before. If the commission were to put this RPSA incentive in place based on today's targets in the RPS and the legislature were to change that, um, the 40% in 2030 was to increase, say, 50 per to 50% or 60%. Of the companies thought through how, what your thought process would be with that? So if the bar moves up. What, what would you propose to happen for this incentive? Yeah, I don't think we've, we've thoroughly thought through um, what would happen to this incentive if the legislature were to, to move the bar. Um, I, you know, I think that's part of the reason why, you know, we're proposing um, reviews to, to happen periodically during um, the PBR docket to ensure that the incentives still align um, with with the the proposed PIMS. Um, I don't know, Rod or or Joe, if you have other thoughts. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't have anything to add on that. I'm not aware of anything either, unless uh, maybe Jim or, or Joe are. Yeah, just, I'll, there's probably, you know, Colton, I'm sure, could uh, um, answer this better. And I apologize. I hope my audio is okay. My The battery in my earphones died a few minutes ago. So um, I, I think that's a challenge, Chair, with any of the PIMs we come up with. If there's, if there's a material change in law, I mean, we can design things. Uh, based on the law and the circumstances and expectations today. And to the extent we can, we certainly should be looking forward to see if we can anticipate changes. Uh, if they're going to be a material change in law, I think we're going to we're going to have to come back and reset those. I mean, the whole goal here, I think, is to be um, have incentives that are aligned with state law. If state law changes, then we're going to have to come back in some form or fashion to revisit whether the PIM needs to be changed. I think that should be hopefully far, uh, you know, few and far between. I think that that counsels that our PIM design, our PIM tariffs are going to have to have um, something akin to what we suggest in the, in the um, you know, for a Z factor. If there's a material change in law, then I'm not going to say all bets are off, but we need to come back to the table and decide whether the PIM we designed before the change in law uh, still works or it has to be adjusted. So I think there would, there would need to be a process for that. Okay. I then we don't know what that that's speaking of unknown future, but I just want to just put the thought out there. Uh, 
Uh, that's all for Hawaiian Electric team on this one. I appreciate it. Thanks you guys uh, for putting the information together and being responsive. Uh, if I can turn over to Ulupono now on the RPSA, uh, Mr. Clay. Yes. Yes. Uh, Mr. Clay, me, I, myself as well, would like to thank you and your team for your guys' deep commitment to this docket and your work on this. Um, when you heard some of my questions, I, I just want to clarify um, because from what I've seen in your submissions, you've you've based your analysis on you know, the modeling results from the risk model uh, in the switch model um, and just for Oahu. And so when you look at this table where Hawaiian Electric is trying to project forward based on you know, the known projects in the queue, um, I mean, do you see it similarly that it's really the the pipeline of projects that we have today that will um, be the incremental growth that uh, trigger the incentive. Yeah, so that's the way you describe that is, is basically accurate. I, I think maybe as a precursor to that, uh, Chair Griffin, if I might, to be helpful, it seems like a lot of the questions previously to the utility were regarding what comes online and when. I just wanted to direct you again in the interest of being helpful to our RSOP exhibit D5, table one has all of the existing pipeline projects that we're aware of. It has the online dates via uh, uh, per the ECO plan and their filings and per our scenarios. And it has them all lined up side by side for every project, including CBRE phase one and CBRE phase two. Again, that's table one of exhibit D5. And then for your previous comments about resource plan additions and what goes up when, in that same exhibit D5, table uh, number three has again side by side the HECO plan next to Ulupono scenario 2.1. It's got the per year generating capacity online for combustion, large solar, wind, DERs, battery megawatts, and battery megawatt hours. So, again, just as a precursor, if you're curious about differences and assumptions between what comes online and when, and what type of resource is generating in a particular year. All of that's laid out in D5 in a very simple table. So if you ever want to compare that, it's available for you. Okay. Um, I think I know the answer to this already, but uh, it's been what you've been, you've been advocating the whole time. It seems to me that this, uh, to get to uh, Ms. Dehop Matsushima's question about, you know, this pipeline, there are a variety of different uncertainties uh, and the ability to bring this pipeline of projects online, all of all types. Um, but the, the incentive you proposed is to give the utility a very, very strong incentive to do what it can to bring them online, to do it sooner, um, to move things out of the way, which given you know, our, what we've seen so far, I think that that's where there's strong alignment from everyone. Um, so this, you would, I think, you would agree that this this aligns everyone's interest here to bring on cost competitive renewables, things that we have greater certainty about today than when we started two years ago. Um, we've done the solicitations, we're working through all of it. And so there's less, I don't want to, there's still a lot of, un, there's still unknowns, but it's less uncertain even than it was 12 months ago. Was that fair characterization? Yes, I think that's fair. And I would add that, again, to put myself in the utility shoes for a moment, if the RPSA PIM was in place, I'd be focused broadly on three things to try to maximize that value. The first one was already referenced in the questions to the utility, which is clearly to try to interconnect those phase one and phase two or, or RP1 and RP2 projects as quickly as possible. That's obviously one of the major ones. The other one, as I mentioned previously, is if, even if I were to believe that I couldn't move up the interconnection times of those RFP1 and RFP2 projects for various reasons, then I would really be focused on two other things, which is accelerating DERs, which means reducing interconnection times, because we know from the DER folks and Blue Planet, the demand is out there. So you'd cut the DER interconnection times, if at all possible, and we do believe it's possible. And the third one that we haven't even talked about yet, though you referred to it briefly in your question in PICO, 
is when does CBRE come online? When does it become big? We know that a lot more CBRE is authorized in phase two than certainly we presently have, and it's kind of been a slow rollout. But I would double down if I were the utility on how to accelerate CBRE as well and do everything possible because that could be a significant megawatt addition as well. So yes, to answer your question, I do think it's aligned, but I do think there are opportunities to earn those rewards. Okay, I appreciate that. Uh, just a couple other topics. Um, I think this is the questions, but I think it's more hopefully maybe trying to provoke some thoughts and ideas as you do your final filings and provide further feedback to us. Um, one, just something to think about is that the delivered, put it this way, delivered KWH does not necessarily mean kind of full optimization use of the resources and, and optimization, full optimization of grid operations. Um, and I'll just use a, a, a simpler example. You know, if we have dispatchable solar generation, presumably that could be shifted at any point to some other point in the future, but there's going to be higher value times than others. Um, and there are other types of grid operating constraints that have sometimes been, um, we've had lengthy discussions about. And so the incentive will provide a strong incentive for the utility to deliver energy. Um, I think still wanting further confirmation that it will help us optimize all of the resources. And so, you know, in your position, you said this is about uh, achieving the RPS goals at lowest price. And so I think it, I think these largely overlap, but I don't think it's always a one for one match. And so just your thoughts on how the commission can make sure that these resources that we are we, we potentially provide incentives for are truly optimized versus just delivered. Well, I think it's fairly clear that as the RPS goes up, it's going to be more important to move those kilowatt or megawatt hours around, obviously from daytime peak solar to, for example, the five to nine peak. So the more renewables we get, the more necessary is I think we've kind of discussed lately, grid services and non-wires alternatives will be because those are the tools that allow you to use the renewable energy and not curtail it or waste it. So really grid services and non-wires alternatives allow you to balance the grid better and balancing the grid better allows you to make use of those renewables and not curtail them, uh, whether you're paying for them or not, whether you've got the kind of a fixed price capacity kind of payment contract or not, we want that kilowatt hour to come from renewables, not from fossil fuels. It's not just about what the developers get paid for. And we do think that grid services are a way to balance the load, which actually can help increase the RPS. And, and if I might, while we're on the subject of uh, grid services and non-wireless alternatives, there's an important, you know, as that was, you know, some of the previous questioning you were asking, there's an important uh, difference or two, two major contributions to what, whether or not the utility goes after a pin. And, and some of the other folks mentioned that a shared savings mechanism may not be valuable enough for them to really go after it. I would point out, in addition to the RPS increasing effects of doing grid services and non wireless alternatives appropriately, our shared savings mechanism for grid services and non wireless alternatives recommended five years of savings rather than two years of savings for generation, expressly because that's a newer area. It's going to be harder for them to, to develop those, those uh, offerings versus generation, which they have a lot of experience procuring those. So both the RPS and the shared savings mechanism do note that grid services and non-wireless alternatives are important, and they might actually be harder to bring on board sooner, so they require a little bit of a higher incentive in terms of the shared savings. Okay, Understood. I would just offer, um, even with offering those types of incentives during the development, um, so there continue to be kind of proposals to place limitations on the use of some of these grid services, um, despite the incentives in place. So again, I, I offer, I think there's a lot of overlap here, but the commission were to put this in place, we, we would need to have some type of oversight, make sure resources are being optimized so that we do not introduce additional cost inefficiencies. So I just offer, Put it out there for people to think about as you um, provide us your final thoughts in the coming weeks. Uh, 
couple last topics. One is on cost control, and it is for Mr. Clay. I think the from what I've understood, kind of the presumption from Ulupono is all the resources qualifying in here have been through some sort of commission vetting review competitive bidding process. Is that that's kind of the general that that's the that's the general. Um, okay. And just so you're aware, I mean, we those are extremely resource intensive efforts for the commission. I, I don't have the exact number here for me, but we, we employ two independent observers for these these RFPs. There's another one for CBRE. We have independent engineer helping us with things. You know, we'd spend a lot to make sure we get that. Um, but it's not, it doesn't necessarily come easy and it's a big staff lift as well as commissioners to so that um it puts a lot of I guess what I it, keep in mind it puts a lot of weight on the commission, the commission decision making. Um, I do want to offer if there are projects or contracts in here that were not have commission oversight or approval, is that something that you would consider as possible exception? Uh, I can think of one. Did you want me to answer me or respond to your specific idea? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the. Yeah, there was some interference. I'm sorry about that. I wasn't clear whether you wanted me to respond to your specific idea or make a general response. Uh, probably both. <laughs> Yeah, well, let me try the general response first and we'll see how that goes. I, I hope I'm not misinterpreting your question, but I do understand that competitive procurements require a great amount of work. And I would offer that the, the single, one of the single greatest benefits of a competitive procurement is price discovery. So you don't really know what something is going to cost until you get it bid out and you see what the bids come back as. I would suggest that if the commission were interested in bringing on assets that weren't necessarily all competitively bid, but you didn't want to lose the effect of the, the, the favorable pricing, that if you have competitive procurements that kind of establish what's the price of utility scale solar or wind and what's a good price in Hawaii for that stuff, um, we have expressed in the past that we are agnostic as to who owns this stuff. So if a, if a recent competitive procurement has set a reasonable and competitive price for wind and solar, for example, and the commission decides they want a little bit more, you know, a bit more of that uh, resource, but they don't want to go through another competitive procurement. I would say they could leverage the pricing obtained in a recent competitive procurement and potentially consider self-build options for the utility. Now, so that might shock some people to hear me say that, but again, the issue is getting it at a fair price. And if you have that fair price set through a competitive procurement, and it was a fairly recent one. I could see leveraging that price for the consideration of self-build options that may not require the lengthy process in a competitive procurement. Now, that may not have been directly your question. That's kind of how I'm interpreting it. Okay, no, I think what I heard you say is if you have what you think are fair benchmarks and you use that as some level of, of determining reasonable price, then that's sufficient. Yes. Um, yes. Okay, it's my last, I, I can be more specific on the one example I can think of is there's a um, plant that the utility affiliate acquired on the Big Island um, prior to our affiliate rules in place. So no commission vetting of that oversight. Uh, they've recently signed a biofuel contract, which according to our um, our understanding of the way the PPA works, those those costs flow through um, but no commission approval of that contract as it would if it was different setup. Um, if that sort of asset was used to boost achievement here at higher cost, uh, what's your view on how the commission should handle that? It is an interesting question. I think I am aware of the project that you're referring to. So I guess, of course, that would only be relevant if it was biofuels and it was addressing the RPSA. Well, certainly there wouldn't be any shared savings mechanism. The concern, as I think you're expressing, is that non-competitively bid prices that the commission didn't have a, a chance to look at are being passed through as uh, addressing the RPSA. So that, that's something interesting. I'd, I'd actually probably have to give that the thought it deserves, which I'm not sure I'm able to do on the spot, but that would be something worthy of additional consideration, whether it is 
requiring the contract to be approved or the pricing to be approved in order to count towards the RPSA. Uh, my understanding, and it may be flawed, it sounds like, was that fuel contracts generally have to be approved. To the extent that that was not, um, maybe it needs to have a special consideration to be counted towards the RPSA. And I and I want to be clear. I don't view this as a problem per se at the moment. Um, I just want if there were, well, maybe some other ways the commission could invest. I mean, if there are unreasonable costs, um, we probably have a variety of different means of investigating. Um, but I just want to be clear that you kind of the underlying assumption here is most of the resources coming into the system go through some sort of commission vetting. Um, and I just want to bring up an example with if in May that doesn't happen, um, we would think about what to do about it. And if it's not something that becomes a problem, then it's not a problem. But um, again, just food for thought. Um, Okay, and then this is my last question. You know, I raised the, the point about if the legislature were to change the benchmarks, um, obviously we have no idea, but there's usually a proposal every year. Um, what, you know, what are your thoughts on how we would handle that? So, Chair, full disclosure, I should say that Ulupono has uh, certainly policy work that we do at the legislature as well. Yep. And just in the interest of full disclosure, we have been advocating for a change of the definition of the RPS to what we call the corrected RPS to, of course, be across all uh, electricity, not just at sales. And I believe that's been taken on by the legislature with, uh, of course, it hasn't passed, but for at least three or four years now. My understanding is that the single most likely from, if I'm the handicap it, change in the RPS standard would be a change from statutory to what we call corrected then I think it just takes the penalties and makes them in line with the, the same benchmark that we're making for the rewards. So as you pointed out uh, quite accurately, we are not proposing changing the statutory level nor the penalties associated with that. We're only trying to give upside through a higher standard. If the legislature were to change it to the corrected standard, I think it doesn't shake things up a lot and we could probably continue on the same path since the the rewards would be relative to the same levels we're talking about today. Uh, but to be fair, if there was a big change in the percentage required in a particular year, then honestly, I'd have probably have to agree with the companies that at the very least, that should be the subject of PBR review and relook at the PIM and figure out what's reasonable because, you know, to, to use an extreme example, if the legislature decided that we want 100% by 2030 instead of 2045, I mean, we, we, even we, as strong advocates for renewable energy, would have serious doubts about how possible that is. Okay. Thanks. Uh, that's all the questions uh, for Ulupono. Thank you. And again, thanks for the work on this. Uh, just one last question uh, for the consumer advocate on the RPSA. And again, I'm not sure if uh, Ms. Roberto or Mr. Nishino the correct one, but I understood your uh, position on this, it was since there's not a um, direct monetary savings for customers, paying out the incentive based on an extra externality is not something that the uh, consumer advocate office is supportive of. That, right. That's I correct. Think. Yeah, no, okay. that's correct, sir. But I'd ask uh, the consumer advocate to speak to it directly. I, I'm sorry, um, Chair. Was there another aspect to your question, or was was that the 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 lead question? And you may have another. That was the one lead. I just want to confirm that I have your position correct. Um, yeah. I, I didn't have it in front of me, but uh, conceptually, that's what you stated, correct? Right. And if I may, I, I think some of your questions that you've raised so far sort of highlights um, some of the concern in the sense that we we could be um, the RPSA could expedite or encourage the company to accelerate achievement of the renewable energies. But it's not clear that the, the company would always be seeking the most uh, cost effective solution. I, I, if I might, you know, I, I think there's an opportunity here. I, I think it's been recognized by other people that, you know, right now, um, 
the the prices for renewable energy are very co cost competitive as compared to say fossil fuel prices so you know what i might offer is if the commission is is inclined to consider rpsa whether or not there's an opportunity to treat rpsa as as a form of a, a shared saving mechanism for now and then revisit once we get to that point where we're getting close to 60% 70% where it's not um, where the renewable energy would be as cost competitive with with other resources to then just look at a PIM without necessarily looking for um, shared savings or, or cost savings that may occur. Um, because as the Commission is well aware, you know, there are numerous letters that are filed with the Commission and, you know, comments made in the public hearings for rate cases. And it's, you know, the need for rate relief. It's, it's the need for customer bills to be more affordable. So, Again, we we fully support the, the 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 notion that renewable energy should be accelerated, especially when it's cost effective. Let's see what we can do to actually deliver savings to the customers as soon as possible. And and if renewable energy can get us there, let's encourage the company to to follow that. So, um, if if we can look at RPSA in the context of a shared saving mechanism, and we can deliver savings to the customers and allow the, the company to um, get some percentage of those savings, again, realized savings, not theoretical savings, I think that makes a lot of sense. Thanks, Dean. You, uh, you answered the question before I asked it. So, <laughs> no, I, I think that was what, I mean, kind of as I look through this table here, you think about what is the incremental growth um, I think there is a case to be made that, you know, this is a way of driving achievement of what has been at least, you know, submitted to us in the projects that approved uh, potentially significant savings. Um, and so I think it, there is a case to make that is a form of a shared savings. So um, I think those are all the questions I have uh, for the group here today. I want to thank all of you. Um, and just to give an update in closing, we're uh, we're going to modify the schedule a little bit. Uh, probably, as you saw, you know, we were planning to have our questions start tomorrow morning for the commissioners. Um, so we're going to start just as we did today uh, with the revenue mechanisms presentations tomorrow, um, and see how far we go. And recognizing, you know, there's a whole other section for the closing statements. Um, and so we'll see how far we get tomorrow. Um, if we need to go into Wednesday morning, um, we'll make a call later in the day. If I do appreciate people were able to hang on today and we could get through uh, this whole first half of it. With that, thank our staff. Um, they always do a tremendous job and we got all this together. We got all of you online. So appreciate all their efforts. Thank you to all of you and your teams, your witnesses, we appreciate all the help with this, the support. Uh, have a good evening, and we're going to go into recess. I'm hearing till tomorrow morning. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Shut the door.